Good morning, and welcome to our workshop on supporting the implementation of innovative manufacturing approaches and advancing their more widespread use and effective utilization. I want to thank you all for joining us either in person at the National Press Club or virtually via our YouTube stream. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University, and I'm going to provide some brief opening remarks and context before handing it over to our colleagues at FDA for our kickoff presentations. Our focus today, as I said, is on supporting the adoption and use of innovative manufacturing approaches for drugs and biological products. As I'm sure many of you all are aware, innovative manufacturing approaches and technologies can increase manufacturing agility. They can enable more rapid ramp up of production if demand spikes. They can support easier changeovers from manufacturing one product to another, and they can advance more efficient, less wasteful production processes with lower unit costs. Innovative manufacturing can also enable improved measurement and monitoring of products as they're manufactured, along with better control over product quality and easier identification as a result of manufacturers that are consistently able to achieve high quality standards. Since quality issues are one of the leading causes of drug shortages, these features of innovative manufacturing have a lot of potential for advancing markets and purchasing conditions that support and reward more reliable, high-quality manufacturing. Recognizing these important benefits and potential of innovative manufacturing, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration is committed to supporting the adoption of these technologies and approaches. The Emerging Technologies Programs within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research Advanced Technologies Team are each designed to create a collaborative, interactive environment for regulators and industry to work together to overcome technical, regulatory, or other challenges associated with the adoption of innovative manufacturing approaches. Still, despite these initial efforts, widespread adoption is not yet a reality, and stakeholders are citing a range of technical, regulatory, and commercial barriers to adoption. So we're here today for that reason. We're going to discuss regulatory strategies to support further adoption of advanced manufacturing. This will build on the work of the emerging and advanced technologies teams. And we'll talk about new initiatives as well, such as the advanced, advanced manufacturing technologies designation program that we'll turn to in the afternoon today. Ultimately, these programs are aiming to help us achieve a more modernized, flexible, and resilient pharmaceutical supply chain with improved quality and reliability, lower costs, and fewer drug shortages. I'm going to walk through our agenda in just a moment, but let me turn first to the logistics for today's meeting onto the next slide. Um, this is just a reminder of the Duke University Statement of Independence. Our statement means that neither Duke nor the Margolis Center take partisan positions. But of course, we want and encourage individual participants to speak their minds and express their opinions regarding important issues uh, in a supportive environment. I also want to disclose that I'm an independent director on the boards of Johnson & Johnson, Cigna, and Alignment Healthcare. I co-chair the guiding committee of the Healthcare Payment Learning and Action Network, and I receive fees for serving as advisor for Arsenal Capital Partners, Blackstone Life Sciences, and MITRE. Duke Margolis and FDA are convening this workshop with a diverse group of participants under a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. While Duke Margolis does conduct a range of work at Duke Margolis related to the manufacturing of drugs and biologics, and ways to improve manufacturing, our only role here today is to serve as a neutral third-party convener and moderator for, for what we hope will be a timely and very lively and informative discussion. The conversation today, while supported through a cooperative agreement within, with the FDA, is not a federal advisory committee. We will not be voting, we'll not be seeking to come to consensus, we won't be making recommendations. This meeting will be a success if we have a constructive exchange of views from a range of perspectives about the challenges in advancing manufacturing and how to overcome them. So uh, 
Uh, on to a next step, uh, another key aspect of uh, logistics is participation. We'll be using Slido for audience questions and comments. This applies to both the in-person and virtual participants. We want to hear from as many of you as possible on the issues that you think are most important to cover today. So we hope you'll take a moment now to log in to the Slido by scanning the QR code here on the screen or by navigating to slido.com, slido.com, and entering the code DMJUNE8. Uh, you can see it uh, listed on the screen as well. So that's either use the QR code or slido.com, DMJUNE8. If you would like to ask a question during the meeting, uh, we want to encourage you to use this platform to submit questions at any time. They'll be monitored by our team. We're going to pass along as many as possible to the session moderators to include in all of our sessions as time permits. Uh, and we also appreciate any comments that come in that are useful for uh, all of us to think about how to make progress on these issues. Finally, I just want to remind you all that the meeting materials, including the agenda, and speaker bios are available on the Duke Margolis event website. For those of you who are here in person, you can access them using the QR codes that you received at registration. We also have Twitter information on the slide here. Participants should feel to tweet, feel free to tweet about the meeting using the hashtag, hashtag Innovative Manufacturing Workshop. That's down there at the bottom, hashtag Innovative Manufacturing MFG Workshop. Uh, for our Twitter handle for the meeting. So thank you all for making this an active uh, engagement meeting. Uh, so next, let's turn to the agenda quickly. Um, after you finish hearing from me, we're going to hear a presentation from our colleagues at FDA that will give some more background on the current work of the CEDAR Emerging Tech Technology Platform and the CBER Advanced Technologies team. That's the current regulatory framework and tools session that's coming up next. After a short break, we'll hear a case study presentation from a set of sponsors who have interacted extensively with ETP and CAT on previous submissions, followed by a brief discussion session to identify and further uh, assess some of the key lessons learned from those experiences. We're then gonna take about an hour for lunch break. And when we return, we'll have an FDA presentation and panel discussion on regulatory challenges to adoption. Then for the remainder of the afternoon, we'll turn our focus to the Advanced Manufacturing Technologies designation program, which is a new program laid out in the omnibus legislation that Congress passed at the end of 2022. We're going to hear a brief presentation explaining what was included in that legislation, then a panel discussion with plenty of time for follow-up on the details of how FDA might proceed with, imp with implementing this important new program and how it fits into the bigger picture of promoting the adoption of innovative manufacturing approaches. So as you can see, we've got a lot of material to cover today, uh, a wide range of speakers and panelists lined up to share their perspectives and hopefully hearing from all of you as well. So let's get right to it. I wanna to turn to our first presenters, Dr. Larry Lee, Deputy Super Office Director of Science in FDA's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, and Dr. Manuel Osorio, who's lead of the CBER Advanced Technologies team. Larry and Manuel, I'll turn to you now. So while we wait, we are waiting. Uh, we are waiting for the slides. Uh, first of all, I think welcome everyone. I think it's a good, very good to see a lot of our colleagues, former colleagues and FDA colleagues, as well as our colleagues from academia and industry, here today. Because I want to just uh, emphasize that we have a. Uh, over the last couple of years, we do have an advanced manufacturing committee, right? We can, when we go to the conference, we see the familiar face. And today, I just want to say that like, the, the only reason we come here is because of your work, uh, make, making the uh, advanced manufacturing uh, reality. I think I can definitely show you a little bit here. Um, and also, I would like to say that like this workshop is intended to meet the Pudufa as well as a Fedora commitment. But even without this commitment, 
we are happy to meet with you to talk, right? I think today is really the opportunity for you to get the feedback to these two programs as well as other uh, advanced manufacturing related activity, especially industry. We always give you deficiency and comment. Now is your time to uh, give us the comment as well. So um, I'm going to share uh, with you about our uh, emerging technology program. Um, as a staff in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality within CEDA, we always start any discussion uh, on the topic of a quality. So, yep, a quality product of any kind uh, meet, uh, consistently meet the expectation of a user. As you can imagine, like drugs are no difference, right? Patients expect safe and effective drugs uh, with every dose they take. And therefore, we define pharmaceutical quality this way, to ensure every dose is safe and effective, free of contamination and defects. And the job of our office is really to assure the quality. And then we believe that this is one of the things that uh, gives a patient's confidence in their next door of medicine. I think what we do is not just because we want to regulate people, ultimately, we want to make sure we deliver the benefits to the patients in the United States. Um, so, and I want to go through a little bit. One of our many benefits of uh, advanced manufacturing is that it can help uh, consistently and also uh, reliably uh, produce drugs uh, for patients, uh, quality drugs for patients. And let me just emphasize that patients are not the only one who will uh, benefit from advanced manufacturing. As you are aware, right, um, advanced manufacturing is really one of the key components of the U.S. overall strategy to strengthen domestic manufacturing or the uh, supply chain, as well as to increase the supply of a quality drug in the United States. Um, so, but it also can really help us to develop the drug faster, especially when, if you use it appropriately. And also, uh, to one of the proactive approach to prevent drug shortages uh, by providing a more um, flexible and also agile manufacturing platform. But I'm not saying like there's anything wrong with the current technology, but this will also definitely give you one uh, option you, you can consider in the near future or now. Right, despite these uh, benefits, uh, I want to say uh, advanced manufacturing has not been about, adopted like widely in the industry uh, for manufacturing development and also uh, the manufacturing. And one reason um, the companies shy away from advanced manufacturing is that it's because um, they are afraid it will take FDA longer to approve the application <laughs> if they use the advanced technology um, uh, in their applications. At least I think uh, this is what I hear from the industry colleagues, okay? Uh, may not be true, but like, that's what I hear. And one example, good example, is continuous manufacturing because many assume that using continuous manufacturing in the application really will slow down our assessment and also delay the approval. But the actual numbers may surprise you. Uh, because of this, I think uh, uh, internally we conduct the internal audit that analyze several components of the approved advanced manufacturing application uh, or continuous manufacturing applications, including the time to approval and uh, market entry. And surprisingly, uh, the audit indicated that the continuous manufacturing applicants um, had a shorter approval period and uh, quicker market entry as compared to batch manufacturing uh, applicants. They are three months shorter to approval and three month, uh, uh, four months quicker to the market. Uh, let me just explain a little bit uh, later what, what the, the main reason uh, behind this number. And then more importantly, I think at least you can say we are biased, but uh, uh, the outcome of this report also identified no substantial uh, regulatory barrier associated with 
uh, common regulatory interactions related to the implementation of continuous manufacturing as compared to the batch manufacturing. But I do want to see that it's not that simple. Like one of the uh, main reasons why there's no delay in such approval, actually in fact it's faster, can be attributed to the uh, early interaction under the um, uh, emerging technology program. So I will explain this program a little bit more today. And you know that uh, we see the or OPQ has long supported the investment in the advanced manufacturing to really facilitate uh, the modernization of pharmaceutical development and manufacturing because we believe that we spend so much investment on the drug, di drug di discovery and some of my colleagues always like, like Jeff Baker told me that hey our manufacturing is very important as well. So I think we need to a little bit put more effort to really try to modernize some of these, um, um, uh, uh, this area. And I also want to emphasize that uh, advanced manufacturing is not just one thing. It's not just a continuous manufacturing. It can be novel dosage form, new manufacturing technology, and uh, advanced analytical methods which to enhance uh, the control of the quality control of the products, right? And today I'm going to share with you more about the CEDA Emerging Technology Program and my colleagues and other, uh, and, uh, and also other like um, advanced manufacturing related activities such as uh, in the policy development and research. And then my colleagues will talk about uh, Cyber Advanced Technology Team, CAT, uh, as well as others will share their opinion on this uh, new Advanced Manufacturing Technology Destination Program. Uh, for this particular one, FDA really want your input, how to construct this uh, program. I think it's very important we get our input from the stakeholder to design a program really serve the purpose and also help to drive the technology forward. So um, in uh, late 2014, I think uh, Bob, you also remember that, right? We established uh, the Emerging Technology Program to, like, the objective is really to facilitate and promote the adoption of innovative approaches, okay? Not just continuous manufacturing. Let me just emphasize again, to like pharmaceutical development, product design, and manufacturing. Okay, so the Emerging Technology Program, uh, the, so, the so-called ETP, is supported by cross-functional team, the so-called Emerging Technology Team, ETT. Uh, my apology, I always use the ETT and ETP uh, interchangeably, so just uh, bear with me a little bit. And this team um, have, has a representation from all relevant uh, quality assessment and inspection program, including Office of Pharmaceutical Quality, Office of Compliance, and Office of uh, Regulatory um, Affairs. And we also have ability to recruit anyone we want uh, in the CEDA as well as in the OPQ um, if specific technology, uh, specific knowledge is needed for a certain technology. And then I also want to point out that this slide is very important because the chair now is uh, Joe Welsh. So if you have uh, any questions, ask him. Don't ask me, okay? <laughs> so uh, he's a good, he's a really a, uh, a good people with very strong uh, background in the biologics area because we feel that like we can, we already see a lot of uh, new technology in the biologics area. I think it's very good to have a, an uh, ETT chair with uh, this uh, strong background, uh, with the strong background in the biologics area. But we still have a lot of members, like very good in small molecule as well. All right? So the objectives are, as a program are really to like, provide a centralized location for all the inquiries related to uh, advanced manufacturing. And this really provides a forum for companies to engage early dialogue with FDA to support innovation. And through these interactions, ETT will ensure um, consistency, continuity, 
and predictability in, as, in quality assessment and inspection. Because we learned from the previous in, uh, uh, initiative, right? I think Roger, you already know a lot about this. It's about the PAT. Like it used to drive industry crazy about they get one set of a recommendation from PAP team and then go to the uh, assessment assessor and then you get different uh, um, uh, recommendations. So like I think we hear you. So that's why we established it. I will explain a little bit about the processes, uh, how we do that. And then uh, we take the learnings from these uh, interactions and then share with them uh, uh, with other international regulators really to facilitate much broader adoption of innovative approaches across different regions. Because we also hear you that like global harmonization is one of the barriers for adopting uh, innovative approaches. And we can also uh, using the knowledge in the uh, 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 emerging technology to identify and evaluate potential roadblocks relating to guidance, policy, and review practice, as well as establish scientific standards to facilitate risk-based approach assessment. And I will elaborate a little bit more about in the context of our initiative in policy area as well as uh, in research. So during the first couple of years of our working with our industry under this program, we have experienced many successes in the beginning, uh, including increasing uh, number of the uh, ETT proposal submissions and meetings and uh, approval of uh, more applications using advanced manufacturing. However, uh, we all, as the ETT workload increases. We also um, uh, we uh, face the challenges uh, related to delivering our mission, uh, our uh, deliver delivering against our mission and the uh, goals uh, in this for this um, program. Because like we start to have uh, more companies to apply this program, and warning to work with uh, ETP directly, right? Regardless whether this is an uh, advanced manufacturing or assessment issue. So to address these um, challenges, we created or we initiated the program improvement, the so-called ETT 2.0. And it really, uh, the objective is to streamline and standardize the ETP technology life cycle and align organizational and existing quality assessment component. In this way, we really can utilize our resource more from our, our assessment offices uh, as well as other offices within OPQ. And then really try to identify uh, opportunities to strengthen the program's performance. I'm, sh I'm not going to go through these uh, enhancements. I'm sure we are going to discuss uh, during this workshop later. For ETP, I would like to emphasize that we employ a collaborative approach over the technology life cycle. This really means that emerging technology team members stay involved throughout the entire process from really early uh, engagement uh, with industry all the way through to the application assessment, including the pre-approval inspection, right? And also, I want to emphasize that the emerging technology member and the assessment team originally assigned to ETT proposal likely remain to be the same throughout the entire process, including the application, right? But sometimes we may need to change the member a little bit, but most likely we at least have a few people like stay involved throughout the entire process. One more time, I want to emphasize that we collaborate with industry by supporting ETT applicants throughout the life, uh, technology life cycle. Let me just uh, give you a little bit more specific here. Once uh, the ETT proposal accepted into the program, right, we mix with uh, applicants and provide early scientific input, right, even when 
a molecule or a product has not been identified uh, during the early technology development. So this really offer a new venue for you to interact with FDA because when um, for IND you need to have a product, but this one you can really just discuss about the technology. We can discuss discuss the product or molecule associated with this uh, associated with the proposed technology later in the process, right? Then the applicants can also request site visit from ETP, uh, meaning that. We ETT member with our development assessor can go to the facility who holds this new technology and then have a really in-depth discussion with the industry subject matter experts. This really helps a lot because we can have all these like brainstorming and then talk about the regulatory hurdle, talk about the scientific, not only increase the knowledge of our assessor, but also help the industry to understand our future, uh, our expectation in the future submission. And when the application is received, the ETT member will be part of the assessment team, like completing the quality assessment of the application and uh, inspection uh, to really ensure the continuity, uh, continuity throughout the entire process, right? Of course, in the beginning, it's not that easy because you have a certain you have an ETD member uh, working with uh, the uh, regulatory um, uh, the review office, and the people may think about why do we need to add another member into the team. But I think we overcome some of these uh, internal resistance, be able to be collaboratively work within the FDA to really drive the technology forward, right? But one thing I do want to en uh, emphasize that ETT member only have a 20 people, so, right? even though we can recruit all this stuff. So one thing is very important to keep in mind that new technology cannot be emerging forever. Really? Okay? Because once you get enough uh, knowledge, this <laughs> continuous manufacturing just become a part of uh, batch manufacturing, right? So the goal of an emerging technology program is really to graduate the technology as this type of a technology uh, go through the uh, technology cycle under this program, right? So what I want to just um, emphasize that, um, um, uh, let me see. Uh, one, one thing I do want to emphasize that is that this start with the uh, companies and industry developing the technology, right? Then they are having the early de uh, engagement with the emerging technology team on the technology development and implementation. ETT continues to work with the applicants or ETT applicants as they evaluate the technology as well as resolve the uh, scientific and regulatory issues with the industry and the companies together. Once ETT receive or approve three applications for the same technology from three different companies, right? We define that this will be the time to really consider uh, to graduate this technology, uh, meaning that this type of technology eventually will go through a standard uh, regulatory uh, quality assessment process. ETT is confident in graduating technology or considering this technology is no longer emerging within the program when uh, FDA has gained sufficient experience with the technology, meaning that our, a lot of assessors uh, already will have uh, this type of uh, knowledge to be able to do uh, the assessment independently from the support of the ETT member, right? And the ETT uh, technology can proceed fully through the standard assessment process with no or minimum support from the ETT member. Let me explain to you why this is important. Um, why this, sorry, just uh, why this is important. Uh, the graduation uh, strategy, because it and sh um, it really like demonstrate FDA's confidence in the ability of the industry to prepare a successful 
uh, application for graduated technologies in the future, ensure FDA's capacity uh, to keep up, uh, to keep pace with industry innovation. Because we, just like mass balance, right? You cannot just take everything in and then without something going out, right? Eventually, if like ETT keep like reviewing the same technology, uh, they will run out of the resources. But you have uh, so many resources in the review office. So one of the goal of the ETP or ETT is really to share what we learned within the FDA as well as the industry. So really, we can adjust uh, like the innovation, uh, increasing innovation in the near future. So this will also provide um, FDA uh, opportunity for FDA staff to be trained so they can handle uh, the graduated technologies and so FDA can assess or evaluate more applications and still meet the Gudufa goal days. Uh, if you, people work in FDA, they know how much work we have. Uh, the number of a submission is just, um, it's just huge. So I think this, this is really important. The more people we train, the better we, uh, we are in the, uh, in the future to prepare them to, um, for the future technology. Let me just summarize a little bit some of the, success, many, uh, some of the successes we have under this program by working with uh, industry. Uh, we approved 19 applications since 2014. You may not think this is a uh, like high number in like if you, you compare to our generic approval number as well as uh, all the new drug number. But I need to tell you that this type of a technology is very disruptive uh, to the industry. So be able to like um, um, approve like 19 application is very significant. So each year we approved about two to three application and with uh, four approved in 2020. And this slide, you can see like, the type of a technology we approve in this application. No surprise, uh, continuous manufacturing is the, really the major one uh, in our approved application today. But I do also want to emphasize that continuous manufacturing is really a broad term, right? What we actually approve here is for the small molecule, large molecule, drug substance, and drug product. And also within this type of technology, they also use a lot of advanced modeling tools, PAT and analytics to really to ensure the quality of the product throughout the continuous operation. And, and also since uh, 2014, we accept over uh, 120 proposals. And again, uh, you can see that over these uh, several years, um, similar to the, app, uh, the approved application, continuous manufacturing dominate uh, a lot of these uh, uh, proposal, but you can still see the proposal actually cover quite a wide range of, uh, of uh, emerging technology. And one thing I really truly enjoy working in this uh, emerging technology program, and Joe probably like <laughs> you enjoy it as well, is that I have an opportunity to see all the hard work from the industry to put in, to really present some, some of the technology. I say, really? You really try and really want to do this? But it's really exciting. Uh, but hopefully we will be able to see more application uh, in other areas, not just uh, continuous manufacturing. And um, also since uh, 2015, we have uh, over 150 uh, emerging technology program. So I also want to emphasize the number here. Why the uh, uh, ETT interaction, uh, the number of uh, ETT interaction are more than the proposal we, uh, we, uh, we accepted. Because once you accept it into the ETT program, you have opportunity to have more than just one meeting with uh, ETT. Because once you accept it in the program, right, Think about, you have a regulator to be part of your development team and then we need to help you to make sure like you anticipate the robust 
in the regulatory aspect and to make sure that when you submit the application, there's no outstanding issue to prevent you from, the, uh, from approval, right? But I know the thought, thinking, having uh, to have a regulator to be part of your uh, development team is scary, I know, but actually it works. So if you do want to uh, interact with uh, ETT, I would suggest you to follow the procedure described in the ETT guidance. It's very simple. All you need to do is submit a five-page proposal that details the technology, why uh, it is novel, why and how it improves the product quality, uh, the anticipating, uh, uh, the anticipated develop and implementation roadblocks, and also have some idea about your development timeline and what is your strategy for the future submission, right? But if you don't have that information, it's fine. I think we relax a little bit, uh, Joe, right? So to really try to get more folks uh, to, to come in a little bit, all right? But eventually, we do want you to work with a company or a manufacturers to bring this technology forward. Based on the experience we gained from the Emerging Technology Program, as well as the outcome of a series of workshops at the National Academies of Science, we recognize that uh, a new regulatory framework is needed for certain technology. This technology uh, include the integrated, flexible, distributed um, manufacturing, uh, technologies that can even operate at the point of care, as well as artificial intelligence in pharmaceutical manufacturing. I think if you, this is a fancy word, but I look at it, it's like using a really more advanced modeling and technique to enhance the process control and monitoring, right? To address this uh, need, we started uh, the so-called, the framework for uh, advanced manufacturing uh, evaluation, the so-called frame, um, which is uh, led by Alan Fisher here. He's in the audience today. We believe that one of the key components of this uh, frame initiative is a stakeholder engagement to share our current thinking and also get uh, stakeholders input. We publish discussion papers as well as hold, held and planned a uh, couple workshops on the distributed and also point of care uh, techno manufacturing technologies as well as uh, AI in support of uh, this framework development. And I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'm sure my colleague is going to cover this important portion. And we also uh, partner with uh, regula uh, regulators and industry to develop a harmonized guideline on continuous manufacturing based on what we learned from our emerging technology program. And I want to really share with you that uh, this guideline has been adopted in November 2022 by ICH. And I also want to emphasize that you cannot evaluate new technology without scientific knowledge, right? So therefore, we have a very rigorous uh, um, research and science program to support emerging technology program. We have been utilized our in-house laboratory and, um, and uh, computational capabilities, as well as collaborating uh, with academia, uh, such as MIT, Rutgers, and Purdue, to really study, uh, the pro uh, to really stud uh, uh, conduct research for various uh, technology uh, as listed here, the slides here. We use uh, the knowledge generated uh, from this research as well as, the application, uh, as well as the information from the application to really help us to conduct um, the science and risk-based quality assessment, uh, policy and uh, guidelines developments such as FRAME and uh, ICHQ13 and more importantly, to really train our staff so prepare, uh, to improve their um, to really improve their ability to evaluate this type of a technology in the near future. 
And with this, I would like to thank for your attention. I want to say that uh, Emerging Technology Program is really one of the programs FDA implemented to really help to drive the innovation forward. But we understand that this program still has a lot of areas for improvement. And also, uh, my colleague Manuel is going to tell you about the CIBA effort in this area. And, but I'm really looking forward to today's discussion, uh, your comments on this program, and your experience interacting with FDA through this program. And thank you for your attention. And Manuel, please come up. Larry, I think I need to reach out to Cedar to make these cool slides that Larry has. Mine are not as, as cool as his. Uh, good morning, uh, and uh, thank, thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to talk to you today about um, current uh, efforts at the, for, at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research on promoting the, oh, sorry, I, I need to advance them, yes, perfect on promoting the, the development as well as the adoption of advanced manufacturing technologies for manufacturing the types of products that we regulate. Um, and let, let me start out by um, sort of defining or, or just giving you our view of advanced manufacturing. Both Mark and, and Larry uh, have already talked about the benefits of uh, implementing advanced manufacturing. So I just wanted to uh, sort of de de define and, and, and let you know how we think of advanced manufacturing. So it's a we think of it as, a, as an innovative pharmaceutical manufacturing uh, technology or approach that uh, integrates novel technological ap uh, approaches. Which, uh, uh, it can also use established techniques in a new or innovative way. And it applies production methods in a new domain where there's no um, uh, defined best practices or experience. Um, the, the next slide uh, just shows the type of um, products that this, the center regulates. And I wanted to show this to, just to mention that um, relative to CEDAR, our experience with advanced manufacturing has been rather limited. And that is likely due to the fact that, as you can see on the slide here, our, our products are highly complex. And, and also perhaps the, the, the technology that will be required to manufacture or to, to implement this advanced manufacturing technology is just not there yet for this type of products. But we do know that there's a lot of interest in using advanced manufacturing for uh, products such as uh, gene and cell therapies, um, uh, and I'll, I'll mention some of those, as, as well as um, uh, vaccines. Uh, there's a lot of interest as well, uh, and, and some of the blood-derived uh, products too. Um, so what are these um, efforts that CBER has um, implemented to again, promote the adoption as well as the development as well as the adoption of these advanced manufacturing technologies. Uh, in 2019, CBER established the Advanced Technologies Program uh, for, for this purpose. And under this umbrella program, we have three major initiatives. The first one here is um, that we do fund extra, extra mural, not extra cellular, extra mural um, research um, uh, to support regulatory science and innovation. Uh, and I'll touch a little bit more um, uh, with more details on that in, in the next slide. Also, we, we have efforts to, um, to develop the scientific and regulatory expertise that is going to be required to evaluate these uh, uh, innovative technologies. Uh, I won't talk about that today, but uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing effort as well. That, that really ties out to the other uh, two initiatives that, that I will mention here. And the, the third initiative, which is really the focus of my presentation today, is the CBER Advanced Technologies Team, uh, which is a mechanism for, that provides um, early access to the technology developers to engage the, the center to discuss uh, potential or perceived um, scientific and regulatory issues that may be associated with implementation of these technologies. Um, so in terms of extramural funding, uh, since 2018, we have funded um, about 23 uh, projects, uh, and most of these have been at academic institutions. Uh, to really to, to, uh, you know, to, to help uh, develop these, these technologies, um, 
Now, that's not to say that we are only funding extramural research. We also have intramural programs uh, to, to develop the expertise on, on these uh, um, advanced technologies. But those programs are not funded through the, the program that I'm, I'm referring to today. So the, the, the purpose of funding these projects is really to develop the, 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 the knowledge um, and, 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 and address gaps in knowledge that have been identified uh, for these emerging technologies and, and thereby um, sort of promoting the adoption of these technologies in the manufacturing sector. Um, now let's get getting back to, to CAT, uh, the Severe Advanced Technologies Team. Uh, it's a program, that, again, that was created in 2019. And um, it was established to, to promote dialogue education and input among CBER staff, and, and for that matter, actually FDA staff, um, as well as between CBER uh, and, and, and uh, prospective developers of these advanced manufacturing technologies to really encourage the implementation of these technologies in, in, in manufacturing. The, the team, similar to the ETT, um, is uh, composed of uh, a small cross-disciplinary um, cross-functional group that represents CBER leadership, as well as relevant policy and review and inspection programs. So uh, we have representation on the team from the, the, the office of the director, yes, uh, Peter Marks sometimes uh, sits on these meetings. Uh, he, he wants to, he's uh, very interested in, in these um, interactions. Uh, the Office of, Vac of Vaccines, the, office, the new Super Office of Therapeutic Pro uh, um, Products, the Office of Blood, and as well as the Office of Compliance and Biologics Quality. Um, there are some offices in the center that don't have re permanent re pre representation in this team, but uh, for example, the Office of Biostatistics, but if there is a, an interaction, the category interaction that requires their input, we can call out to them uh, to participate. Um, so how, what, what is exactly CAT doing? As I mentioned before, it, it really provides access to early interactions with the center uh, prior to, and this is key, prior to filing a regulatory submission uh, to discuss uh, technical as well as regulatory issues that may be associated with implementation of these uh, technologies. Um, so what is the scope of uh, CAT meetings? Um, really the, these meetings are designed to discuss novel technologies with significant uh, impact on product um, development, manufacturing uh, process and control strategies, manufacturing analytical methods for which this, the, the center has very limited, limited experience and that's also key because our, our experience or the level of experience that we have with that specific th technology determines how, how we can, whether or not we consider that technology as novel, as a novel approach, right? So it may, and that may differ between CEDAR and, and, C and CEDAR. For example, uh, continuous manufacturing for us is still something that's very new. Uh, uh, <laughs> maybe you're getting ready to, to mature, to, to graduate, uh, uh, continuous manufacturing, but that's uh, is definitely still something new for, for our center. Now, what's not within the scope of these uh, meetings are product-specific discussions, as well as highly technical discussions, only because uh, we have other types of meeting that, that are better suited for those, those type of interactions. Um, okay. Um, when we first started talking about standing the program, um, we, we knew that there was a gap that needed to be filled. So there were these uh, technology developers that did, perhaps didn't have plans to actually the manufacture a product, uh, or they were still at an early stage where they hadn't defined a product yet. And there was really no way for them to interact with the center to, to get um, advice on, on the development plans. So um, in 2019, we had many conversations with Larry, who at the time was the chair of the, of the ETT to try to see how we could model our program. Um, and so this is one of the key differences between our program and, and, and ETT. So as Larry mentioned that ETT engages uh, um, prospective sponsor technology developers from an early stage of development and, and states with them throughout the life cycle, uh, the regulatory life cycle of the, of the development. Uh, in our case, we decided that the, the, the role of CAT was going to be to provide early engagement or early advice. Again, these are discussions that are not product specific. 
because we already had other meetings uh, that, that, are, that could happen at an early stage, such as the Interact meeting that is listed here, which is a meeting that um, um, can, can be used to discuss uh, product-specific uh, issues, such as uh, um, um, you know, farm, farm and tox uh, studies, uh, um, CMC, uh, as well as clinical study designs. Uh, but CAT, again, that's not the scope of CAT. So we decided that CAT was going to be really early stage before a specific product was going to be identified. So if it's at the beginning, and, and I've sort of displayed it this, this way, not uh, CAT in front of Interact, not to give the impression that you have to have a CAT meeting before you go into an Interact meeting or into a pre ind meeting. Right, so you, you could you don't have to come in if you have a new technology, and it depends on the, the what stage of development you are. You don't have to come in and have a a cap meeting before you uh, submit a pre ind meeting request. So, I just want to make sure that that's understood. Um, so, you know, because the program is relatively new, and I, I realize there's uh, perhaps a lack of awareness about the program. I thought it would be good to spend a couple of minutes on on the process of submitting the request, the process of review, as well as the outcomes from that review. And so we have this uh, web, web uh, portal that, that can be accessed through that um, link there. Um, and it gives, provides instructions on, on submitting a request, uh, which is really uh, a two-page backgrounder that, that provides the following information. And that is a description of the technology is similar to what uh, some of the requirements that, that Larry mentioned for submitting ET3 uh, requests. Uh, we also want you to provide information on why you think the technology or the product class is novel and unique. Um, what, what, is gonna, what is the likely impact of this technology in terms of the, the manufacturing process or improvements to the manufacturing process? Um, on specific uh, product class or perhaps several uh, classes of products. Um, a, a summary of the manufacturing and development plan uh, to, to determine where, what, you know, where you want to take that technology, how you want to implement that technology. But, and, then the, and then the last one, is, which is very important, is questions. Questions on per, perceived or regarding perceived uh, regulatory as well as technical or other challenges for Im the implementation of these technologies. That's very important because we receive some requests where there are no questions, and it's very difficult for us to provide any feedback if we don't really know what specifically we should be responding to. Um, so that's very important. So once the so this is the review process. Once the the, the request comes in, uh, it will be screened or triaged by a um, a, a core group uh, of the of the team. And at, this, uh, at the moment where there are three of us, basically to determine the scope of the request, whether it fits within the CAT interactions, and also to decide which office, review office within the center or offices, will be the lead offices to review the, the request and, and also provide feedback. We also have monthly meetings of the team where we uh, continue to, to discuss these uh, requests to determine if the appropriate designations uh, for the office review, for the review office uh, have been made. Um, so outcomes, so what can you expect um, uh, after submission of the request and a review? So there are basically three outcomes that, that you could expect. One is that the, the CAP meeting is granted. And this largely depends on the novelty of, 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 the, of, of the technology because you can imagine that um, these CAT interactions really benefit both industry or technology developers and as well as the center because we can provide um, informal advice right, to try to uh, um, uh, minimize the, the risks that are associated with implementation of that technology, but also it gives the center a unique opportunity to learn about new technologies and so that we can start thinking about um, how to develop the, the regulatory uh, entangled, entangled expertise that is going to be required to evaluate them when they actually come in as part of a, a formal um, regulatory submission. Uh, and basically, um, oh my God. And so uh, if, if a um, meeting is not granted, uh, we provide also responses. So that's why it's key that you include those questions in the, 
in the background there, the two-page background there. Um, all, all, if we don't provide any feedback, it's also because we may make a recommendation that the, the, the topics that you've included in your request or the type of information they've included could be a, um, um, perhaps address, better addressed by um, have, requesting other types of meetings, such as the interact meeting, pre-IND meetings. Um, am I really out of time? OK, I'll just take two, two minutes, very, very quickly. So um, this is um, a graph to show you just the interest that over the last four years in this program, right? So it, the, the dark blue columns or, or bars represent the number of CAT requests that we have received. The lighter color ones represent general inquiries that we have received over, over, the, four, over the last four years. And so we have received about 110 uh, CAT requests that with, came in with a two-page background there. Um, and and I'm, what I'm, you're wondering is how many meetings we have actually granted. And that number is actually 23. So it, it's, it's a low number, I understand. But you have to understand that we launched the program a few months before the pandemic hit, right? So in 2020, 21, we received a lot of applications. We knew there was a lot of interest. But because, as you know, CBER had to redirect the resources to address the pandemic. So that really impacted the, avail the avail availability of our um, subject matter experts. And we were really not able to address many of the requests that came in or grant many meetings in a timely manner. So, but um, uh, things are not as bad. It, uh, um, of the 23 meetings that we have granted, one third of those have been granted in the last six months. So that's an indication that really we're, we're getting back to a more normal state uh, and, and the availability of, of experts has, has increased so that we can a better respond in a more timely manner to these requests and also increase the number of meetings that we have had. Um, some of the technologies that we have discussed with these interactions are listed here. Uh, and then just because of, of time, I'm not going to really go through them, but just continuous manufacturing is, is one that, that uh, you know, we see a lot for, for vaccines, for gene therapies in terms of manufacturing AAV vectors, uh, for exosomes, uh, for cell uh, therapies. Um, and, uh, and I just wanted to mention um, that besides um, the role of CAD in providing uh, this early access to the center to obtain um, um, regulatory advice, that we are also collaborating within the agency. Uh, and uh, we established, uh, the FDA established this, this um, Center for Advanced, Advanced Manufacturing of Pharmaceuticals and Biopharmaceuticals in, in June of tw 2021, so that was two years ago. Uh, and um, I'm not going to go through that, but so this, this is the, the mission of the program, um, right? It's really to, uh, to accelerate the adoption of these technologies in the manufacturing sector. And as part of this program, uh, Larry mentioned the, the Frame Initiative, which is sort of fits under this. And so here are six areas uh, of, uh, that we identified as potential areas of collaboration be between the centers in the agency and frame would sort of fit under the regular, fits under regulatory framework. Um, internationally, we have um, also, um, I'm not going to go into details uh, about ICHQ 13, but just to say that CBER is, is very much involved uh, working with CEDAR as the FDA representatives on the working group that developed the, the, the harmonized guidance. Um, and so, and here I just wanted to say that although the, the focus of the guidance is on small molecules and therapeutic proteins that are regulated by CEDAR, that the, the principles that are outlined in the guidance can apply to other entities, such as some of the, the products that we regulate in, in CBER, right? And uh, sorry, I'm going quickly. This is just to summarize, you know, I, I hope fully I convey the, the message that CBER is definitely committed to accelerating the adoption of these advanced manufacturing technologies. And, be, and for this reason, we created the Advanced Technologies Program. Uh, we encourage the innovators to engage the center through the CAD program at an early stage of development to address um, scientific as well as, um, I mean, technical as well as uh, regulatory issues associated with their implementation. We're collaborating uh, w within the agency domestically as well as internationally. And those are some examples. And here, I just wanted to end with, with uh, uh, <laughs> ask for a favor. So, 
as I mentioned, we launched this program uh, as a pilot in 2019. And to use the, the software analogy, it was perhaps version 0 0.5. Currently, I think we're at version 0 0.8. I mean, we're way behind Cedar. They're already version 2.0. But in the next few months, we do plan to um, um, make um, some changes that to, to really streamline the process so that it provides a, a real service for both our stakeholders, you, and, and as well as the agency. So we will be updating the information that's on the website uh, to provide additional information uh, and clarification. Uh, now that, the, that our experts have more availability, we'll be able to provide additional uh, meetings. Uh, and so I would love to hear, I know that there'll be a, a chance for you to comment uh, later on, but uh, my email address is there and I'll be happy to hear from you. Uh, what are your concerns? You know, how can we make the, the, the program better? And we'll try to incorporate your suggestions in the in version 1.0 that hopefully will come out in a few months. So with that, I, I thank you very much. I, I apologize that I, I went very quickly, but uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. Thanks, Larry. Great presentations. Uh, we'll take a short break now, um, about 10 minutes. So we'll reconvene at 10.15. Um, there's water outside, and uh, 10 minutes goes by quickly. So um, we'll see you back here soon. And if I could ask the um, speakers for the next panel to go get mic'd up in the back. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I think we, are, we got the kind of signal to um, start the next session. And yeah, I'm very excited. Um, about that. So if everyone can uh, please take their seats in the room, uh, we'll be, you know, get started here. So my name is, uh, I'm Thomas O'Connor. I'm the Deputy Director for the Office of Testing and Research in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality and CEDAR. I'm also the Vice Chair, as uh, Larry on Larry's slide, of the CEDAR's Emerging Technology Team. Um, and I'm really pleased to join you today to kind of moderate uh, a session where we're going to learn from you know, sponsors who kind of interacted with the program. So you heard Larry and Manuel describe the ETT and CAD program. So it's kind of like hearing the other side of the story, right? What was the experience like, you know, working with those uh, programs? And then after the presentations, uh, we'll have a few minutes. We have some questions. And if you have questions, I think uh, you can submit them through Slido. But first, I want to introduce our speakers. And they'll take turns going through a quick case studies of their experiences. So first, we have Nandita Vishwanathan. Process Design Lead Expert at EMD, Serrano's Global Drug Substance Development. Paul Kirwan, Senior Manager for Regulatory Affairs, CMC at Amgen. Ahmad uh, Amaya, Senior Director for Global Regulatory Affairs, CMC at Eli Lilly. And Celeste Frankfield Lamb, Director of Global Regulatory Affairs and CMC Policy and Advocacy at Merck. And then also joining you know, the panel today is my colleague from the, from the FDA, uh, Kim Schultz. She is the Chief of Gene Therapy and the Office of Gene Therapies within the Office of Therapy Products in CBER at the FDA. And now I'll turn it over to our panel presenters. Nadita, you will go first. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, as introduced, my name is Nandita Vishwanathan, and I am uh, representing EMD Serono in Switzerland. I will be presenting a case study on the continuous manufacturing of biologics. Um, we met with the FDA ETT and discussed several aspects regarding uh, the implementation of continuous manufacturing for biologics, and uh, including some challenges. Today, I'll be presenting the, uh, spe a specific challenge on time to results for analytics. So commonly used processes for biologics manufacturing are based on fed batch operations for upstream manufacturing, as you can see. Uh, I don't really see the, OK. So I'll do it without the pointer. Um, are based on fed batch operations for upstream processes and batch individual batch processes for downstream purification. In the efforts to move towards continuous manufacturing, the upstream processes uh, often use a perfusion bioreactor, which generates a, um, clarified harvest on a continuous basis, and which is then purified on integrated batch steps for downstream purification. 
So this is not perfectly or fully continuous or it's only partially integrated continuous manufacturing because the harvest is collected for a definite period of time before which it is processed through continuous capture in downstream. So thereafter in downstream there are uh, the protein A based chromatography steps for purification, then there is viral inactivation through low pH and then uh, flow through chromatography steps for uh, polishing followed by nanofiltration which generates one or multiple batches of drug substance. Future approaches which you see uh, down here aim towards a complete integration of, uh, of continuous manufacturing and which avoids process segregation, minimizing the, the number of surge tanks in the process and um, enabling an end-to-end -end device connection. At EMD Serono, in our process, in our journey towards implementation of continuous manufacturing, we started in mid-2017 with our first pilot-scale prototype of continuous downstream process, purification process. And um, further on, in early 2020, the first manufacturing scale equipment that was installed, a picture of which is shown on the left bottom. And then uh, we went on to uh, manufacture the first uh, process in using uh, upstream, um, continuous upstream, that is a perfusion-based upstream process. But the downstream process was done with our, um, with our qualified fed batch equipment, but adapted to continuous downstream set points. Then later on, we tested the same process in our uh, continuous downstream processing skid and in a, in a non-GMP environment in a, uh, and verified that the quality that we obtained were indeed similar between the, um, between the first uh, qualified, from the qualified equipment and the uh, newly installed uh, uh, manufacturing skid. And that was around the time that we had the first interaction with the FDATT, uh, wherein we presented our, uh, our strategy and obtained comments uh, on, on our st strategy and helped confirm our approach on process design and, and, uh, and control. In, uh, concurrently, we had the qualification of the continuous downstream skid for GMP manufacturing. And since then, we have uh, performed uh, more uh, clinical, manif clinical batches from this integrated uh, continuous upstream and downstream process. And we have almost uh, three biologics uh, uh, already produced using this uh, combined uh, upstream and downstream continuous manufacturing approach. We had, uh, we presented this topic also in the recent inaugural meeting of the Quality Innovation Group with the, F with the EMA. And uh, we've also been a part of the ICHQ 13 um, writing uh, and providing comments as and when uh, necessary. And uh, we've also, um, during the entire process, in during its draft and in its final form, um, we were able to refine our approach and also come up, think of possible challenges for its implementation. So one of which, which I will uh, go through in a bit of detail uh, today. So one of the um, recommendations of ICHQ13 that we think cannot be directly applied, implemented for biologics is what you see here, that process monitoring and control support the maintenance of a state of control during production and allow real-time evaluation of system performance. And the, regardless, of process, regardless of the approach used, appropriate monitoring at suitable stages of continuous manufacturing process enables timely data analysis to ensure operations are in a state of control. But the current state of process analytical technology, and clearly this, uh, this might change in the future as the technology advances, but as of now, there is no process analytical technology that can enable real-time assurance of a state of control in order to take timely action on the process. In other words, the lack of PAT or at-line methods with appropriate time to results does not allow comprehensing, a comprehensive monitoring of product quality when the process is running. Uh, I'll explain a bit more in detail in specific context to our uh, continuous manufacturing setup. So if we just compare the processing times of traditional processing versus continuous manufacturing, so on top here you have a schema of 
how um, the current state of art uh, commonly used fed batch processes uh, are, are, um, are run. So you have the clarified harvest once it's generated from the bioreactor, it is tested and there are uh, multiple runs of uh, chromatography that are run one after the other. And once the material is generated, it's pooled, viral inactivated, tested, and then the, the, the next step is, um, uh, is run. So you're waiting for the testing of the previous, uh, of the previous unit operation to complete before you start the next run. So because of all these steps that are occurring in a, in a serial manner, the processing from the harvest to the drug substance takes about 50 hours in a, in a normal scenario. One of the aims of continuous manufacturing is to reduce this processing time, of course, without compromising on product quality. At EMD Serono, the way we approach it is, uh, of course, with the upstream, we have a perfusion bioreactor which generates harvest on a continuous basis. And then this is followed by um, a sequential multi-column capture chromatography, protein A resin-based capture. So you have one column loaded and the other column being ready to be loaded simultaneously. So you have each column, each operation is parallelized. So one after the other in a continuous manner without batch pooling. So this enables process to go from harvest to the purified material in in about six hours. So the entire downstream operations is reduced from 50 hours to six hours. But what this means is that the upstream process monitoring needs to be at least as fast as the downstream processing. Because we need to ensure that the upstream process generates material of acceptable quality before it's being purified. However, there is, um, we have a lack of, as, uh, analytical technology that provides this result in a timely manner. So most upstream process-related critical quality attributes, uh, like endotoxins, you, have, you could have information in about 30 minutes, whereas high molecular weight impurities, low molecular weight impurities, charge variants, host cell proteins, host cell DNA, require a minimum of three hours to have a quantitative result. And uh, specifically glycans here, these are the glycans are the quality attributes that are most impacted by any upstream process disturbances. So any disturbances in the upstream process clearly has a consequent impact on the glycans. And here it is where we have the uh, a quite a long processing time of six hours, which is almost at the same order of magnitude as the downstream processing. And of course, bio burden is even longer, which is uh, 12 hours. So because we don't have uh, the uh, quality analysis in in time or in in the same order of um, order of time as the downstream processing, this becomes a problem to to implement a truly continuous process. So ultimately, we want a truly integrated process without segregation. And um, here, in this case, that would mean that we have to run the truly continuous process without the information on critical quality attributes and potentially even, uh, even trigger di process diversions based on excursions without complete information on quality analysis. So the, our approach, proposed approach to do this is as follows. So for the upstream process, um, we propose to have a real-time check of process parameters, so all the normal uh, process parameters, temperature that are continuously monitored, temperature, pH, perfusion rate, just to mention a few. And um, also, not real time, but rapid monitoring of uh, the performance attributes, which are uh, a, a measure of the cell state. So, so things that link cell metabolism to the product quality, cell viability, cell size, uh, certain metab metabolites like lactate, glutamine, all of these to be monitored. And if there's any, uh, to have control ranges defined for each of them, and any out of control range would trigger a diversion for a fixed time based on, uh, on excursion studies. For the downstream process, a real time check of process parameters again, uh, time, volume, flow, conductivity, and um, uh, UV, pH, and conductivity profiles, uh, potentially as a, as in, in a for a modeling based approach. 
any again any out of control range also triggers a diversion for a definite period of time based on the res residence time distribution in addition to these online checks to also have at line monitoring of quality attributes um, and uh, and show that they are within the control ranges and purified material is, is also collected in multiple fractions uh, and tested for quality for most sensitive CQAs, especially, like I said, the glycans, and uh, uh, prior to further processing and to produce one or multiple batches of drug substance. So that, uh, with that, we've, uh, so this topic was discussed amongst, as I said, several other topics with the, uh, with the ETT program. And we found uh, several features of the program useful. So the very fact that to have a, a non-product specific area to interact or a, um, to interact with the FDA to anticipate regulatory uh, challenges for the implementation of the technology was is a good expansion of the original scope. The process was simple and efficient. Uh, the proposal was accepted rather quickly and. Um, the feedback that we obtained in advance of the meeting was also very useful for us to prepare and just focus on the um, on the important points. Uh, the feedback that we pro that we got was also very pragmatic, and we had uh, we also received at the end of the meeting uh, clear and concise minutes of the meeting, and uh, we were very happy to also um, note that the uh, note for the interest of the FDA to visit. The, to have a site visit, and which we will uh, definitely host in the near future. So just we have just one recommendation that we would potentially want uh, to be clarified is that the current guidance in the ETA gui ETT guidance, there's, it's not explicitly mentioned to have non-product specific uh, interactions, so maybe that could be more explicit in the, in the guidance. So that's, that's it. So Thank you, Nidhi. Uh, next, we have Paul. I think you uh, give him the. Yeah. Okay, I'm very pleased to be with you today to talk about Amgen's participation in the Emerging Technology Program. I um, want to thank the organizers for the chance to, to talk today. So. Um, I'll, I'll discuss the, the development of the multi-attribute method um, in, in, in collaboration with FDA in a great deal. So this is just the, the, the first slide, just a basic uh, comment that the views represented in this uh, presentation are, are my views. So there's, as we discussed early in the introduction, there's many different approaches that, can be, that companies can take to innovative manufacturing. Um, I've listed a few examples here, but this is certainly not an, uh, an exhaustive list. Um, but as was seen in, in the results from applications and things, that there's been uh, a lot of uh, progress made with continuous manufacturing. So continuous manufacturing can improve, uh, obviously, efficiency of production. Uh, there's modular facilities, for example, that can um, provide on-demand scaling for products. And there's also advanced analytical testing that can uh, provide attribute specificity that increases efficiency of testing and product release. And it's this last topic that will be uh, the topic that I'm focusing on here. And I want to make the, uh, the point that, that advanced analytical technology is really a major component uh, to innovative manufacturing. So if you consider this um, kind of typical biologics manufacturing process that I show here, um, I think we're all aware of the fact that there's extensive testing required to ensure both process control and product quality. Now, the conventional methods that are used to um, you know, perform these tests are often redundant from drug substance or drug product. Uh, they're, they're very manual, they're intensive, um, and they're not really all that product quality attribute specific. <clears throat> so it stands to reason that if we could improve efficiency of testing, we could also improve the efficiency of manufacturing. So approximately 10 years ago, Amgen developed the multi-attribute method, or MAM. So MAM is, an LC, is a high-resolution LCMS-based met, based method that's able to monitor multiple attributes uh, at the am amino acid level. Um, and it's able to do this in a single analysis. And it's this attribute specificity that gives it an advantage over conventional methods. And that same specificity also allows it to align with quality-based design, um, quality by design-based principles, and allows also an assessment of a fit to QTPP. 
<clears throat> so if you consider that capability that MAM has, then it, it makes sense that uh, you know, several different methods and also several different instruments could be uh, replaced with MAM testing uh, at, for drug substance and drug product in the QC space. And this was uh, Amgen's objective. So in order to introduce MAM formally, Amgen made a series of regulatory assumptions uh, at, at the outset. And so uh, first of all, uh, data packages with justifications uh, needed to need be provided to demonstrate that uh, the advantage of MAM versus those conventional methods so that those conventional methods could then be removed from the specification. We also wanted to show that MAM better assesses safety and efficacy, is suitable for intended use, is stability indicating. We wanted our filings to focus on criticality um, so that we can emphasize specifications that are based on biologically relevant attributes. <clears throat> so we also definitely wanted to proactively engage FDA in this matter um, so we could get their feedback um, prior to filing, and that was the major incentive, of course, for participating in the Emerging Technology Program. So this last point on this slide uh, about global acceptance, I just wanted to make, uh, we touched on in the introduction, um, that with different regulatory expectations globally, you know, th that brings challenges uh, for adopting innovative technologies. I'm going to comment on that to conclude the talk in just a moment. I wanted to make that point here. So we take a look at the regulatory filing strategy that Amgen took um, in bringing MAM uh, uh, forward. Uh, we wanted to take a phase-appropriate risk-based approach and begin, say, with early clinical uh, stage products to introduce MAM as a characterization method. And then upon successful acceptance of that, we could get to the point where we could perhaps introduce uh, MAM as a product distribution or disposition for drug substance. And then for clinical, uh, sorry, pivotal clinical stage products, uh, the objective was to introduce MAM for DS, DP, uh, testing on both release and stability. And eventually the goal would be to replace conventional methane, uh, uh, testing uh, methods with, with MAM. So again, to return to the, the advantage of MAM with its attribute specificity, um, when we establish the specification, we are able to do that with a modification specific manner. So like deamidation, oxidation as shown in this list. And that's, that's a, a key advantage. And as we were um, progressing, we, we established our numerical acceptance criteria, of course, from the experience and the information and data we collected during the development of the method. So what was Amgen's experience like uh, with the ETP, ETT? <clears throat> so from 2015 to 2018, Amgen met with FDA on uh, three different occasions in addition to meeting with other health authorities. Now we did assess uh, MAM for multiple products, but it was decided that one precedent setting product would be used for regulatory filings. Um, so the, the interactions we received with ETT were, were very productive, uh, very informative, and ov the overall result actually was, was quite positive. So from 2019 to 2022, that precedent setting programming, pr program was accepted uh, in, in over 30 countries at the phase two level uh, for the, the replacement of two conventional methods with MAM. But I do want to highlight the challenges that we experienced as well. Um, so as we went through the development of the process and engaged with FDA, <coughs> Uh, we, had, we had presented extensive characterization and comparability data between MAM and the conventional methods, and FDA still advised Amgen to carry on with side-by-side -side testing for an extended period of time, so that was a little bit of a challenge. And in addition, it, it did take a significant amount of time, so if you just take a look at the timeline that's depicted in this diagram here, it really was a lot of interactions. Um, I didn't mention, you know, an information amendment that went in, lots of RTQs and responses. And, and I think as an industry, we, we want to compress this timeline as much as possible. I think that we're all in agreement on that. Um, so I think I just want to recap kind of the main points of our experience here in this summary slide. So our interactions were very helpful and very productive. And it, did, it was necessary to provide a, a lot of data uh, on uh, both the co comparison of the conventional methods with MAM in order to replace some conventional methods. And one of the reasons we decided to go with the precedent setting program was because FDA advised us to, to submit MAM information with, for one program before we proceeded with filing additional information for others. So this middle point on the slide, I think, is kind of an important one. So after all of these interactions with FDA, we were able to compile that information, uh, you know, actually very effectively into a, a, an MAM-specific S26 section that we then used to file for our phase two to support the replacement of two conventional methods with MAM. And, and as I mentioned before, we did have a very positive outcome uh, to, to, to date uh, with approval in 30 countries, 
more than 30 countries for phase two, and we were able to replace CEX and RCSDS testing. Um, and that was both for DS and DP release and stability testing. Um, but again, this did take a significant amount of time to, to achieve, um, but the, the, the engagement was very productive. So at this point, I just want to return back to um, the idea of global acceptance or global harmonization. Um, so the overall impact of MAM or any other innovative technology is really dependent on, on global harmonization. Um, I think we take the example of, of innovative testing uh, that I'm talking about right now. Uh, if, if one country obviously accepts that innovative testing and another country requires conventional methods, then companies are going to be required to double test. And we all know that that's uh, inefficient, it's, it's expensive. And I'm, I'm concerned, I think Amgen's concerned, that this can de-incentivize companies from investing in novel technologies. And I think this is true whether we're talking about testing or manufacturing or any of these different ideas that, that have been uh, introduced in, in the beginning of, 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 our, of our meeting today. So I think uh, we should decide to, to continue with this discussion today and, and on into the future so we can uh, make sure and, and incentivize uh, companies to, to take on these novel technologies, obviously. Um, so. With that, I'd like to just acknowledge the, the many folks that have uh, worked on MAM -MA development at Amgen uh, over the last several years, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Paul. Uh, next up, we have Ahmed. Good morning, everyone. I'll uh, be sharing case studies on uh, our experience working with FDA's um, uh, ETT on um, continuous manufacturing to implement continuous manufacturing. I'll be sharing three case studies, um, one kind of expanded drug product uh, case study, followed by two shorter ones, one on drug product and, and one on drug substance. So before I dive into the case studies, just to uh, share, you know, we have at Lilly uh, invested heavily in continuous manufacturing for a number of years now uh, because of, of a lot of benefits uh, to the business and to the patients as well as uh, to manufacturing flexibility. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of examples where we have already realized, uh, you know, across the safety environmental pieces, for example, you know, smaller uh, footprint, the pipeline speed, um, uh, especially because you can do the development at commercial scale and you can replicate the same lines that you use in development to GMP manufacturing. Uh, productivity and costs, uh, because of that uh, replication, the smaller footprint, um, and, um, uh, you know, not having to, to produce and store intermediates. The processes are integrated in addition to a lot of flexibility, you know, with on-demand batch size, you know. Um, uh, you, can, you can register a batch size range. Uh, you can have multiple configurations within the same platform. And, uh, you know, most importantly, this is done with a higher assurance of, of quality on top of the conventional batch manufacturing processes. On the drug product continuous manufacturing uh, piece specifically, our investment and involvement started more than a decade ago. 2012, we leveraged all of our learning through benchmarking with other companies and as well as being part of CSOPs. Uh, but then we started to invest heavily in our own internal platform roughly around 2012. We spent a number of years to optimize that. And then in 2015, once we op we've optimized the physical build as well as the automation, pieces that go along with it, we started using continuous drug product for developing in CEs uh, back in 2015. And a couple of years later was our first uh, entry into the, the commercial uh, product side with 2017, our first approval of continuous manufacturing with Virginia. And uh, a couple of years ago, we expanded beyond that initial preferred uh, platform of continuous direct compression to other platforms as well. So the first case study, I'm going to focus on the continuous direct compression. And so with our platform, the continuous direct compression platform that we spent a few years to optimize, we really worked heavily to make sure we um, simplify as much as possible the physical design as well as um, optimize the automation pieces that go along with it that have integrated PET as well for process monitoring, control, and uh, have that as an option for real-time release testing as well. And all of that also is coupled with real-time process monitoring and control with multiple feedback and feedback, feed forward and feedback control loops that allow fully automated product collection and rejection. So the full uh, control strategy is really embedded in the recipe that is run by the automation system during the, the, the batch manufacturing. 
So the first case study that I'm going to expand a little bit more on uh, was with, again, drug product continuous uh, direct compression. Um, it is a new chemical entity. Um, the uh, registration studies were already ongoing with a capsule dosage form, but we intended to develop a more patient-friendly uh, uh, tablet dosage form, and we wanted to leverage continuous manufacturing to accelerate uh, that delivery to make it you know, available for the patients as soon as possible. So we started that development with continuous manufacturing on the tablet dosage form in 2015. And as a reminder, at that time, Q13 did not exist. The FDA's uh, guidance on, uh, on, on continuous manufacturing did not exist. At the time when the drug product development started, there was only one approval in the US and EU with continuous manufacturing, with the second approval happening later that year. Uh, so that was an important factor that, you know, it's, it's, it's relatively new. The other very important factor was that we knew through our involvement in CSOPs as well as benchmarking with other companies, site visits, your reciprocal site visits with a lot of uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies involved in continuous manufacturing. We knew that our uh, CM unit, continuous manufacturing unit, physical design, automation, as well as a lot of pieces of the control strategy were different than other companies at that time. For example, um, at that time, there was, as far as we knew, there was no other, no company um, leveraging um, uh, feeder ratio mode or family control of all the feeders in addition to individual feeder controls. Uh, we were implementing a surge hopper inside the tablet press that modulates the tablet press speed to manage the overall potential fluctuation of mass flow in and out of the tablet press. Nobody was using that. Uh, we were implementing um, a feed frame in IR, a PAT em embedded within the tablet press to measure uh, the drug substance concentration throughout the production, throughout the production, and make decisions on acceptance or de rejection of subsets of the tablets based on that. At that time, there was no company implementing that. So because of these reasons, it was still relatively new, as well as we knew there were pieces that were different it was really important for us to develop a very robust regulatory interaction plan to go along the development a pipeline to make sure we are successful in meeting regulatory expectations at the filing. And so um, the development program was actually very uh, uh, compressed. Uh, as you can imagine, we were trying to make sure we develop it in time for uh, the first submission. Um, so. We started the development on the first continuous manufacturing line that we had in the development organization, um, where the formulation and process development started uh, in early 2015, roughly for six months through August 2015. And while that was happening, we were replicating that line uh, uh, to uh, uh, you know, have the first GMP line in Indianapolis manufacturing site, which was qualified October 2015. And soon, as soon as that line was qualified, we uh, conducted the tech transfers to that line, October, November 2015, followed by the primary stability manufacturing uh, later that year. And then we started to work on the control strategy for finalize the control strategy for, for submission. And while all of that was happening, we were replicating the line again to our intended commercial site uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, and as soon as that line was qualified in October 2016, we conducted the tech transfer to the commercial site October to November 2016, and soon after, we conducted the process validation and, and submission. And so, as you can imagine, uh, it took 26 months, exactly 26 months, from the start of the idea of let's develop a tablet menu, uh, dosage form, can we do it in time with continuous manufacturing to actually the first submission, and that was enabled with continuous manufacturing. And uh, with all of this complexity and too many moving parts and the compressed timelines, we had to have a regulatory interaction plan. So how, how did that look like? This is a busy slide, uh, but it's important to show you know, the important dialogues and connection points to uh, the FDA's uh, ETT throughout our journey. And there were other interactions with other health authorities, but um, we're focusing on the ETT interaction now. So soon after the um, formulation process development was conducted uh, through August 2015, we initiated our request to be adopted in the ETT, uh, ETP. Um, and so, uh, and we were accepted into that. And our first type C meeting was a teleconference in August 2015. 
Um, at that time, we were still developing our control strategy, but there were things that we knew were mature, so we focused our first interaction and introduction of our uh, platform and how it's built and the automation and how it operates, uh, as well as we, um, we dived into our plans for batch definition plans, you know, and, and uh, ensured alignment with the FDA on those plans. And very important for our manufacturing colleagues was ensuring the regulatory acceptability of the concept of batch size flexibility with CM and the marketplace. And you know, now it's a given. And back in 2015, it was an idea, but we wanted to make sure it was really important for our manufacturing colleagues to understand that actually can happen. So we, we, we dived into that back then, as well as we talked about our preliminary plans for our control strategy. At that time, we were working heavily to develop a PAT uh, for, you know, uh, feed frame and iron to the press, but it was not ready at that time. So we shared our plans, alternate plans, with using feeder data as well as modeling and dispersion. Uh, so we had those discussions at that time. We took all of that feedback um, into the subsequent pieces of the development program, you know, tick transfers and finalizing a control uh, strategy for intended commercial uh, uh, control strategy. That led to the second interaction of the Type C meeting in a face to face. Uh, meeting in October 2016 where we really dived into the final control strategy pieces and it was a very very helpful meeting because we had very clear proposals and we got very clear uh, feedback and then we also shared our plans for subsequent tick transfer plans and, and process validations. Uh, we took all of that learning to execute the tick transfer uh, to the commercial sites once we had all of that data then that led to uh, probably the most important interaction with the ATT, which was the commercial site visit in January 2017 in Puerto Rico. Uh, that took place over two days. We had, I think it was about 14 uh, visitors from the FDA across reviewers and inspectors. It was a very, very good meeting um, covering presentations, discussions, videos, and tours. Uh, we had comprehensive, in-depth discussions, not only on regulatory pieces, but on technical pieces and quality pieces as well. And then we discussed some unresolved plans um, from, from previous meetings, and we aligned on the expectations that the FDA had on the information we needed to include in the submission. Um, we had the approval in 2017, and then uh, we had a very pleasant surprise with Larry calling us uh, soon after we get the approval to ask, where well, they asked for an informal meeting with us to kind of talk about lessons learned. It was a very good gesture. Uh, uh, highlighting that the FDA was really committed to make sure that that program is successful. Uh, soon after that, um, you know, we uh, conducted global submissions and approvals uh, with this process, with continuous manufacturing and with real-time release testing on more than 50 markets, uh, where it was the third CM approval in the U.S., and we believe it was the first CM approval in Japan and in China. Uh, but then, you know, after you get approval, you're, you still need to talk to regulators in the post-approval space. So we had three more interactions with the FDA, written-only uh, interactions. The first one in 2018, where we wanted to talk about the ideas and proposals for how to expand real-time release testing beyond uh, the uniformity CQA that we already had approved. The second and the third interactions were mostly focused on adapting to uh, uh, market demand. Uh, and so the, the, the one in 2020, we wanted to clarify our understanding of the post-approval reporting category for batch size increases. And the most recent one is also um, for a proposed plan for a post-approval change. The second drug product um, case study uh, built on our learning with continuous drug compression. And just like Larry said, you know, after a while, once there is enough sufficient understanding, you know, it kind of graduates from being an emerging technology. So this is kind of an example of that because a few years ago, we've expanded our platform to include fluid bit granulation, a semi-continuous option, where the dried granules feed into our existing continuous direct compression. So that was used to develop an asset with a high drug load. And so we had an interaction with the ETT in March of 2022, where we focused uh, our interactions on the um, control strategy element for that new piece and we did not cover the continuous direct compression platforms because we already knew the expectations there. And the last case study with continuous manufacturing of drug substances, just to highlight that we actually started investing in continuous direct compression and continuous uh, in drug substance applications at Lilly much earlier than drug product. And the uh, third case study, um, uh, you know, involves uh, drug substance continuous manufacturing, and that includes hybrid 
process integrated batch and continuous many operations with drug substance applications, uh, where it was an experience during the COVID days where we had a type C meeting, a teleconference, and we had intended for actual site visit. It just, it, it, we were not able to accommodate it because of COVID restrictions. So we used technology to accommodate that and it worked really well. Uh, where we had a virtual site visit uh, and included presentations, videos, and online meetings and discussions. Um, and we covered topics relevant to drug substance continuous manufacturing, including state of control definition, startup shutdown concepts, co uh, collection decisions, and a batch definition. And, and so with our experience with multiple um, interactions, and there are future uh, uh, innovative technologies we will continue to work with the ETT on, uh, we, we felt that the Emerging Technology Program has been really instrumental in facilitating um, these, this early dialogue and implementing these innovative technologies because it, it really provides this mechanism for the early dialogue to understand regulatory expectations. And um, you know, we're, we're, we're really happy for this mechanism uh, to continue to be in the future uh, existing because it will be critical for us to implement future innovation as well. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, Celeste closing us out. All right, thank you very much. And so uh, I'm here, the case study I'm here to talk about today is distributed manufacturing. And, and I'm kind of starting with the end already. The, the concept of distributed manufacturing is gaining global acceptance. And to my opinion, that all started with the ETT. Uh, Back in, I think somewhere around 2018, we, we had this idea. We had a small molecule drug uh, that had a long acting formulation. Uh, and uh, when you have these types of complex formulations, complex drugs, typically if you're changing a manufacturing site or if you're adding a new manufacturing site, a bioequivalent study is required. And this can be a challenge, particularly for a long acting formulation because the study itself is even longer. And so we were estimating with this particular program uh, anywhere between a year to two years delay if we were to change a site or to add a new site and to implement manufacture in that new site. And so we were thinking about ways that we could address that challenge. Um, additionally, there is always the concern. The, the reason you need to run a bioequivalent study is the risk to the product when you are changing a manufacturing site. And so we were looking for solutions to reduce that risk and shorten that delay to manufacturing. And so we wondered, what if we just picked up the manufacturing site and moved it somewhere else? We changed the location. Would that actually be a manufacturing site change? So that was our idea. And we didn't know um, if we would be accepted into the ETP or not, but we submitted an application. Uh, it was only three and a half pages. I, I think that's long compared to uh, what CATT is expecting, the two pages. But regardless, the, the point is that it, it was not difficult for us to, to put together our idea and send it to see if this was something that uh, we could engage in conversation with the FDA. We were accepted very shortly thereafter. And then we put together a slightly longer, still not terribly long, 13-page background document to describe our ideas and to ask some questions, namely, would this be considered a site change? So um, I, I'm going to tell you the FDA said, no, this would not be a site change. <laughs> no, we would not. Um, this would be a site change. No, you cannot necessarily just pick up a site, move it. Um, but they did want to you know, continue the conversation and see how we could address the challenges. And uh, they gave us some really, uh, to us, surprising advice when we first met with them face to face. And that was, you know, we're here to consider if there are changes that are needed to the regulations and to the guidelines. But if we're going to do that, it's a time consuming process. We want to make sure that uh, those changes are worthwhile and that we're not going to have to turn around in you know, two years and uh, make another change. So think about all the different ways that you could use this technology. Think about the ways other companies might be needing to use this technology. And so we took that advice to heart. And, and we took the additional advice, uh, the request that Larry made, to, to put this in a white paper. 
And so we described three separate use case scenarios. And then we took some time and uh, we sat down with the 21 Code of Federal Regula Regulations. And we combed through it and we looked for, for each of these different use case scenarios, what were the true barriers? What was there in the regulations that would prevent this? And, and then we also proposed a few solutions. Uh, and, and we put this together in a nice, neat white paper and we sent it to the FDA for review. And then we had a second meeting. Now this was around the time of COVID. So the second meeting was not face to face. We actually even delayed the meeting by a few months with the hope that eventually we'd be able to meet face to face uh, because there is that power in being in the same room. Uh, but we were not, as you are all well aware, able to within 2020 to meet uh, face to face. And uh, so, so we had a frank discussion regarding the three use case scenarios that we proposed. And, and you can see these here on the screen. The first was to take, uh, in our case, it was a pod, a prefabricated standardized clean room, to take that from one location, um, pick that up and move it to another location. Uh, another scenario was to use these standardized manufacturing units and replicate them in multiple locations around the globe. Uh, perhaps you could control all of them, even remotely from a single site. And then the third scenario was uh, to put the manufacturing unit on wheels and, and uh, have the ability to move from location to location. And this could be, you know, for perhaps clinical manufacture or, and again, in an emergency response where you need to get the product to people quickly. Perhaps the product itself um, has uh, an advanced um, or advanced needs for um, shipping. Um, and, and there are benefits to being able to perhaps, you, you could imagine if you could ring fence um, a vaccine and stop a pandemic. So again, something that was purely theoretical, uh, but we wanted to then consider what um, the challenges would be in each of these cases. And, and the FDA um, was very frank with the different types of questions they had. And I, I've put a few here on the slide, some of the questions that, um, they were asking us. So first of all, how frequently would you be looking to move a manufacturing unit? Of course, the response is it depends. <laughs> um, what if there was an inspectional finding in one of these units and, and we had this global network of, of units? How does that impact the other units? How do you respond as a company and how do you ensure the equivalency between the different units? The answer was, it depends. <laughs> um, and what considerations and factors would be evaluated when moving? And there, of course, the, the answer depends upon which scenario that we're, we're looking at. And you know, I, I think this is something that is common to almost all of the innovative technologies that we've been discussing. Um, there is a real need to consider the specifics around that particular scenario. And um, this is why uh, taking a risk-based approach can be very useful. And uh, I'll discuss that again later on this afternoon. So the concept of distributed manufacturing continues to progress. Like I said, it started with the ETT and the momentum is built, the traction has grown. Um, we've already talked about the fact that we have the frame initiative. Um, that is there to help support advanced manufacturing, distributed manufacturing, point of care manufacturing. Uh, the FDA put out their discussion paper last October that engaged the, the broad community to, to share their thoughts and put forward proposals. And then there was a public workshop last November. Um, and the, con the, the conversation continues. So just as Paul, you know, and I, I like your graphic better. I want to borrow Amgen's. Um, <laughs> there's a need for global, uh, uh, a global approach, global collaboration, um, both from, from industry's perspective so that we ourselves are taking a similar approach, but also from the regulators. And, and we've, seen, um, we've seen progress here. Um, just as Nandita, you were talking about the uh, the EMA's Quality Innovation Group, uh, their Listen and Learn session last March. Um, we were also there to talk about distributed manufacturing, and the FDA was there as well. 
And that was very encouraging to see that, that partnership there. Um, but the, the ask that I have and, and perhaps the challenge for, for all of us to think about is how can we expand that global collaboration? Because we have a global supply chain. It's not just the US and Europe or the US and Europe and Japan. Um, you know, what about Brazil? What about Korea? What about Malaysia? Um, is there a way that uh, we can bring these other regulators into the fold to educate them, um, to, to share uh, our perspectives, to share you know, the FDA's perspectives, um, to, to try to bring that, that global harmonization? Because it, it's a challenge for, for industry you know, to have 30 individual meetings and receive 30 individual responses. And so if we can, if we can move towards that global collaboration, that global harmonization, it will do a, a very long, or it will go a long way towards um, supporting the, the innovation in this industry. And then the second ask is, is much smaller, but, but that is simply to, to have a risk-based guideline that is in place that can help to provide a degree of clarity um, to industry when they are thinking about um, pursuing something like distributed manufacturing so they can take that back, make decisions based on those expectations. And with that, thank you. And I'll turn things back to Tom. Thank you, Celeste. Pat here. Um, before we kind of turn into the discussion, I want to turn over to my uh, colleague uh, Kim. We've heard some examples about the ETT, and, but you know the CAP program has also had a lot of experiences. You know, over the last four years, so I don't know if you had any reactions to what you heard you know, through the presentations. Yeah, thank you. It was it was good to hear um, what was helpful from the ETT program uh, with our industry colleagues. Um, in CBER, as you would probably guess, due to the complex nature of our products, there are some really unique questions. Um, that we're, we're hoping that advanced technologies or novel technologies might be able to come into the place and really support the field. Um, we're specifically seeing growth, um, as you probably know, in the cell and gene therapy spaces, um, tissue engineering um, products. And, um, and so we've seen innovators come in, um, oftentimes in a product agnostic type of way, developing technologies across um, the CMC space, both with automated manufacturing, um, purification or separation techniques, analytical techniques in order to improve the consistency and quality of our products. Um, and so these really early interactions, and particularly being able to bring in the product review offices um, to be able to have an open dialogue, kind of think through um, how it might apply to different product classes, um, what types of questions we would have if we see it during that 30-day IND review periods. Um, that's, been, that's been helpful to have that open dialogue, and we've seen um, that the, the consequent submissions have been formatted in a way that provides us you know, very clear information in order to support their use. Um, so, so far, uh, we think it's been successful, at least um, on the review side, and we're, we're hoping to uh, you know, continue with that success. Okay, thanks, thanks Kim, for that perspective, the cat talks. Um, and first, I just want to say thank you to all the presenters today. I think I really appreciate the, what worked well, what, didn't, you know, what I think what we need to do more going forward. Um, so just kind of reflecting a little bit about that, um, when your companies were discussing, you know, um, interacting with either ETT or CAT, you know, what strategies did, you know, did you guys think about or did work well um, for that, to support that interaction? I don't know if anyone wants to start the discussion. I, I can start. So for, for us, the most important thing is to understand uh, the, the timing and the scope of the discussion, right? So you need, you need to have enough developed so that you have a proposal to discuss, right? Uh, and, and we felt that through our own experience where er, in the early interactions, there were some concepts that were uh, mature and developed from our perspective that we wanted to get feedback on versus others that were still evolving. And so we, we felt that very well, for example, you know, early on, the concepts of batch definition and the flexible batch size, we had very clear proposals that we had, we, we received very clear feedback on versus other pieces with the control strategy that was still evolving. So early on, uh, you know, we, we, we provided kind of the framework and we got very, very good feedback. But then once we moved into the more specifics and we had a more mature proposal, then we got into more specifics. So it's really important to understand the scope 
and the pieces that we need to interact with the FDA is on in the right time to have that engagement so that we have well-articulated proposals to get feedback on. How does that, uh, does that resonate across the, your, your experiences? Yeah, I, th I think I would agree with that, that, that um, you know, you have to have adequate data to go into the discussion, otherwise, you know, FDA can't make an assessment. That's really clear. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think it's, it's fair to say that depending on the, the, the time frame that some of these interactions took place and, say, for Amgen's perspective, it was early in the existence of the ETT and the ETP, right? And so you know, we heard Dr. Lee say that, you know, there's already been a 2.0 and there's improvements and all these things. And, and so um, I think it's probably fair to say that we're all getting better at this to some extent, but we do need to be prepared when we go into these meetings, and I think FDA can, is ready to be more efficient as well. That's what I think from my, from my perspective. So. And, and Celeste, you guys had a different, I guess, experience because you came in with something that was more uh, blue, blue sky, I would say. Right, not, right. not so much data <laughs> at the time, right? Yeah, so. v very true. And, uh, you know, that, that's something that um, I think there does need to be a balance because... It, you know, for some of these topics, it, it is really important to to discuss early on because uh, those discussions can influence the way that you develop um, the technology that you are trying to to bring forward. But by the same token, you know, I, I think it's true that you have to have something concrete that you can actually share some some proposals um, that that make the the discussion worthwhile to uh, you know the ETT to spend their time on it. So, All right. And then I think also heard you know, Paul kind of like the length, you know, the length of the interactions. Well, so kind of reflecting back as you kind of think about your next interactions, kind of strategies to like help speed that up, or like what we can do to. Well, I think that, that. I, I think that with the topic that I talked about, and you know, MAM, I think that that's that meets one of these categories that's approaching sort of the graduated stage. Right? I mean, I, I don't want to speak for FDA, but but it's it's a it's an established method, and and um, I think you know future interactions you know you know may may be uh you know certainly more limited or 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 more efficient let's say um you know i know that um there was a big change in the the global view from the time that we actually filed our phase two you know in all those different countries because for phase one we did get some pushback from from different countries you know and, and it wasn't as large of a scope of submission it was you know include maybe six different countries for phase one and so i think that kind of the industry's moved along, at least with that particular technique. Uh, so um, I, I would I would presume that going forward, you know, interactions with with FDA would be a little faster and, and things like this uh, for for this kind of method. But obviously, every time there's something new, then it requires a lot of, a lot of investigation. Mm -hmm. And Kim, so how about like sponsors interacting with CAD? I know that's a different manual described as different kind of interaction timeline and and so strategies that companies have taken for us like timeliness and scope of what they're talking to you about. Is that, uh, what kind of strategies have they, or what kind of maturity, I guess, have they come into the program with? Yeah, we've seen it um, probably across the board. I, it, I think the most effective um, or meaningful um, conversations are particularly um, you know, early on when they're looking for technologies that can be applied across you know, many different products, trying to understand how they is not the actual product sponsor, what their role is and how, how they fit into that conversation between the product developer and the FDA with their technology really being integral um, to the, the sponsor's submission. Um, and so, you know, as much as we talk about the technology, we also talk about the regulatory framework and how to facilitate that discussion. And then, um, you know, it, as Manuel's um, slides talked about, there's then additional opportunities, um, either in interacts or pre-INDs or, or IND specific um, meetings in order to further flush out that relationship. Okay. Dia, do you have anything you want to add about strategy-wise? Uh, strategy-wise, so we've had, we are pretty young in that <laughs> sense with our interactions. Uh, I just had a comment on the timing. So for us, uh, when we were developing the continuous manufacturing approach, there are different ways we can, there are different decisions we had to make. So we could not come up with 50 different proposals to the, uh, to the FDA. So we had to wait till we had an idea or a prototype at the manufacturing scale to know exactly how we would be doing our process design and control. Where would we have the search tanks and all of that. So that really, in, in that perspective, we waited to be a bit mature uh, to to go to the FDA, the proposal. 
And so I see kind of also a question from the audience about like what the ETT is working on. So does knowing that ETT is accepted, you know, technologies, you know, what technologies from other com from other companies impact kind of strategies about what your companies want to bring forward or um, in influence have any influence internally? Like you kind of thinking about like um, I know Ahmad, you kind of described a lot of intelligence you guys had about what other companies were doing CM based, you know, sharing and, and so is this intelligence about what the ETT is seeing, is that useful to, you know, industry? Uh, absolutely. You know, overall, I don't, you know, I, I remember a workshop a few years ago when the question was asked, anybody can share an example of a new innovative uh, technology that was not accepted by any regulatory body and nobody was able to come up with a, with a response. Uh, nonetheless, these interactions are really important to align early on on the details and the specifics, the acceptability of the approach. Are there uh, additional considerations that the sponsors need to have? The early dialogue about providing justification for our proposals to make the the NDA review more more smooth and you know um, and so uh, abs absolutely I, I think th these interactions are really critical uh, even even though uh, we know that some of these are innovative and 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 the, and the end question is is not necessarily whether or not these technologies will be accepted it's more of of the details of what the proposals. Uh, that could be acceptable of the, uh, the, the control strategy, for example. And, and I'll add to that because, I, you know, I, I, th I think one of the things that is so great about the ETT is the ability to have multiple meetings, right? And so we're always looking to see if something would apply to um, to advanced manufacturing and or the um, the bounds of the ETT, and, so, and it's really useful to to have a list of the other types of technologies that you have been um, assessing and engaging with industry in discussions on, because then we have a sense of does this fit or is this way off base. Okay. Um, and then when I guess the next question is kind of when it came to the actual recommendations. Um, you know, were they helpful? Were they timely? Did they, you know, make an impact in the development program to, um, you know, make these, to have actually implement these technologies going forward? So, like, you know, kind of what did you guys get out of the interactions, you know? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to share. I mean, I, I know we shared, you had some comments about that on the, the presentations, but I don't know if anyone wanted to go in more, more in depth about that. I'll, I'll comment on that. I think that even though that I, I mentioned that there were the, you know, a lot of interactions and it was you know, time intensive, I think that that also generated a lot of information, right? And so, and it worked in our, I think it worked in our favor that we were able to, we had a lot of experience in what FDA was looking for and we had uh, developed our experience with the method, of course, and then that allowed us to, like I said, put together a, a really uh, you know, strong, uh, whatever you can call it, technical report or, or just document that could support uh, you know, the replacement of conventional methods, you know, for MAM in, in the context I was speaking about, so. Yeah, and I can, I can share, you know, just, just like, you know, it's important timing-wise to know that you have a mature proposal uh, before you are engaged ETT. It's also important to know when you will get this feedback, what does the timing look like so you can implement that feedback. So we have, we have examples of this, for example, our Second interaction with the with the ETT, uh, where we at that time we shared our plans for the tech transfer plans to the commercial site, and we got very very helpful and specific feedback on the FDA on expectations of what that tech transfer detail plan uh, should look like to uh, help with that review and justification of the readiness for the proposed commercial batch size that we will be including in the submission. And later on, once we had the site visit and we spent uh, a lot of good time justifying and explaining our plans for, you know, for example, you know, uh, responses to any potential disturbances, et cetera, uh, we had very good and specific feedback uh, from the ETT at that time during that site visit on their expectations for specific data that um, they requested or recommended that we would include in the NDA uh, to justify those proposals. So, I, I, absolutely, but the important thing is to have that interaction in time so that you can implement uh, those, uh, you know, ideas and, and inputs into your subsequent program stages. Mm -hmm. 
And then I, I guess, um, you know, next question was kind of around, like, uh, it kind of goes back, I guess, to this, uh, you know, the category, like, does he know what ATT has seen before? But um, I guess, Celeste, maybe your experience is more relevant to this, kind of like, like when considering whether this applies to the ETT or not, like, you know, what was those kind of discussions like, I guess, you know, internally, <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> they, they can be quite, <laughs> quite casual, yeah. right? Um, we are, uh, we're always looking for ways to, to solve the challenges that mm -hmm. we encounter. And um, frequently when, when ideas are truly innovative, um, th there's a lot of questions around them. Is this something we could actually do? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we do a lot of questioning internally. Is, is this something that we could pursue? Does this make sense? Um, is this worth <laughs> reaching out to the agency for? Um, and, and there's a lot of debate again, it, you know, and I, I think one of the things that I would encourage internally, uh, you know, my colleagues and, and others out there is if you have enough of an idea, you know, to, to put something concrete around it, to, to actually ask some substantial questions, submit that application. Um, because the truth of the matter is, uh, unless it's something that, you know, you've already seen in the category of um, topics that the ETT is accepting, you really don't know until, until we pose the question. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to add to that. I just think that if a, if a new technology is very disruptive, I think that it could, uh, you know, potentially expand beyond, say, this idea of kind of three applications, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if, if there's lots of different ways to implement it, then, you know, other, other companies, they, they may hesitate and say, oh, well, these other colleagues, they already filed this. But if it's really disruptive, there's probably different ways to implement that idea. And so I think that uh, it's something that would be important for FDA to communicate that uh, to sponsors. And obviously, if, if, if um, you know, you can just file the, the, the summary and, and, and put in a request to ETP, that's probably enough. But, but I think that that's, that's something that's important to consider. And if I could add from that, from our, from our side of it, um, you know, I, I found it uh, fantastic that you worked through that and then, and then brought those brainstorming ideas to the FDA because we work on, I mean, from the cat, that two-pager. Right, and so um, it, you know that gives us an uh, introduction to your product, but it's it's not the the specifics of the technology and really the full expansiveness of it, and um, I, you know understanding what you anticipate to be the regulatory issues helps us to give better insight into the type of advice to give you or how to help you really navigate that framework. Okay, yeah, we have a. Uh Coming in a couple of minutes, but I did want to touch upon you know the topic. Kind of came up in a lot of the presentations, came up in the audience questions, kind of on the global global question, right? Everyone's kind of smiling, right? No, no, it's coming. Um, so for these programs, you know, is there, you know, I guess thinking about that global, is there kind of recommendations for these how these programs are, or do you have thoughts about how we can do better as far as global collaboration? Well, one of the things um, I think having had some of these informal conversations that the ETT would be open to uh, if, if we desire it to, to invite other regulators to some of the conversations. And if that is in fact the case, then I, I think it would be useful to, to publicize that um, because you know, then we can reach out to you know, the specific uh, regulators that, that we have concerns about um, you know, that's one way to broaden the scope, I think. Do others have, have kind of thoughts? I, I know this is a, a very common problem, so. Yeah, I'd say in general, if, if, if companies could be aware that there's communication, say, between, you know, FDA and other health authorities, I, th I think we all kind of know that happens maybe informally, but if there is more of a formalized process with respect to the ETP technologies, I think that'd be a, a positive thing, right? Because then companies can have confidence to say, oh, well, you know, yeah, we're, we've talked to FDA about this, gotten a lot of this feedback, and we're ready to move to you know, a more global you know, strategy. And we, you know, we're aware that you know, FDA has talked to, say, EMA and Health Canada or whatever. You know? mm -hmm. I mean, th there's always going to be some challenges, too, depending on what technology you're introducing. And if there's you know, certain countries have you know, really strict requirements and, and say, uh, for example, in-country testing requirements or, or things like this that, that complicate some technologies, right? Uh, on a global scale. So 
some of those will be probably more challenging to uh, overcome. But uh, I think if, if just there was an awareness that there's this communication between, say, major markets, that would be a big help. Yeah. I think global perspectives is really critical because the majority, if not all of the companies that are implementing innovative manufacturing technologies are global in nature. So it's a very important consideration. And I think it will be great if there's a mechanism to allow interactions with more than one regulatory agency if the sponsor uh, would like to take that path versus just interacting with the ETT alone. Indeed, do you have any co comments about, about that or respect it? Just as an extension, so because we have uh, also interacted with several regulatory uh, bodies over a, over a period of time, and uh, the opportunity to have this inaugural, to be part of the inaugural uh, quality innovation group of the EMA was also nice. It was good to have the FDA also in that meeting. So if these, um, these interactions could be formalized in, in a certain manner to have innovation groups somewhere meeting and representatives from each regulatory bodies to go to the, other, to the others' uh, meetings, it would be, uh, be a good forum to have uh, common discussions on, on topics that affect everyone. Okay. I think we're, we're, at, we're at time. Uh, I think the little thing went off. So uh, <laughs> I think it's, it's lunch time. So I uh, just want to thank the, all the panelists again for sharing your experiences. Um, and for people here in the room, I think there's a list of lunch options at the uh, reception desk. So thank you, everybody. Yes, we'll reconvene at 12:35. Thanks, everyone. Oh, sorry, I missed the post. -ball. All right, thank you everyone. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your lunch break. Survive the air quality, I see. Our next session will focus on regulatory challenges to adoption. I'm Adam Fisher. I'm the Director of Science Staff in Cedar's Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. I'm also the lead of the Frame Initiative, which you heard about earlier today, and I will be moderating this session here this afternoon. So we'll begin with a presentation from my colleague, Riley Myers. Riley is the Chief in our Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Advanced Pharmaceutical Manufacturing Laboratory in the Office of Testing and Research, and he is a member of CEDAR's Emerging Technology Team. Now, he'll highlight several key barriers to adopting innovative manufacturing that FDA has identified, and also explain some of our work to address these barriers over recent years. And then I'll invite our panelists up on stage, and we'll have a great discussion about some of these and some continuing challenges. Riley, it's all yours. Thanks, Adam. Um, so, so our journey today starts in the late 20th century um, with an initiative started by uh, Dr. Woodcock to modernize pharmaceutical GMPs for the 21st century. There were several reports published about this initiative, um, which identified five objectives, and two of which are applicable to advanced manufacturing technologies. And those are to encourage early adoption of new technological advances by the pharmaceutical industry and ensure that regulatory review, compliance, and inspection policies are based on state-of-the-art pharmaceutical science. This initiative was not focused on advanced manufacturing, um, but it set the stage for FDA's current multifaceted approach. And so here are seven examples of, the, of activities at FDA that are ongoing to identify and mitigate regulatory challenges. The first two, of course, are CEDAR's Emerging Technology Program and CBER's Advanced Technologies Program. Manuel and Larry uh, described those in detail this morning, so I'm not going to go into further detail here. Uh, but I am going to talk about the remaining five, which are FDA's efforts on international harmonization, guidances FDA has published that are applicable to adoption of advanced manufacturing technologies, uh, how FDA research contributes to mitigating barriers, a FDA's ongoing workforce development to streamline the assessment of advanced manufacturing technologies, and of course, uh, I'll go into a little more detail about the most recent and ongoing effort in FRAME. So FDA supports harmonizing internationally to ensure that global re regulatory practice is clear to stakeholders. And shown here are four examples of uh, efforts that are applicable to advanced manufacturing technology through the International Council of Harmonization. First, of course, and it's been talked about uh, this uh, while this morning, is continuous manufacture, ICHQ-13, which provided recommendations for adoption of continuous manufacturing for small molecules of biotech products. The current revision um, to ICHQ-5A um, which is in draft, it provides information and recommendations on viral clearance for continuous manufacturing processes that manufacture biotech products. 
ICHQ-14, which is also currently in draft, provides information uh, for adoption of multivariate models for analytical procedures and implementation of real-time release testing. Um, and finally, ICHQ-12 contains information of life cycle management of performance-based methods. So FDA is very, is very active in advanced manufacturing and in other areas uh, with the goal of, international, or of harmonizing internationally. Additionally, FDA routinely publishes guidance that uh, provides recommended approaches to enable adoption of advanced manufacturing. So some ex five examples are shown here. FDA published a guidance dedicated to implementation of process analytical technology. FDA published a uh, companion document to Q8, 9, and 10 questions and answers that contains information on certain process models and implementation of real-time release testing. FDA also publishes method-specific guidances, such as development and submission of near-infrared analytical procedures, um, which contains information, of course, on NIR, but also on implementation of PAT and development of process models. Um, the FDA also addresses post-approval issues. So the FDA published a guidance on comparability protocols for post-approval issues to CMC information, um, which, of course, includes uh, maintenance of models and PAT. And then finally, uh, the ETP guidance, which is Advancement of Emerging Technology Applications for Pharmaceutical Innovation and Modernization that Larry mentioned earlier, which, uh, which summarizes the scope and how to apply to uh, the Emerging Technologies Program. FDA research contributes to regulatory outcomes uh, for advanced manufacturing, and so specifically CEDAR research uh, directly supported or directly supports ETT feedback and application assessment for over 12 ETP projects. CEDAR researchers routinely participate in policy and guidance development. Two examples are ICHQ-13 um, and supporting development and implementation for FRAME. And then finally, CEDAR researchers contribute to workforce development to streamline manufacturing, uh, to assessment of advanced manufacturing technologies, which I'm going to discuss a little more in a couple of slides time. So shown here are two examples of primary research performed at FDA that mitigates barriers to adoption of advanced technology. First, FDA contributed significantly to research to development of a continuous process for liposomes. And this process that was developed in part at FDA is under, is under, development, for develop, uh, under development for manufacture of drugs and vaccines. Additionally, FDA generated data-driven considerations for supporting performance of multi-attribute methods uh, for biopharmaceuticals. So these are just two examples of primary research that are performed at FDA, um, but, but there are a, any number of projects and areas on, ongoing at FDA uh, in, and also extramural collaboration funded by CBER. And so here you can see, um, and Larry showed the slide already, but here you can see the types and numbers of each of those projects. And I'll just summarize this by saying that these projects generated more than 70 internal reports and publications. So in addition, or sorry, and CBER also supports uh, advanced manufacturing research, and some areas include 3D bioprinting for tissue engineering, novel manufacturing approaches for cell therapy products, continuous manufacturing of vaccines and adenovirus vectors, process modeling, and non-destructive analytics such as NMR for evaluating product quality. Okay. In addition to the primary research at FDA, FDA routinely publishes papers and other documents that review the impact of intramural and extramural research on adoption of advanced manufacturing technologies. These are nine examples that have been published in the last seven years. So on average, more than once per year. Okay. FDA research also contributes to workforce development, which in turn streamlines advanced manufacturing assessment. So a couple of examples are continuous direct compression has been, that was talked about this morning is part of the Emerging Technologies Program. Sufficient experience was achieved to transfer review responsibilities out of ETP. ETP trained future assessors on the technology, and now future CDC applications within FDA's experience will be reviewed through the standard quality assessment process. Additionally, FDA is constructing an, a new advanced manufacturing laboratory. One of the visions for that laboratory is to perform assessor training on advanced manufacturing technologies to streamline that process. Engagement with through FDA programs such as ETP and CAT have shown that manufacturing innovations often present policy and technical challenges for manufacturers and regulators. Therefore, FDA is evaluating its existing risk-based regulatory framework. This effort, which FDA calls the Framework for Regulatory Advanced Manufacturing Evaluation, or FRAME, aims to provide clarity and reduce uncertainty for products manufactured with advanced technologies. 
FDA's initial investment into FRAME was a series of workshops through the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I can pause or I can keep going. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, this co the, the workshops culminated in NASM's report, Innovations in Pharmaceutical Manufacturing on the Horizon, which identified the technologies CEDAR is likely to experience in the next five or ten years that have the potential to advance pharmaceutical manufacturing. In particular, NASM noted integrated, flexible, and distributed technologies. Based on this report and engagements through ETP and CAT, FRAME prioritized four advanced uh, manufacturing technologies. And these include end-to-end -end continuous manufacturing, artificial intelligence, distributed, and point-of-care manufacturing. Okay. Frame has four key priorities as it evaluates the existing risk-based framework. FDA wants to engage with external stakeholders to, to ensure that its understanding of these technologies is thorough and its analysis of the regulatory framework is science and risk-based. FDA aims to address risks by evaluating the existing regulatory framework to enable timely adoption of these technologies. FDA wants to clarify expectations and reduce uncertainty for stakeholders. A FDA may publish new or updated guidance to explain current thinking on a regulatory issue. And finally, FDA wants to international har harmonize internationally so that expectations are clear to stakeholders. Engagement with external stakeholders is a key component of FRAME and to that end, um, for distributed and point-of-care manufacturing, FDA published a discussion paper last November that stakeholders were invited to private comment, or sorry, last October, and then in November, we held a public workshop with the Pharmaceutical Quality Research Institute where stakeholders were invited to provide feedback through moderated discussions. And FDA is currently evaluating the feedback that we received. Following a similar format as with DM and POC, FDA had recently published on March 1st a discussion paper entitled Artificial Intelligence in Drug Manufacturing, um, in which stakeholders were invited to provide comment. And uh, there's a workshop scheduled again with PQRI in September, um, where uh, stakeholders will be invited to provide further feedback on artificial intelligence. FDA wants to hear from you all, because FDA is not developing these technologies. And so this is critical to ensuring that the regulatory framework is appropriate for everyone. Given the nature of, of innovation in any field, there is expected to be a, a rapid evolution of the technology and it, it, in, in its complexity. And as a result, there, will, there is and will be challenges that, uh, technical and policy challenges that FDA um, and manufacturers need to evaluate. And here are three examples of the, or more, several examples of those. Um, advanced manufacturing technologies challenge the existing regulatory framework. So, for example, for technologies that are intended to be utilized in a non-traditional uh, GMP environment, what is the best approach for ensuring that they comply with all applicable requirements, or they meet all applicable requirements, and ensure that the product that they produce conforms to appropriate standards of safety and quality? Advanced manufacturing technologies may challenge current approaches to validation. Certain process models and in artificial intelligence, for example, even certain, even certain CM processes challenge traditional approaches to process validation. Advanced manufacturing technologies may generate post-approval issues. For a technology that's highly portable and is intended to be moved on a moment's notice, may, that may challenge the current inspection paradigm. Advanced manufacturing technologies also generate life cycle management issues, again, maintaining artificial intelligence and opt updating dossiers accordingly. Finally, as we've discussed already, um, regulatory convergence is needed. Um, that's an, an ongoing issue that FDA has identified, and, we, and we're continuing our work to harmonize internationally. So finally, utilizing continuous manufacturing as a case study, I want to highlight FDA's response to stakeholder comments. First, manufacturers were hesitant to adopt CM without additional engagement from FDA. The Emerging Technologies Program was created in 2014. Before manufacturers are hesitant, before FDA approved a product manufactured with CM, that first approval occurred in 2015. We subsequently approved 13 additional submissions. Over 50 proposals have been accepted into the Emerging Technology Program for continuous manufacturing. Manufacturers were hesitant to adopt CM for existing products before FDA approved a switch from batch to CM. That, that first approval occurred in 2016. Manufacturers are hesitant without guidance from FDA. FDA published draft guidance on continuous manufacturing in 2019, 
And in 2022, we published additional guidance that included viral safety recommendations for C biotech products manufactured with CM. These are in addition to the engagements that are occurring at ICH. Manufacturers were hesitant to adopt CM because they feared that the timelines for FDA approval might be longer. As Larry showed this morning, in 2022, FDA published that the timelines for submissions with CM were actually faster than with um, the comparable submissions that included batch manufacturing. And finally, manufacturers were hesitant to adopt CM without additional, uh, without internationally harmonized guidance, and ICHQ13 became effective this year. So this illustrates that FDA hears stakeholder feedback and takes specific actions to address it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Riley. Uh, now I invite the panelists to come join me up here on stage, and I will introduce them. So first, I will introduce my FDA colleague, Ingrid Markovic, the Senior Science Advisor and CMC Policy Lead in CBER at FDA, the immediate office of the Center Director. Then we also have Roger Nosel, Head of Regulatory Strategy for NGT Biopharma Consultants and the lead for the International Society for Pharmaceutical Engineering Initiative uh, titled Enabling Global Pharmaceutical Innovation Delivering for Patients. Then again, on our panel, we welcome Ahmad Amaya, Senior Director for Global Regulatory Affairs, CMC at Eli Lilly. Thank you again for joining us, Ahmad. We also have Geert Tarao, Head of Manufacturing Technology and Innovation Advocacy in the CMC Regulatory PTR Policy Team at Hoffman LaRoche. And finally, we have Fernando Muzio, Distinguished Professor of Chemical and Biochemical Engineering at Rutgers University. And so now I'll ask each of our panelists to provide some brief opening remarks. And first, I will go over to Ingrid. Anything you'd like to elaborate on or react to or add to Riley's presentation? Yeah, thanks, Adam. I uh, appreciate that kind introduction and just really want to thank um, the organizers, it's a really great pleasure to be here. I really like the the energy in the room, sort of coming back from lunch. There was all of this chit chatter, you know, and people were just really excited. So it's really wonderful to see all the faces and, and all the people from different, you know, um, areas of, of the career. So, you know, you've heard a really beautiful presentation from Riley as well as, you know, from Manuel and, and Larry. And so you can see that FDA is working really super hard trying to identify ways to incentivize innovation and also promote um, implementation of advanced manufacturing and bring that into our processes and facilities. And so part of that is, you know, just advocacy, spreading the good word, you know, sort of um, educating about the benefits of, of innovation, advanced manufacturing, as you heard, um, you know, generating a smaller, in, uh, more environmentally friendly and smaller footprint, um, bringing manufacturing efficiencies, um, reducing cost of production, as well as other benefits. And the other part of that is also providing sort of more, more standardized opportunities to interact with the FDA, as, as Larry and Manuel discussed, you know, through CAT and ETT. So where you kind of have that opportunity for early dialogue, you know, to kind of share some of the ideas. And so some of that exchange can really help, hopefully, the developers you know, to influence their further thinking. And so it may be helpful also to sort of take a look and kind of um, team tag on what Lyra Larry mentioned, I'm sorry, um, Riley mentioned, looking behind some of the reasoning behind uh, why some hesitation, you know, has potentially been experienced with implementing these technologies. Um, there was a, a really an interesting study um, that FDA also participated with um, that um, Nimble ran its uh, active listening session. It's sort of a survey Jeff is very well aware because he was highly instrumental in making that happen and sort of executing that study. So um, it, it's really sort of interesting um, the findings that came out, which was also echoed in a number of presentations today, sort of looking and maybe differentiating um, you know, the pre-approval space versus post-approval space. And kind of looking at a pre-approval space where a lot of times you have such a time 
uh, line crunches and you're kind of trying to push, you know, your, your development activities, all your qualification activities, you're trying to get that done as fast as possible, you know, and kind of introducing the new technology and sort of trying to understand the ups and downsides of that technology, you know, may not be fully practical. Whereas when you're in the post approval space, you're now all of a sudden exposed to the global regulatory environment and potentially, you know, um, you know, some some unique features, you know, of, of different regions. So truly FDA has, you know, been thinking about these issues, you know, by participation through Nimble and some other observations we've had over the years. And as Riley mentioned, ICH has really been very helpful in kind of bringing that global harmonization. My, my personal favorite is probably ICHQ12, you know, because I sat uh, on ICHQ12 with Bob who sits here, you know, through step two, and it really provided a number of really helpful tools to streamline uh, post-approval um, changes and lifecycle management, as well as opportunities for regulatory flexibility where warranted. And another way also to sort of have that global harmonization is like looking at various reliance pathways and sort of putting more effort and understanding more, you know, how can we work together globally, you know, to bring about uh, uh, more harmonized processes. And so I would stop here and just thank you very much for your attention. We'll look forward to discussion. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Let's next go over to Roger. Thank you very much. I'm representing the uh, International Society for Pharmaceutical Engineering. Uh, since I left Pfizer in August, I've been on my own. And um, when, I, when I started working with ISPE originally back in the early 2000s, a lot of the initiatives that they took up involved innovative technology. And in fact, the focus for a lot of what they do is on innovative technology. They have, as you know, the FOIA Award, which is the Facility of the Year Award, which is predicated on innovative uh, facilities, innovative technology in facilities. Um, so when I, when I had the opportunity, uh, working with a number of other colleagues who are similarly um, dispossessed from their original jobs, um, we got together and decided that one of the things we needed to do was get some data on where the sources of the challenges truly are with respect to innovation. It's very easy for industry to look at the regulators and say it's your fault. The reason innovations don't proceed is your fault, and that's actually not the case. And so what we're doing right now with the initiative that uh, Adam mentioned, which is ostensibly, it could be named, um, I guess, uh, barriers to innovation, looking, looking for the true source of barriers to innovation. We are running a comprehensive survey in three parts. And the first part is a very simple, uh, multiple choice review of specific uh, areas where uh, innovation is taking place. Uh, the second part is short answer. Where, have your ex where has the experience been with uh, companies in particular uh, uh, with respect to innovation? And third is case studies. And we have uh, at least one, I think, two companies that are actually putting together some case studies reviewing where innovation has its most serious challenges. Um, I had a sneak peek uh, last week at some of the survey results. There are 180 respondents so far, which isn't too bad. Uh, normally, they get respondents less than 100, so 180 I, I thought was pretty darn good. Uh, and I'm just going to, I don't have a lot of data on it. This is not at all certified or qualified in any, any manner. It's my interpretation. But uh, lo and behold, a good proportion of the sources and challenges of innovation are really a result of decision-making issues within companies. And they have almost nothing to do with whether or not there's regulatory acceptability, believe it or not. Um, that doesn't come as a shock to me, having worked in a big company where we had debates about this all the time. But nevertheless, I thought it was important that we get real data to, to substantiate that, because now we can start looking at some potential solutions. And what, are, what is the primary issue that most of these companies face? It's whether or not they're going to recoup their, their, their investment. So certainly regulatory authority interaction uh, can help move an innovation forward. And certainly global regulatory um, authority uh, harmonization will also help. But a lot of it comes down to plain and simple bucks, money, and whether or not there's sufficient money for certain innovations to move forward, and to what extent, in fact, some of these innovations are platforms that can be used for multiple products. So I think that that's kind of important when you look at the overall expectations of identifying where we need to focus our energy on innovation. The other thing that's really important, and this came up several years ago, uh, some of you may know Mary Oates. Mary Oates and I worked together at Pfizer for a long time. Uh, we used to have this uh, little cartoon about a carrot and a stick. Um, and for a long time, 
industry operated with regulators in a little bit of an adversarial way, where they felt like they were getting beaten over the head with a stick, rather than being offered incentives or carrots. And so one of the things that we may want to talk about on this panel a little bit is what would those incentives look like? And they don't have to be financial alone. They could be flexibility. They could be other things that, that were talked about. So um, that's kind of what I'm bringing to the table today. Great. Thank you so much, Roger. Next, let's go over to Ahmad. Um, thank you for inviting me on this panel. Just uh, as a reminder, um, so I work for a Lilydian and company, but uh, in this panel, I'm sitting in representing FBIA. Uh, so the opening remarks I will provide is a summary of, uh, of information that FBA prepared recently as part of their preparation for interacting with EMA's newly found Quality Innovation Group, where they summarized um, FBA's positions on the, um, the priority technologies as well as um, uh, potential regulatory hurdles that may impact their implementation. And so um, from FBA's perspective, the, the following are um, game-changing uh, technologies that should be prioritized. These include um, analytical innovations for biological products, such as uh, multi-attribute methods, using uh, LCMS, for example, to replace in vivo testing with automated uh, in vitro testing, um, novel automated sterile manufacturing technologies to enable rapid development and supply and allow multiple manufacturing processes in a single facility, um, coupled with rapid microbiological QC technologies. Uh, continuous manufacturing, of course, across uh, different aspects of drug product manufacturing, drug substance um, through flow synthetic chemistry as well as biological processing, um, autonomous and portable manufacturing facilities and point of care and or distributed manufacturing frameworks, um, digital in silico AI based modeling approaches for process development, process and product understanding, including stability and control strategy as well as technologies and strategies to support accelerated assessment of comparability following changes. For example, uh, use of in silico biopharmaceutics models, uh, as well as CQA-based assessment of biological products. And from the perspective on potential barriers that could impact implementation of such technologies, these include the following. Um, often, uh, there is a divergence of the eventually approved and registered control strategies in global markets. And that may have an impact on the ability of sponsors to implement new innovative technologies globally, while at the same time come up with robust, reliable um, global supply chains. And so to enable innovation, uh, legislation and guidance uh, must be risk-based, harmonized, and flexible from a global perspective. A vital enabler for novel manufacturing technologies will also be legislation and guidance supporting use of platform and prior knowledge um, as industry requests considerations for how this can be further enabled in global regulatory frameworks and guidance. Um, implementation and maintenance of harmonized global guidance will always be important and the recent Q13 is a very good example of that and obviously there's a need for, for more. Um, opportunities for joint scientific advice. We heard a little about this in the morning session, uh, but this will be very important to applicants where they could engage with multiple agencies, for example, FDA, um, EMA, and others, uh, as well as the option of greater reliance and recognition uh, across different regulatory health, health authorities, uh, which will help uh, application of new technologies. And lastly, modernizing the global variation framework. You'll probably hear about this uh, more, uh, but how do we get more al alignment with ICH principles across the board to enable an e efficient introduction and expansion of new technologies uh, initially, as well as to maintain them through the life cycle, not only for manufacturing technologies, but also for uh, analytical methodologies as well, as well as rely you know, enabling reliance and, and recognition pathways. Um, Key to enabling the innovation will be establishing um, agile scientific advice processes of dialogue um, between industry and regulators um, through both formal scheduled meetings as well as having the ability to have um, ad hoc meetings and workshops as needed. Um, we really need regulatory re leaders like F FDA and EMA to work globally, leveraging ICH and other global mechanisms to encourage more more globalization of standards and guidance uh, to enhance um, the implementation of new technologies, as well as enhancing the, um, or providing the option of collaborative 
scientific advice pathway. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ahmad. Uh, let's go over to Geert next. Over to you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, again, uh, just I'm uh, standing here with Roche, but of course, Roche, as you know, in the US is Genentech, so same company, same great products. And uh, I just want to say that uh, we've also been uh, using the ETT or ATP program quite extensively. As a matter of fact, um, I just looked up again. We, ha we already have interaction with the ET ETT with uh, four different technologies. And uh, so you, you mentioned about the graduation after three applications. Well, I can tell you that after your third application, you get a frequent user card. So I have that here. <laughs> Um, it looks like a metro card. Oh uh, no, no, yeah, it looks the same, you know. But <laughs> so no, so we, we have quite some experiences, but also you know, uh, similar to the statistics, all, all of these four technologies, and we had over a dozen meetings. We only have one of these technologies approved, so this is you know can also match us a little bit the statistics we've seen, and they're really all over the, the spectrum. So from real-time lethal biologics to uh, types of continuous manufacturing. So what I want to bring today, and I don't have as good notes, so I brought a slide which I can bring up. Uh, there we go. I bring it all the way up. So this is about a particular technology that is actually an off-the-shelf equipment in the first place. Uh, it's uh, called um, so-called uh, gloveless robotic modular filler. And so it's for, for filling stellar product, stellar environment. Uh, and the word gloveless already gives it away. So it's a machine that doesn't really require any operators to operate manually, but rather so robotics, has cameras, and so on and so forth. And um, so we decided this is a good fit for uh, both our portfolio uh, for various reasons. Um, uh, we also felt that it has a certain uh, or significant advantages from a compliance and safety perspective. So when at the start of the project in 2017, uh, we felt that the technology, while commercial and off the shelf, was novel enough that we uh, needed to proactively engage into action. And of course, we uh, started with the both health authorities with technology teams, and, and namely with the FDA. And you can, you can show here in 2019, we had a first FTA meeting, second meeting. Um, but then we also expanded this to other, other regions, and uh, uh, namely those where we have these uh, machines uh, located, because we have more than one of them already. Um, and as you can see, we, we then went to some national health authority. We also interacted with EMA. We have heard about the EMA QIG, I think, at some point this morning. Uh, to some extent, the predecessor, although still they coexist, is the so-called ITF Innovation Task Force. So we talked to them as well about technology. Now, a little bit different from the from the uh, FDA, you don't really get such a binding advice. It's really more technology discussion. So um, uh, subsequently, we have a third FDA meeting, and so with the FDA, we're actually good here, so to speak. We think we have all the advice we get. Um, we would be good to go. But again, and I think Celeste mentioned that uh, we have. Uh, it's a large company, we have obviously a portfolio that's global, and so we also need to make sure that in other regions uh, this technology would be accepted when we then start to use it. So we've now also very recently engaged with the EMA again on a scientific advice, which actually includes the new QIG. So we're going to have uh, we're probably one of the first companies who use the QIG for scientific advice. So where are we with that then all? Uh, essentially, there's different regional guidances also that apply, and I, I listed them here. And uh, particularly in Europe, the NX1 is the one that's probably most quoted. Uh, it's technically not a European guidance per se, because other regions also participated in the review. Um, but it's probably the one that's most looked at. And it was recently updated. Um, however, even in the up that there's a good thing and a bad thing, because maybe it allowed for more flexibility. But even still, that new version probably didn't anticipate the kind of equipment that we're planning on using. Uh, so there are still some things that need interpretation. Uh, and these interpretations, then, especially if you have it the first time around, you know, obviously it's something that's a risky situation, depending on which authority interprets this for you. So, in essence, um, like I said, while well, we're very good with the uh, with the U.S. in principle, um, there are currently still regional differences in the regulatory acceptance of this technology. Even though I might say that in some regions there are dozens of these machines, uh, including by other companies in use. Uh, but we're still working our way towards really an acceptance, at least in the main regions. Um, and um, yeah, so I guess to some extent I'm barking up yet again the topic of international harmonization. But you can tell that this is in a really specific case. I wouldn't say we're a case where the technology was in the end not approved because we're not there yet. But you can also tell that particular the, some negative feedback has a very chilling effect on our management. And to your point, Roger, uh, and you know that really put a big halt to the project. So. Hoping again that we are going to be successful, but then also 
uh, hoping that you know we can together work. What's particularly um, sometimes chilling about this, this is clearly something that wouldn't show up much in the dossier. So this is something that you wouldn't basically go with Q&A and assessment and dossier. There's an inspection situation and we'll maybe get to this later, but I think those are the most risky situations because in the end, without, I mean, in the FDA, you have the team with you, but you have to basically negotiate this in the few days of an inspection. That's a very high risk situation if you're not clear that this is acceptable from a gene perspective. So not underappreciating uh, dossier topics. I've been in the regulator for many years, but the inspection situation is just particularly stressful if, this, if you're the first. So thank you. Thank you, Gear. Last, certainly not least, Fernando. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm going to try to offer a, a, what is probably a little bit of a different perspective. Right? I'm the only academic in this panel. Um, let me tell you where I'm coming from. So I personally started working on continuous manufacturing uh, around 1998. So that's 25 years to the day. Um, I was visiting GSK, I've told the story before, and uh, in the course of one week there, we had this idea that we were going to put some feeders on top of the tablet press and make tablets that way. And we wrote a quick paper and sent it to GSK London House, and they rejected a proposal within 48 hours. And the reason was that they thought that the FDA was never going to let them do it because we are a batch industry and we will always be a batch industry. That was the mindset 25 years ago because over the next four or five years, I must have sent 15 more proposals to, you know, everybody, Merck, Pfizer, whatever. Everybody said more or less the same thing. No, the regulators will never let us do it. OK, so we went to the regulators. We had a chance to chat with Janet Woodcock and at the time, Majas Hussein. It turns out that FDA loved the idea. They put it on the PAT guidance, right? You go check the 2003 version or no, the 2004. And nobody ever said FDA is not going to let us. So I want to, first of all, I want to give credit where credit is due. I believe that the FDA has done a phenomenal job of promoting adoption of advanced manufacturing, supporting industry, leading other agencies. The reason there is so much alignment is because there was such a gap between all the things FDA had done and knew versus the European regulators or the Japanese regulators. I have talked with them a lot too, that you know, it's easy to lead when you are ahead, right? It's harder when you're behind or at the same place. So, um, so that was my first point, right? Uh, I got very lucky around 2005, 2006, we were able to get a couple big things funded by the National Science Foundation, including CSOPS. Um, and CSOPS focused on implementing uh, what was the first fully functional continuous direct compression system. We had one up and running with PAT and everything else, closed loop control around 2007, right? Um, and we have 50 companies actually in CSOPS working together. So, the reason I'm mentioning this is because if we're talking about developing and promoting adoption of new advanced manufacturing technologies, I think there are some lessons that we can learn. One of them was it was really, really good that we had all the key players at the table, the technology suppliers, the technology users, the technology integrators, the regulators, and you know, also my students who did all the hard work, right? I mean, so um, I think that that's a good model that we should replicate when we talk about the next wave of innovation. Yes, we all have jobs to do, and we have different abilities to do different parts of the job. I think that, again, the concept of centers of excellence could be very instrumental to the next wave of innovation. So that was my second point. My third point, if we can put back the previous slide, where you talked about, and I'll be, I'll be brief, fine. but and, and actually, that's fine. Regulatory challenges to adoption. OK, to adoption by whom? Because. There isn't a single answer, right? And adoption of what? Are we talking about adoption of continuous manufacturing by the generics? Because that has a totally different answer than adoption of 3D printing by branded, right? So number one, I, I want to fight the premise of the regulatory challenge. I want to flip that around and say, I think there are regulatory opportunities to promote adoption. Yeah? Let's, let's, tilt to the positive. The idea of the regulatory challenge is from 25 years ago. It's no longer, I believe, real. So what are the regulatory opportunities to promote adoption? If you want to promote adoption of more of these advanced technologies by branded, my opinion, having worked with a few of them, is that there are some aspects of the regulatory framework that could still be adopted, like change management. How much does the newer technology with the data density 
that you can achieve the real-time elucidation of product quality enables you to relax the constraints about moving product from here to there or making process changes or how many established conditions you really need to keep and things like that. I think that's a very big catalyst potentially. And I believe that we should be talking about, okay, if we can look at every single tablet coming out of a tablet press, are we still thinking the right way about how to approve those processes or approve changes to those processes or, you know, maybe can, we can tilt the requirement of equivalent product quality really to looking at the product coming out. And then if you meet that, why do you need to worry about other things, right? I mean, so that was the second remark. The third and last remark is that we should be looking at this next wave of advanced manufacturing technologies in a broader context. It's great if he is focusing on promoting the maximum quality possible, right? The best, the safety to the patient, all that. The companies are focusing on making as much money as possible, right? And that's legitimate. But we have some national imperatives. We have some, we have a job to do. Uh, it is a major national security issue that we depend on other countries for more than 80% of the drugs we give to our population when we're another. It's a, it's a national security issue and it's also, well, it's a problem from many angles, right? So that's one. The other is we are in an age where we could assure the quality of every product unit, but yet we have 300 drugs in shortage, 62% of that is caused by quality issues. When we have the technology in some cases at least to eliminate those problems at the source, yeah? We need to get ready for the next pandemic or whatever it is, which means that we need a much faster process of developing and getting drugs in the market than what we have now. Technology can help us do all those things. So I think as a community, we need to look at how do we develop and promote adoption of technologies, not only to improve quality and make more money, but also to bring manufacturing back to the US to assure the safety of our population, right? For our families, for our children, and in my case, grandchildren. And if we look at it in that context, I think that the whole business case conversation may be a very different one. And now I'll shut up. I said enough. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Fernanda. And actually, you, you teed up our first discussion question. No, no, so I didn't well. mean to. Sorry. Uh, well, thank you for doing it nonetheless, <laughs> accidentally. Um, but it always strikes me when you talk about advanced manufacturing for pharmaceuticals that pharmaceuticals is one thing. I think we all know that it's not a truly homogeneous industry. There are different sectors, they have different considerations and so on. So my first question to the panel, and this relates to the regulatory concerns, and these can be either real or perceived. Uh, what concerns exist for, say, small molecules versus biologics for new drug submissions versus post-approval submissions? Because all those are those are different things, and we could chop it up even more. But <laughs> but let's start there. Anybody want to kick us off, Roger? I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll jump in on the post approval changes. If you look at um, the backlog of post approval changes globally, it's four to seven years to get one change approved. If you file multiple changes for a product, that means you have multiple inventories that you have to manage globally for each of those countries. That's a ridiculous situation to be in. Um, and it's something that is of big concern. And, and when, I, when I talk about the bottom line money, um, I tried really valiantly in my company because we had 18,000 products. And so you can imagine the number of post-approval changes we had for 18,000 products to try to hone down how many submissions we would make. Um, and I couldn't because everybody wanted to optimize. We had reasons to optimize. There were new suppliers. We needed to ensure quality more, more directly for a given product. Um, you know, we needed to optimize a manufacturing process or an analytical method. So that, to me, is one of the biggest concerns, I think, facing, because it's, it's still growing. It's not getting better. That's one area that isn't getting better. Uh, no matter what you do, it seems to be almost worse. Can I add to that, maybe? Please, go ahead. Um, so absolutely agree with the postal rule. I think, as a manufacturer, we basically have the choice, if you want to choose a new technology, uh, what do I do? Do I do it on a marketed product or do it on a new product? And it's basically, uh, none of that is really ideal. As, as Roger pointed out, if you do it on a marketed product, uh, you have to handle all these different supply chains. Uh, one of the good things about it, if uh, some, some country won't accept it, you at least have the old version of the product. So that's a good thing. But again, the penalty for doing this in your 50, 80, 120 markets is just tremendous. 
also the penalty for supply chain. Now, if you do some new product, I always tell people, I think ideally something new, um, you want to do it on a, on a BLA or NA in the US because that's actually the best opportunity to really tell your story comprehensively. Um, you get probably the most attention, but I can tell you, um, well, I think people in the US know the expression, not in my backyard, in IMB. Uh, the same thing happens in the pharmaceutical company. It's just called not on my product. Okay. Because uh, your launch product that wants to use a new technology, and there are companies who are brave enough to have done that, um, but it's a tremendous pressure. Anyways, a product launch is very important for a company. And so I can tell you, it's a very long discussion to say, well, in addition to any other risk on the CMC and that we have, now there's this technology and, well, maybe we're gonna do this on another product. So it's basically not, not really uh, an ideal case yet, although I still would say uh, that, again, with a more comprehensive possibility to tell a story, uh, a new product is good. An ideal case, a new product, of course, and also the risk of uh, whether the clinic actually works out, right? So you may invest all of this kind of thing and then the clinic results are not there. That's another risk there. So again, pros and cons to both. And I think Ahmed, you were going to so, say something. Yeah, so I can, I can share. So uh, in, there are challenges both ways. If you want to implement new innovative technologies right at the beginning, or you want to implement that as a post-approval change, and I can give a flavor of both. So for, for initial submissions, the, the fact is, you know, companies are developing these innovative manufacturing technologies. At the same time, the assets are being tested in the clinical uh, phases of development leading to submissions. So most of the time, these technologies are not off the shelf ready to be applied early on the programs. And so most of the time, these programs will have been supported through clinical trials, including potentially registration trials, registration clinical trials with the conventional modes. And then the sponsors are trying to figure out what is the right time to start implementing these innovative manufacturing technologies. And that's a very valid question where the existing regulatory frameworks sometimes are not very clear to elaborate what is the risk. How can you convert from, for example, a conventional batch process that you may have used for your registration trials to a continuous manufacturing that you want to intend to commercialize with? You know, requirements for bioequivalence or not? What can you justify? What can you not justify? These discussions, you know, have been ongoing in workshops in general, and, and we know the answer is, you know, a lot of times is it depends. Uh, but a lot of times that does not give enough clarity to sponsors, which may provide some hesitation to try to implement and be committed to actually intercept some of these leading clinical assets right before commercialization to switch over to new innovative uh, technologies. So if you hadn't used it throughout the registration trials, they would be hesitant to bring it right before submission. So that's the initial submission side. So what we need there is more clarity. How do you do that conversion, whether immediately after approval or immediately even before the initial submission? What requirements would be there? And on the flip side, if you want to wait and register with your conventional manufacturing processes and implement this as a post-approval change, I think, you know, probably short of the FDA and the EMA, uh, there's a very short list of regulatory uh, health authorities where very defined timelines and expectations for post-approval changes. And so you will be dealing with this post-approval ambiguity and very extended timelines uh, through which sponsors have to continue to supply global supply chains with two existing processes until everybody, everybody around the world has switched over to the intended long-term process. So there are challenges in both, both situations. Okay. Let's go to Fernando next. And also curious if you will weigh in on this small molecule versus biologics considerations no. too. No. Okay. All right. Well, let's just stick with what we're on. I want to I wanna <laughs> avoid the usual <laughs> academic stereotype. I want to talk only about things that I think I know something about. <laughs> as opposed to try to talk about everything just because, OK? Um, I do want to talk about small molecule on this, and in particular, continuous manufacturing for us solid doses. I want to go a little bit beyond what you just said. Not that I disagree. I support what you said, but I want to go beyond. Um, you know, SUPAC, originally, the idea there was triaging the gravity of a change and then having an appropriate you know, change management process, right? But if Supak was a person, he would have two kids, one of them about to graduate from high school and, you know, be about halfway paying his mortgage. Supak is 27 years old. Okay, so I think that we can look at, again, take a fresh look at what do we do when we make solid dose products, which are, what, 70% of the things we prescribe to people. 
And we could realize that there are some things that are easy to make and safe to make where there are very few actual risk factors, right? If you have an immediate release product with more than 10% API, less than 30% API, you know, readily soluble molecule or whatever, there is a whole class of things that we've been making for a long time, we, ho we know how to make, it's rare to have a quality issue unless you really are messing up. You marry that with technology that can really look at tens of thousands of measurements per hour, and so my point is, maybe we need to think along the lines of 503B and say, if you have an approved site that you can qualify a certain you know, list of capabilities in this site, here are all the things you can make by whichever way you want, as long as your quality data supports your release, period, full story. And if you were to do that, you would enormously simplify right, the, the whole situation we have in to sit on 7,000 applications or whatever it is. Um, because I think the technology can allow us to do that now. We just have to be bold enough to say, you know, that yeah, we can probably take two thirds of the solid dose products we're making and put them in one big list saying, okay, what do you need to comply with to be able to make and sell this? Okay, show me that your quality system is capable, but show it to me as a site capability. And then go and make it. And keep your data because we're going to come and visit you and we're going to take a look at your data. But, you know, you don't need our permission ahead of time. And you guys are already doing that with 503 bs right? On injectables, which I would argue, on average, are a heck of a lot riskier than solid dose. Yeah? So that's, that's my contribution. But you're leading a little bit to the biologics versus small molecule because the more complexity and the more uncertainty, the more likelihood the innovation may be a little more difficult. Yeah, but, but a lot of injectables are no biologics. No, no, no. I, right? but I'm just, I said injectables. But, but I'm using complexity. And the ones on 503B are no biologics, but are, are small molecules. For not, I'm general. using complexity. I'm not using large versus small. Okay. But, but the other thing is, when you take the human out of the equation, you actually reduce the, the problems, the risks, the issues significantly. Absolutely. More automation is better. Yes. And so I think... Well, uh, uh, yes, Jeff. M no, no. I mean, yes and no, but, but it, more automation in, uh, applied in the right way. More good automation yeah. is better. Good. Because you can do bad automation but, as but well. But we're not going to do bad because we're going to go to the ETP and we're going to go to okay. the CATT <laughs> and we're going to make sure it's good. I think the problem is, is getting, it, getting everybody convinced that it is because I still think we're, we have a mindset that's back in the old days of you know, using a shovel to add stuff to the, yeah. to the mix. Yeah, a part of the thinking process still stuck in the mold of 25 years ago. Yeah. We haven't fully embraced what we can do with the technologies that we have and the ones that we're going to develop. Let me ask you a follow-up question, because you mentioned these sort of high-throughput analytical technologies a few times. Yeah. What specifically do you have in mind there? Well, I mean, for solid dose, we can pretty much assure every single quality parameter of a finished product in real time, including the solution. I mean, if you just look at how many people are doing the solution modeling today, there is a lot of examples that worked. So, and the systems have become fast enough that you can actually do the analysis of about 300,000 to 400,000 tablets an hour, including the prediction of the solution of each and every single tablet. I don't believe in 100% inspection because I think it's needed, because statistically it's not. I believe in 100% inspection because it's enabling to making some decisions and knowing that we're on the safe side because we're going to kick out every single faulty tablet from that product stream. So my question is, if I can implement a system where I can assure the quality of each and every individual tablet I'm making, why do I need prior permission to release that product as opposed to demonstrating that I have the capability and then it's go, right? It's innocent until proven guilty, not the other way around. And I'm enjoying the fact that being an academic, I can ask these questions without <laughs> anybody getting too upset, right? <laughs> so. I can follow up. So, and, and this can create another challenge, actually. So as an example, if you want to talk about continuous manufacturing as an example, you know, we're really happy and glad that the recent FDA guidance document, as well as Q13, was not overly prescriptive. Yeah. It, it clarified the expectations. And then it left, you know, breathing room for sponsors specifically depending on the technologies they had or the specific requirements for the given asset or, or um, process to determine what's appropriate. Some of the challenge, challenges that we're going through as an industry now is, you know, maybe the first few applications that go through that were able to use some technologies because it was possible for these few molecules. For example, using a PAT, if you have 
you know, a drug that has a very good signal through the NIR wavelength that's appropriate and it's a high drug load. Absolutely, it's possible. But now you're getting through examples where this is not technically feasible anymore. Yeah. And so are we unintentionally getting to a situation where this was kind of a, an expectation now, an unintentional expectation, simply because the first few applications were able to do it? That does not necessarily, it is an expectation for everything else. Uh, but you still need to you know, comply with the guidelines of Q13. And, and, there. So, and, and so the question here is, is there really a lost opportunity, a missed opportunity, for example, for process models? Have we become over-reliant on PAT because the first few applications uh, were technically feasible, but now the industry is going through examples where technically this might not be feasible anymore. So we need to look for areas where process models are actually, uh, could be a potential option uh, for processes that are very well understood. Yeah. One more very quick thing. You guys are talking about distributed point of care manufacturing. And I would propose right now, in most cases, that will be impossible unless you're doing non-destructive predictive testing and pretty close to real time. Yeah, I think it's a reality of small batch sizes generally, yeah. but certainly is related to those technologies. Uh, I want to go back to something Roger said, though, about the complexity, not necessarily about small molecule versus biologic, but, but the complexity. And Ingrid, curious if you had any response to that about how you see the breakdown between small molecule and biologic or complex, uh, however you want to think about it. Yeah, no, I, I think that that's a great question. And I'm kind of like looking through the evolution, for instance, of ICH uh, guidance documents. Sort of traditionally, we've kind of had this division between small molecules and large molecules, you know, in guidelines. And now the tendency is to sort of have one overarching guideline that would sort of combine and uh, recommend the same types of principles, you know, for both types of molecules. But if there are any unique aspects, then you can sort of address that, like let's say in an annex, you know. So there are all of these opportunities to think about and, and I think it's, it's sort of a, almost like an old school, you know, when we said, you know, biologics are so complicated, you know, you just can't understand them. They're so complex and the risks are so high. And, and maybe they are because of the risk of unintended outcome, but there are always a commonalities, you know, where we applied, you know, sound science and risk-based approaches. And, you know, by sort of doing our due diligence, you know, we can sort of come to the, you know, most desired outcome. I mean, at the end of the day, you have to make sure your product is fit for purpose. Right, it has to be safe, efficacious, and it has to, you know, meet the required standards of quality. And so that kind of applies across the board. And I do appreciate the comment about, you know, the challenges. Um, I think kind of like in, in every, any other thing that we do, and, you know, Fernando made a, such a nice point about let's look at a positive side. You know, so let's look at the advantages. Let's look at the benefits of innovation. You know, if it reduces the, you know, the, the cost of production, you know, if, if I can now make this, you know, product with a greater throughput, if I can make it faster, if I can deliver this product to the patient faster and, you know, achieve the same or even better quality, you know, perhaps, you know, that could be, you know, the, the good enough goal that could be driving us. And obviously, you know, we have all of these comparability guidances. Hopefully you guys have read them. You know, Riley actually <laughs> mentioned the last one. It truly is a phenomenal guidance. And actually, it's very helpful uh, to sort of serve as um, sort of a general guidance. You know, you know, how do you, you know, what types of studies do you need to do if you want to compare a product, you know, before change and after change? You know, essentially, it applies the risk-based approach. So um, it's it's nice to know that um, you mentioned very nicely that FD guidances are not very prescriptive, and and the reason for that is that you want to provide that opportunity to be creative within your own space. And if you want to do something that's sort of outside of the guidance, you know, you can always go to the FDA and say, I'm going to do X, Y, Z, and these are my reasons why I'm doing it. And the reasoning behind why I'm doing something, it's really the key to sort of convince your regulator. I'll stop. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I'm thank done. You. Um, so let's jump to a topic that has come up multiple times already, and let's go right to international harmonization. OK, easy, easy to say, hard to do, of course. And my question to the panel here is, again, not treating advanced manufacturing as one thing either. What are some specific topic areas where we could benefit from harmonizing related to advanced manufacturing? Mutual reliance. Yes. 
I mean, I, I worked on the COVID vaccine, the mRNA vaccine. That would not have been distributed in the time that it was distributed without mutual reliance. Let's learn from that. I'm not saying it's applicable in every case, but there are really, I think, very serious opportunities of being overlooked if we just ignore it or, or don't participate in at least considering where it might be applicable. What is your definition of mutual reliance for the audience here? Um, it would be you do science one way, and, and many regulatory authorities ag agree with that science and accept it as is. They, they can review it if they choose, but they can also rely on the approval of, uh, and the uh, approach that was done by another agency. And if I can just follow up on that, I think, uh, I think we've been doing already mutual reliance. You know, we've had clusters, you know, when you had, especially from a theater perspective, we had vaccine cluster, we had cell and gene therapy cluster. So we already had all of those ongoing discussions among the regulators. But I think what the COVID really, one of the lessons learned from COVID, it kind of really pushed that to the next level. It kind of brought that this really more global collaborative effort and not just between two or three health authorities, but really between health authorities, industry, and other you know, governmental institution, you really kind of took it to the next level. And it's really perhaps that broader collaborative effort that needs to sort of be more used or exercised that you know, we need to really to kind of get that final push you know, to reach the state that we're talking about. Just have that seamless transition, let's say from batch to manufacturing, by pulling in all of those collective thinking and knowledge uh, and making it happen. And then maybe, I mean, reliance is a little bit like world peace, right? I mean, something that we all strive for, but I think it's something that hasn't yet been used much in this innovative manufacturing field, right? Because, I mean, there's a lot of reliance efforts, but maybe there's something where it actually might have benefits. Uh, I know the FDA certainly is a couple of steps ahead, but even also their expertise is not unlimited. And there will be many other health authorities out there which really look at some of the things and say, ooh, I don't even know how to tackle this. And why would it not be possible uh, through existing reliance mechanism in some shape or form that they also rely, right? I mean, uh, the example that I mentioned, uh, probably some of the root cause of this uh, ongoing uh, efforts is that there's just not that expertise there. So how can we use it also in the technology field? Well, I, I, I have a very parochial example, the one that I brought up at the very beginning, post-approval changes. Why, why, why do we have to wait for seven years for an approval in Zimbabwe for a change? Why can't there be mutual reliance that suggests if other, many other markets have already approved it, the justification is there? Well, I have one thought about this, um, again, based on some previous interactions with various agencies, right? Early in the life cycle of a new technology, the critical training aspect is the transfer of a certain amount of knowledge to thought leaders within the agencies, right? I mean, it's usually a small group of individuals that are going to become aware of the technology that can advocate internally and interact with the rest of the industry. Later on, you have the problem you have now, which you want to train lots of reviewers and lots of inspectors because you want to socialize, you know, the ability to evaluate. But what if we were more deliberate and say, okay, for the next major technology or the one that we think is going to be big now, why don't we create something like an international regulatory school, right? Where we implement certain trainings across agencies, could be done within the context of ICH or could be broader. It could involve the Brazilians, it could involve the Turkish people, you know, maybe India and China too. I don't see why not, right? And we begin to share the understanding of that technology and its role and its fundamentals and the science behind them and the first case studies to begin to achieve a commonality of thinking around these things very early on. And then we support that with trainings that we share across agencies because that motivates sharing the language, sharing the understanding, being able to look at things the same way. This wouldn't cost a lot of money. It would be a trivial amount of money compared to the cost of not doing it. And it would, I believe, greatly facilitate the conversation. And it wouldn't have to be limited to regulators. You could actually also have industry people or other government agencies or whatever, right? But we, you know, uh, we, I'm an educator. My job is to think about how to train people. So I'm thinking that we could be more deliberate about educating on a common curriculum, right? Well, Chemical engineers from all over the world, we agree pretty quickly on how to do things. Fernando, there's already a framework. That's WHO. Okay, WHO but is this being does, done? Am I behind but the But they're, they're doing it, but they're doing it in, in a limited fashion. They're not doing it for innovative programs. They're not doing it f across the board. But 
it, it already exists to some extent. The okay. question is, can you expand it effectively so that it can apply to innovative as well as uh, conventional? Okay. And just a, yeah, do I finish? Yeah, go ahead and then we'll jump Okay, I mean, an, another thing kind of thinking uh, in terms of the, you know, sort of more global um, harmonization is kind of thinking about uh, how do you communicate, you know, what you've done, your data package to the regulator in terms of a dossier. And so having that one global dossier could really sort of help streamline and converge different regulatory practices from different regions. And one example is M4Q, which is now undergoing revision. And so, you know, with the goal is really how do we pull all of those regions? And now ICH has expanded to many more um, members compared to the six pack, you know, that we had like 10 years ago. So I think we're walking really huge strides compared to what we did. And I think the field has really gotten very far compared to what we used to be. But I think it might be a little difficult to discuss just the technology without a broader regulatory context, because by solving some of the regulatory you know, aspects and addressing them, we're also really addressing the technology aspect as well. So kind of difficult to discuss this in isolation. Yeah. So Ahmad, we've heard about mutual reliance, post-approval changes, dossier, related to but not specific to advanced manufacturing. I'm curious your thoughts on these, and if, if there's anything specific to advanced manufacturing yes, you got to share. I was going to uh, follow up on the on the uh, glo global challenges uh, perspective, but you know, first, you know, I'm glad you brought up M4Q R2. That's great. That will enhance that because it's through ICH. Uh, but some of the challenges that sponsors still deal with is, you know, even after that's done, there will still be country-specific requirements in Module One. Those may not go away. So. Even though you align on mod, mod 2, QoS, and mod 3, there will be still uh, country-specific requirements in mod 1. Uh, so uh, ho hopefully that will go away. Yeah, but M4Q is just <laughs> module 2, module yes. 3. So yes. uh, I have a pleasure so to sit on the EWG. That, that would so go a long way, but that's not, not the full story, unfortunately. M2, M3, sorry. So with the, uh, with, with the glo glo global perspective, uh, I mean, it is, it is real. I mean, it's, 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 it's challenging, challenging, you know, as an example. You know, for new innovative manufacturing technologies, you need to define how you're, you know, assuring state of control. A lot of times you need tools that will assure the health of the process that you're collecting, you know, acceptable quality product. And some of these tools could be, for example, through process modeling or through chemometric modeling, through PAT. But the reality is a lot of companies now are hesitant uh, to implement process models because of the uncertainty of acceptability in some markets. Uh, so the answer could be, oh, okay, just go through the PAT path. The problem is, as we shared before, sometimes technically that's not feasible. And, you know, in other markets, uh, it's actually really challenging to maintain the PAT models through the life cycle, you know, in Europe. Uh, throughout the life cycle without having to go through cumbersome variations because you're not able to maintain those through the PQS. And so these diverging um, global expectations are real. They're real challenges to companies for how do you develop a control strategy that's robust and at the same time does not add a lot of burden to companies because of these differences in, in global, um, global expectations. So um, it, 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 it is real. I, I don't disagree. I mean, I sat on ICH for 25 years in different capacities, and I can tell you it's not perfect. And, and, the, and the issue that I see is not so much that the guidelines aren't there or there isn't agreement on how to do it. It's implementation at the end of the day. It's being able to implement. But I also think we can't put our head in the sand and say, well, we're just not going to do it. Let's just continue doing what we're doing. I think in order to pay, to, to play, you have to, or in order to play, you have to pay. So with continuous processing, the companies that embrace that, and you know this, we embraced it because we saw a value that we were able to monetize, first of all, and second of all, the value for the overall platform that could be used for a number of products. And we went through, and, and, and we know that it was tough. I mean, it took a long time to get approval in 120 countries. But we got approval in 120 countries. And now we have a platform that's moving in that direction. So I think we still have to be focused on trying to do that. I'm trying to, I'm trying to uh, channel your optimism here a little bit, for, uh, Fernando, because I think there's some value in having that as an aspiration, even though I know that the challenges are still there, and they're going to be there. But if the incentives are there, and again, I'm trying to offer incentives like mutual reliance and other things, yeah. then, then, you have a, then you have an opportunity to, to move that forward more quickly.
And these opportunities, if we work on from a global perspective, they will enhance the adoption, the faster Absolutely. adoption of these manufacturing technologies. Yeah. Let's, let's hear from Geert next. So just, uh, I know we are in the death of, I didn't know how this became an M4Q discussion, but why not? <laughs> but just uh, just coming a little bit back to technology, so maybe some some two good news snippets, potentially good news snippets on the on the harmonization front. So first of all, uh, that near infrared guideline that finally somebody mentioned here in Europe, I mean, I think that is set to be revised, and we know that this has not been just stifling PAT, but even process modeling because everybody, so there's a, uh, the uh, EMA uh, QWP has committed to revising it. I'm hopeful of that. And also, you mentioned WHO, right? I've seen a uh, private organization that hasn't been mentioned so much in the technology space, but even they are reaching out. So there's an event actually at the end of this month where WHO inspectors teams want to hear from industry experts, and we're engaged on both continuous manufacturing, but that even on artificial intelligence, right? So, so even that, that's very promising. And the artificial intelligence discussion is more like a very open forum. So I think there's at least an interest now which is for us industry really important because, you know, the world just doesn't consist only of ICH countries. Well, let's also not forget that the world also doesn't just consist of the top 20 pharmaceutical companies. Because in this whole conversation, we're missing the generics, the OTCs, the, you know, brand manufacturing for stores, whatever. What about all those guys? The, I mean, 25 years later, most generic companies aren't even, even using PAT. They don't even do quality by design. Well, they do something that they call quality by design. Well, but it's not quality by design. Okay, no, I they're, mean. They're not here to defend themselves. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so why I, I said it. <laughs> that's why I, I, I kind of want to be sure that we don't forget them because, you know, it's also. But we, but we got to have the incentive for it. Exactly. If there isn't and an incentive for it, it's not going to happen. Exactly right. So we have to think along those lines. What is the incentive? Is the acceleration of approvals? Is the facilitation of change management? What is the incentive? Do we have to support prices? I mean. yeah, so, Fernando, you've accidentally led me into another again. question that I'd like to ask <laughs> here. So, I I thank you that. again. Sorry. Um, but we talked a lot about the regulatory considerations here. Uh, my question here is about industry's role, and particularly curious about sharing information and also standardization. And Garrett, you just brought up artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. right, the one challenge that I see with artificial intelligence is that machine learning depends on the quality of the data that it learns from, right? And so that means you can't just have successful data that feeds into it. You also have to have failed data uh, that mm -hmm. feeds into it. And failed data costs money, right? So it strikes me as an area where industry could play a role together pre-competitively to advance AI in a way that benefits everybody. But this is just my personal example. I'm sure everyone is not that interested in hearing from me, much more interested in hearing from you. So thoughts on how industry could play a role in either sharing information or standardizing? Well, standardization, I mean, I think we could have a discussion now on technology platforms, so we're gonna have a discussion this afternoon designated. Um, but um, I think slightly diverging, I think transparency or, or even information sharing is important also when it comes to um, successes in the action with the regulars. Sometimes it's actually really hard to find out uh, what actually now is acceptable, has been approved or not. I mean, everybody knows about continuous diet compression, right? But uh, I can tell you, we're having a hard time with the examples that I gave about half an hour ago, trying to figure out which companies actually have this approved, right? And yeah. that's really something that is, that there's, there's no competitive advantage in that. So we could, as industry, probably do a little bit better in sharing uh, our success stories, maybe even our failure stories. So that's one thing. I know it's very hard for the, for the FDA to share these things. Um, for confidential reasons, but I, I think it will also every positive story that's out there is a very good tool also for our internal discussion, back to Roger's point, the internal barriers uh, to go to uh, some of our, our, our critical stakeholders and turn saying, look, you know, this is actually possible and such and such have done that. So we could do a little bit better there as well. And again, then among maybe among regulators and there's various mechanisms there. Um, everybody talks about the ICMRA pilots, we're probably nowhere yet, but if you could help, and the FDA, who is so much ahead, could also share their experiences, uh, maybe their consideration with other agencies, that would also help tremendously, because it could really speed up the process of building confidence. Again, I'm still going to propose to use reliance also on technology. You know, it's an area we haven't done it yet. So that, that, that sharing, just information sharing, it could be helpful. Uh, there's barriers on both industry and regulatory side to do this, but I can tell you it's a very positive event when, when this is known, because it really helps with a lot of internal discussions. So that's my take on the on the transparency, if you will. Yeah, I, Roger. I can vouch for that. Again, using the example of the mRNA vaccine, um, we, we, we had to talk to other companies. 
we didn't have the, the um, luxury of saying, no, this is our property and we're not going to share it. We were in a pandemic. And so we had to talk with other companies about where they were at. We didn't go into a lot of detail because we were in competition in trying to get there, but we were in competition to get there so that we could help you know, keep people alive. And I think ultimately the good thing was that that sharing led to some really very, very good approaches. So one, one approach that I, I think worked very well was parallel development. Normally, you know, companies have a conventional approach to development where they develop the drug substance, they learn about the drug substance, and then they develop the drug product. Well, in this case, we didn't have time to do that, so we had to do them in parallel. <coughs> and by doing that, and, and by talking to other companies about doing that, we learned a few things. We learned about where there may be failure modes that we hadn't anticipated and how to ad adjust to them. We also had issues with the lipids that we used in, that pro in, in the mRNA product because there wasn't enough lipid around. So we had to talk to a whole bunch of people on how, how can we manufacture enough lipids for the companies that were using them for this particular vaccine so that we could be able to ostensibly deliver a product very quickly. I think that those examples are really, really useful, but the problem is for me to say that while I was at Pfizer, that would have been blasphemy and I would have been kicked out of my company because you can't talk about sharing information. Um, I remember another example where when we went to China with a gene therapy product and the Chinese regulators wanted to know all of the detailed information on our intellectual property, and this is before we had approval anywhere. This is when we were in investigational. The company wasn't going to share that information because they were worried that it wouldn't be protected in that particular region of the world. And so we, I don't know if we can get over that or not. I don't know if that's a, that's I mean, a barrier that can never be approached. I, I, I even see a dangerous trend coming up right now where some companies believe that it would actually be a good idea to patent some of these technologies, yeah. right? Uh, and, and that's something that I think wasn't as much there in the past. Yes, at some point there was actually a pattern and blend uniformity and nobody enforced it. But I've, there's a couple of examples, obviously I'm not going to name them, where very common technologies, companies are trying to uh, create and appear on that, which will really stifle innovation. And I believe really there's actually no money to be made for a pharmaceutical company on these technologies, but it will definitely lead to, and nobody going to license it either from you. So that's actually a very dangerous trend. I know that's more in the private sector here, but uh, some of the IP uh, initiatives I've seen uh, really trouble me a lot because they will just uh, uh, just stifle the, uh, uh, the actual use in manufacturing, right? Because you may still do it in development, kind of in the, in, in the shadow of, 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 of things, but uh, that, uh, that will really stifle manufacturing. So that's, that's another, I know that wasn't on the script, but uh, this IPing of this technology would be very dangerous. Ingrid, did you have yeah, thoughts? It's, yeah. it's, I think it's interesting that the data sharing sort of, it, it's not a new idea, right? So it's sort of come up over the years. But I think one area where really information sharing could be extremely beneficial is with these cutting edge therapies where there are opportunities for public private partnerships to sort of share information in a pre competitive space so that everybody can benefit. One example is that Zebra spearheaded the bespoke therapy consortium where really brings together all the stakeholders in the field, discusses information in this early space, educates to the, to the extent where there is no issue with confidentiality, but it provides sort of a safe space to kind of move early products further along the line. So I, I think when we're talking about something that's so super cutting edge, it's very difficult to sort of work in a silo. And you sort of have to sort of reach a comfort level where you can actually share certain things so, you know, everybody can sort of advance and, and do better. So, you know, just, just a thought to consider. And, and that came naturally, for example, with continuous manufacturing over the past decade, you know, a lot of companies were part of CSOPs, that's where the interaction started, and then different companies had, you know, one-on-one -on -one or uh, benchmarking because it was for, for that concept to validate the internal company's thinking you know, and, and to collaborate in a pre-competitive fashion, right? You know, on advancing the technologies and methodologies, and again, to validate the, uh, the assumptions with regards to where it fits and, you know, approaches to control strategy, not necessarily talking about the assets specifically, but to collaborate in a pre-competitive fashion. So with, with the CM pieces, uh, you know, initially through CSOP, that was a very good example of how companies reached out uh, to, to, to develop and implement such technologies. In fact, we had an agreement of all the universities and companies that were in CSOPs that we were going to publish everything. And we published 500 papers in 10 years on how to do this, right? The problem is you have to read them now, but uh, it's, uh, 
we did. So, you know, I, my, my, my thoughts on this, uh, there is a project going on funded by FDA that is supported through NIPTI in collaboration with USP where we're creating a knowledge management center for continuous manufacturing. The idea is to create tools where people can find the knowledge quickly, right? Because the other problem is not only whether people want to share, is that where do you find it? Because, you know, and what is current versus what is old? And, and I'll tell you one thing. It's very, very hard, actually, to create those tools. It takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of work. Gerardo Calegari here from my team is leading that project. And, you know, he's, he's aging quickly, trying to get it done. Um, but, uh, um, but I think we can do more along those lines, or we can think about not just what is the knowledge that we can share, but how can we? You know, if you look, CM and 3D printing started roughly at the same time. We had the impression that 3D printing is that much newer. No, it's that we're doing so much less of it as of now. Right? But they both started roughly at the same time. And I think one reason why CM basically grew faster and it's been applied in many more areas is because the information is all there. So. I am a big believer of doing that. Let me ask you a question here. Um, you mentioned back in 1998 that your CM voyage started. Yeah. Basically. If everything had gone exactly right, how long do you think it would have take, taken to broadly adopt CM? And well, m my personal awareness of CM started much, much earlier when I was an undergrad working in petroleum refineries, right? And those all were all continuous, right? But chemical engineers is almost like second nature. But, if everything had gone right, I am, I am on record as being monumentally wrong by predicting that within 20 years, about 50% of products are going to be made by continuous. And, you know, I was off by two orders of magnitude, probably. <laughs> but uh, I don't know that anything went wrong. Okay. I think it takes time. Oh. It took six times to gain the approval for Presista, right, from the point when we started, or seven time, years, or eight years. It takes time. We have to understand that it's not something you can do quickly. Uh, but it would have been faster if we had had an organic strategic plan on really where did we want to get and when did we want to get there and therefore what do we need to do. So that's why I said earlier, right now, right now, I want to have a strategic plan for advanced manufacturing technology implementation that goes beyond what a couple companies want or what FDA wants or what we academics want, right? But rather as a country and even broader than that, right? Where do we want to be in pharmaceutical product and process development in 25 years, in the next 25? And I hope I'm still there. But where do we want to be? How do we want to be making medicines? How do we want to be delivering medicines? How do we want to be, uh, you know, lowering the cost while we improve the quality, while we maintain the right personnel? I don't think it's crazy to say, okay, let's capitalize on what we learn and let's really try to understand where do we want to get and how do we get there? And it needs to be a live plan because it'll change as we go along. We'll learn new things. We need to reassess. But I think it'll be faster and better if we, you know, who was it? Yogi Berra that said it's hard to get there if you don't know where you're going. So, you know, I like to have a conversation. Where do we want to go? And how do we get there? And you guys started the whole thing, right? You, you are in great position to enable that. But I think we have to go beyond. I think that we need to find a, a small amount of resources that allow us to create that roadmap. Thank you. A lot to think about. Let's thank our panelists for a great discussion here today. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Um, we could keep the discussion going, but we're going to have a quick break. We'll reconvene 2.20 p.m. OK, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'm sure you've all been anxiously awaiting your hopefully favorite session of the day on the New Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program. I'm Stephen Colville with the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. I also am the Executive Director of RISCS, which is a nonprofit rating and certification organization for drug supply chains. I serve on the board of the End Drug Shortages Alliance and also receive fees as an advisor for Medicines 360. Um, we'll be shifting our focus to that new designation program that I, that I mentioned for the rest of this, this afternoon. Uh, first, we're going to hear a presentation from Ranjani Prabhakara. A policy lead in FDA Cedars Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality within OPQ, the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality. She'll be providing an overview of the new Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program, which was included in the Consolidated Appropriations Act Congress passed at the end of last year. 
This legislation directs FDA to establish a new pathway for organizations to have a drug or biologic manufacturing technology designated as advanced with certain incentives attached to that designation. Um, I'll introduce our panelists after Ranjani's presentation and we'll discuss some of the key provisions of that program, its implementation, and how it fits into FDA and industry's broader efforts to increase adoption of innovative manufacturing technologies. I um, also want to give everyone a Slido reminder. If you want to ask questions, go to slido.com um, and you can, you can um, ask questions about this, this newly established program. We want to hear your input on whatever, whatever would be interesting or unclear to you based on the, the new legislation. So again, slido.com, S-L-I-D-O, enter the code, hashtag DMJune8, and you can submit your questions. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Ranjani. Thank you. So I guess I just, oh, there we go. So um, again, my name is Ranjani. I'm a policy lead in uh, OPQ in the Office of Policy for Pharmaceutical Quality. And I will be indeed talking about the new Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program. So before we get into the program, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how we got here to this point. And it started, well, it started a long time ago, but uh, this particular program started with the uh, Omnibus, or the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023. It's a huge $1.7 trillion omnibus spending bill that was signed by President Biden on December 29th, 2022, so end of last year. And uh, it's a huge piece of legislation. It funded the U.S. government for the 2023 fiscal year and addressed a very large range of domestic and foreign policy priorities. So of course the priorities that we are, we are interested in here today are the quality related provisions. So I'm just sharing a select few of those here today. The first one is uh, the Prevent Pandemics Act. We're not really gonna be talking about that. Uh, that's the one that contains platform technologies, has some sections about uh, drug and device manufacturing registration and expiration of, or extension of expiration dates. And the one we are gonna focus on uh, today is uh, the Food and Drug Omnibus Reform Act of 2022, or as we like to call it, Fedora. Yes, like the hat. Uh, it's, uh, it rolls off the tongue easily, at least. And uh, there's a few quality-related provisions here that I wanted to draw your attention to. Of course, 3203 is the Emerging Technology Program. Uh, 3204 has to do with advanced and continuous manufacturing. In red, because it's the topic of my talk today, is Section 3213, and this is the new Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program. And then 3613, which has to do with FDA inspections. So before we talk about the program, I want to talk about what is an advanced manufacturing technology. And this, what I have here, is uh, the legislative text. It's taken right out of Fedora. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. It's, it's quite long. It is available pretty easily online. Uh, so I've highlighted in red some of the key concepts that we want to discuss. So what is an advanced manufacturing technology, or an AMT, because it's uh, it's a mouthful to, to say. Uh, and it applies to methods of manufacturing drugs. And these include biological products. These include active pharmaceutical ingredients. And it can either be a method of manufacturing or a combination of manufacturing methods that are novel in some way. It either incorporates a novel technology or it uses an estab established technology in a new or a novel way. So it's a manufacturing method, it's novel, that's not quite enough. It also has to substantially improve the manufacturing process. And it has to do this while maintaining equivalent or providing superior drug quality. And the legislation also goes on to define what exactly that means. And there's really two main things. And the first is either a reduction in develop a time, development time for a drug that is manufactured using that method, 
or it increases or maintains the supply of what a lot of these critical drugs, life-supporting drugs, life-sustaining drugs, drugs that are critical to providing health care, and as has come up in other talks today, drugs that are on the drug shortage list. So then the legislation goes on to describe the AMT, or Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program. And again, I'm not going to read all the legislators' text to you. It's, um, it's long, but I do want to again point out a few of the key concepts which I've highlighted here in red. And the first one is the timing. So no later than one year after the date of the enactment of this section, there should be a process, a program to, to allow persons, to companies, entities to request a designation. And of course, part of that program has to involve the process. What is the process for the designation of a manufacturing method as an AMT? And of course, part of the process also has to be, how do you evaluate those requests? And how do you actually determine whether or not a technology, a manufacturing method, is eligible for that designation? And so that goes on then to talk about the data and the information that we need to have in order to know, so data and information to demonstrate whether or not the method of manufacturing meets the criteria as it's laid out in Fedora. And, and then there's this question of, well, what does, what does, that, what does that get you? What, what comes along with this designation and with uh, the process of getting that designation? And that is that the agency will provide timely advice uh, and that this timely advice will also include additional interactive communication. And this is specifically at this point with the development of that potential AMT. And it will also involve senior managers, experienced staff. And the goal is to have this collaborative cross-disciplinary review environment in which these AMTs or proposed AMTs can be reviewed. So also with the, the legislation is mandated a guidance. So there will be a guidance to add to the list of guidances at some point in time. And that point in time is 180 days from the date of the public meeting, which was mandated in Fedora. And here we are. So this is the public meeting. So 180 days from today, <laughs> we will be issuing a draft guidance. And then two years from the date of enactment of the omnibus bill, Fedora, we should be issuing the final guidance. So the other big question about the guidance is what, what's in the guidance? What has to be covered in that guidance? And this is also laid out in the legislative text here. And it's four main things. And the first one is the process by which a person, an entity, can request a designation. So you have a method of manufacturing. Uh, how do you go about requesting an AMT designation? And of course, then you need to know what's the data and information that the agency is going to require in order to, to know, to understand, to be able to determine that this is actually eligible to be an AMT, a designated AMT. And getting back to the question of, well, what does, what does that get you? What does that mean? And part of that is explaining the process by which and establishing the process by which applications, and here we're talking about applications submitted under 505 or 351 of the PHS Act, how the agency will expedite the development and review of those applications. And again, the criteria for eligibility, because we need to know what exactly do we need for this to, to meet all of the criteria as laid out in Fedora. So that's all I'm going to talk about with uh, the actual legislative text. Again, it's all available um, online. It's available publicly. 
But before we go into the panel discussion, I wanted to bring up some of these ideas that we have been talking about. These are important AMT related questions that we've been considering. And some of those big questions are, how do we best expedite in terms of how it relates to drug development time and the manufacturing of critical drugs? What do we mean by expedite? Um, an another big question is, you know, we use the term novel a lot. What exactly do we, do we mean in the context of advanced manufacturing technologies? And then another big question, and I'm sure it's a big question on the minds of many people here, uh, what are the types of timely advice that, that we're talking about? What types of communication, what means of communication are going to be the most effective in actually shortening drug development times? Because that's really, the, at the end of the day, it's, it's what we're trying to do. And again, what's the data and information that's needed to support AMT designation? And we've heard a lot about ETT, and we've heard a lot about CAT today. Uh, they're similar programs. They're not identical by any means. They are different programs. But are there ways in which the AMT designation program can link effectively to the ETT and the CAT, again, with the purpose of, of helping with the uh, speedier adoption of these types of technologies? And I don't know why this is cut off a little bit, but I just wanted to end with, uh, with just this little ditty right here that uh, innovation is the active ingredient in regulating pharmaceutical quality. And what we really, really want today is stakeholder input on the AMT designation program and how it can help facilitate innovation in manufacturing. And that's all I have today. I guess we're ready for the panel now. Thank you. Yes, if the panelists could, could come up and uh, take their seats, that'd be great. Can I? Sorry, can I sit here? Oh, oh. sorry about that. <laughs> so I don't have to <laughs> stagger across the stage. <laughs> okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Ranjani. Um, so I'll introduce, and then and then we'll go um, in our order of opening remarks here, and then get into the panel discussion. Uh, so first, we have Joel Welch, uh, chair for the Emerging Technology Program at FDA, as well as associate director for Science and Biosimilar Strategy in the Office of Biotechnology Products in the Office of Pharmaceutical Quality Cedar at FDA. Um, then Ben Stevens, director of CMC Policy and Advocacy at GSK. Celeste Frankenfield Lamb, Director of Global Regulatory Affairs and CMC Policy and Advocacy, Advocacy Team Lead at Merck. Cornell Stammerin, Vice President of Corporate Strategy and Governmental Affairs and Founder and Co-Chair of the Applied Drug Delivery Institute at Catalan. And last but not least, Drew Kazmission, Vice President and Head of Global Regulatory Affairs, CMC at Vertex. Um, so for our opening remarks, we'll start with Joel for some further context on the AMT, Advanced Manufacturing Technologies Designation Program, uh, building on Ranjani's presentation. Thanks, Joel. Well, thanks. Thanks first for the opportunity to be here. It's, it's exciting. Um, I think we've had a great morning and early afternoon session. I think the morning really started this off with where we've been, you know, ETT and CAT and built on the experiences and, and the lessons learned and the successes of those programs, which is a little bit of the past. And I think the afternoon moved us into the present. What are the barriers to adoption? Where, where are the challenges and what are we doing about it in the present? And then I think this session is really a little bit more about the future, which is building a program that doesn't exist yet. It's not always a given to, to be at a place where you can solicit feedback in, in this time and place for, for really launching a new program. And I think that's really exciting. Um, and I give my panelists, my fellow panelists, a lot of credit for coming up and thinking out loud as we, as we ask ourselves some questions about this program. You know, what, what are the things that we should be designating? 
Um, when should we be designating them and how should we be designating them? Because we need to do all those things correctly really to, to allow the program to be successful. Um, and as, as we have that type of discussion, I know my, my panelists have some talking points. I mostly have listening points today because I'm interested in learning from, from this audience and, and to hear some good feedback about what will make this program work and be true to its intended purpose. And that purpose is in the end gonna help patients. So I think, I think that's gonna be an exciting discussion. So thank you. Great. Um, so next we'll go to Ben for your opening remarks. Great, thanks. There's a slide to put up, I think. If you could put to the next slide. And just to get started, I, you know, I think um, one of the things I just wanted to do because it was really, you know, interesting to kind of hear the perspective of how this legislation came into play from the FDA side. I just want to give you my perspective because it was, you know, a little different when we sort of saw this actually get signed into law. So I still remember it was probably February in 2022 when I first got an email from a couple of folks saying, have you seen this interesting language in this draft legislation for the Prevent Pandemics Act? And the ask was essentially, can you take a look at this and provide us feedback within 24 hours? Because that's pretty much all you're going to get. And it has to only be critical stuff, like nothing little, you know, it has to be big stuff. So it's like, okay, this is a pretty big deal looking through this legislation. This is not small, you know, so we did what we could, provided some feedback and then heard nothing about it for just about, you know, the rest of the year. And then I think somewhere around December 20th or so, got another email you know, this Fedora thing is going to get signed into law, and they just put in some language again that was in that previous legislation. Have you seen it? Didn't realize, had looked at it before. So again, very quick amount of time to react to it. But, you know, the fact is that, you know, I just wanted to kind of give that context because when you look at the, when you take a real deep look at what the scope of this program is, it's significant, right? And the definitions that are used in it are very important. And quite frankly, I don't know that we have a lot of, you know, actual sort of real hard understanding of what those definitions are going to be going forward and this is i think where joel is obviously intrigued and in, we're intrigued too in like what the right balance is with some of this language going forward but it's also just to let you know that you know in some respects the way i see this is it's very much a joint process between fda and industry because i think both of us are trying to kind of take something that you know in some ways is a great opportunity but then to sort of you know it, it, it's there's there's a lot there potentially, but we haven't been given a whole lot to work with, and so we actually need to sort of work very quickly because I think you heard the timelines are fast, right? And we need to do something really productive here and make sure that we're hitting um, you know sort of a good balance so that this actually is a very productive um, opportunity going forward. And just to kind of point out what I mean by this, in the first you know bullet we talk about what the scope of the definition of the of AMT is under the statute, right? And I, I think we heard a little we saw in some of the language that was shown before. That quite frankly, I mean, you know, we've we've sort of tried some mental gymnastics amongst, amongst ourselves, and you can pretty much make a compelling argument for just about anything to fit under that designation as it's written in the law, right? And 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 I'm not saying that from sort of a, a you know sort of broad basis. It really is pretty general. The problem, of course, is that you know if we're in a situation where FDA is obviously trying to do the best they can to get you know, to really help use this as a vehicle to usher in you know new technology. If we interpret it overly broadly and everybody in industry is filing a designation, you're going to get inundated with applications and the amount of actual productive relief or, or assistance they can provide is going to be taxed, right? And I don't think that serves anybody, um, especially not patients in the U.S., right? On the other end of the stick, you know, this, this legislation clearly had an intention, right? There was, there was clearly a reason for why it was put in there. And I think in a lot of ways it's built off of the continuing great work that FDA has done in advanced manufacturing. And so we want to also make sure that this is used in such a way that's, you know, effective and not overly narrow because at that point in time it doesn't realize the intended purpose of the legislation. When we get into some of the actual, you know, subsections around what this technology is supposed to do, again, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't claim to be one. I'm not one on television. Um, I, I'm happy to not be a lawyer, but the way I read some of the language here is that some of these, you know, areas where it enumerates the you know, intentions for the use of this technology, although they seem to point at things like supply chain and, you know, expediting approvals. I, I mean, you can kind of trace that directly back to where it started in the prevent pandemics, you know, legislation. The reality is, though, that I actually think in some ways when you think about where this designation long term could be really useful, it's probably more in areas where, you know, in some ways this, this is broad authority being given to the FDA, right? It's not all that narrow. And so what I see is there's a lot of technology right now that companies are very interested in working on 
that I think to some extent up to this point, FDA is, it's not that they haven't been interested, it's just that it hasn't really been part of the discussion when it comes to things like benefit risk. And the example I point out here is something I know GSK cares a lot about. It's also something in Europe right now is a big issue, but you know, new types of technology to advance uh, you know, green, uh, green manufacturing. And, and I think this is an area where we can use this pathway to actually facilitate processes that actually help to facilitate you know, green initiatives for manufacturing, which are a big deal. But in the past, you know, quite frankly, Going back to I think something that Roger was saying about carrots and sticks, what were the carrots for a company that you know, from a regulatory standpoint, to actually pursue green technology? I mean, really, it's always been the stick, right? Is EPA going to come after me or, or what have you, right? Is is the state legislature is going to create problems? This is a great case where you know, for some really innovative technology, we can really start to see some potential carrots that don't fit into some of these you know more supply chain list, you know related buckets. The context of use is again, I just highlight this again because it's broad language. Um, one thing I just want to flag there is I do think in some respects this context of use, if we get into a world where we're having to reapply every single time for a new context of use, that's going to become onerous, right? So to me, the way that it sort of looks like the best way to go forward with this context of use, again, very broadly defined, is it shouldn't be static, right? It should be tied to the data, right? And I think this is going to come into some more of a good conversation around the data that needs to be provided. But, you know, in some ways, context of use can probably be an evolving piece of the designation, and we can keep you know, growing it over time as we keep growing that data that supports broader use of the technology. And then finally, um, just one thing I wanted to point about about the relief, because again, this isn't all that well determined. I mean, there's, there's specification for more you know, discussions with the agency. I think, as was already alluded to, some of this can already fit under existing you know, pathways. But we're certainly in a place here where you know, to some extent we can look at the potential impact of any given technology and whether or not we consider it to be a really massive game changer from an advanced technology standpoint versus something which is a smaller, more incremental change. And maybe the FDA can consider designing the way in which there are those carrots given a little bit in more of a context-driven approach. So in cases where we see sort of stepwise you know, increases, there can be more you know, sort of general support. But maybe in the cases where we see real game-changing technology, it can be kind of an all-hands-on-deck and maybe even something related to some you know, accelerated review processes. So that's kind of my high-level takeaways. I'm sure we'll dive more into it in the actual Q&A. But uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. And next, we'll go to Celeste. I think you have a few slides if you want to use the clicker here. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this particular slide because the, the last session was all about the barriers. Um, but as I was thinking about ways that we could apply the, uh, the advanced manufacturing designation program, I thought it was important to think about the challenges first. What are the barriers? And, and so there's the lack of harmonization. And that's not just with the regulatory authorities. That's uh, across industry as well and, and the way that we approach some of these challenges. Um, there's a lack of experience. I, this is kind of an obvious one, right? But it's a huge challenge. We don't know what the unknown unknowns are when we first encounter the, the advanced manufacturing, the innovative technologies. And we can talk about what we think the benefits are, but we don't know if we're actually going to realize them or not. There's the cost when we consider things like continuous manufacturing or distributed manufacturing, when you already have traditional facilities and equipment in place that are doing an okay job. Uh, you know, it's a very hard choice to make to invest millions of dollars into something to, to make uh, a process better um, when, again, you don't know if you're actually going to realize that. There's risk aversion. Uh, this is the business, right? If the value proposition is unknown, how do you make the decision to pursue the advanced manufacturing and, and the uncertainty of benefit? But here I've listed several different steps that, um, as I was thinking about how we could approach this, how we could overcome some of these barriers. So uh, the first one is, is broad, right? It's forward-looking focus, taking in the big picture. Uh, so when you're encountering some of those difficult business decisions, right, it's important to think about where you're going to be 10, 15 years down the road and how, you know, you can't only take into account the immediate cost of the equipment, but look 15 years down the road and consider the cost then. Consider the quality of the product that you'll be able to provide. Um, you know, you need to in include those in your uh, decisions. 
Additionally, when we consider the, uh, the designation program, it would be really useful to have concrete incentives to help balance that uncertainty and cost. And so I was thinking, you know, the, the case study that I gave this morning around distributed manufacturing, how I might apply this. And I, I think the accelerated review can be really powerful. If, if we could put a time limit around it, and, and I know there are challenges there, I know the dossier isn't only CMC, but, but if we could, um, you know, that would, again, when we think about balancing uh, the decision, you know that you can get the product to the patient, you know, three months faster. That, that can be very persuasive when you're trying to make those hard decisions. Additionally, there are concerns when we consider the continuity of the reviewer knowledge and, and connecting um, their knowledge and, and the inspector knowledge as well. So if there could be something that is included, uh, some sort of process to ensure that continuity of knowledge across the, um, the review and the inspection when, when you have the advanced manufacturing. Uh, we also want to adjust to an intentional risk-based approach, and, and I, I alluded to that this morning. Um, you know, the, the attributes, the quality of the products uh, still need to remain the same, but the approaches we take to demonstrate those attributes, that quality can be different. Um, I, I think it was Fernando earlier, you were uh, referencing SUPAC, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, very, very old guideline, very prescriptive guideline. But the thing that I like about it is that it's a tiered approach based on risk. And I think if we could do something similar when we consider you know, the advanced manufacturing, the innovative technologies, um, I think that would be quite helpful. And then global conversations. And so this is kind of straying a bit beyond the, uh, the designation program. But it, it speaks to, again, the ETT and, and the CATT meetings. And if we can invite the regulators and if we can engage um, in global forums, something similar to this, but on a global level, uh, I think that would be quite useful as well. Fantastic. Thank you, Celeste. So if you could pass the clicker down to Cornell, and uh, Cornell, take it away. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I appreciate the opportunity. There's also one other disclosure for me. I'm a trustee of the Pharma Biopharma Outsourcing Association, which is the trade association for CDMOs. CDMOs play a significant role in supporting development. We've, we support about 80% of drugs that have reached the market in the last 10 years. Uh, not we as Catalan, but we as a, as a, as a collective group. And um, uh, almost 60% of drugs approved in the last, NMEs approved in the last uh, same period of time have been uh, produced by CDMOs. Um, also, we partner with the 75% or so of the pipeline companies who don't have in-house manufacturing. So we do play a, an important role in the ecosystem, and it kind of surprised me that we got into this point of the agenda without CDMOs being mentioned at all. So, um, so I wanted to make sure that we, we rectified that. These thoughts, and, and we do, uh, as, an as a sector within our industry, we, we invest billions of dollars in new capacity, new capabilities, new technology platforms. Um, and um, um, so th these points are additive specifically with respect to things that are important for CDMOs um, and, uh, and our customers who partner with us here. The first one I think we have actually touched on already mostly is, is you know, the, what those evidential requirements are, especially in, the con uh, in advance of product filings. And I would say you know, the, the, the previous programs that we've talked about it's, you know, earlier in the day, it's been difficult for CDMOs to engage because m most of the time we've been, we've been told we struggle to talk about some of this without a product filing in context and and so um so that's so here is what are the evidential requirements in advance of product filings or to the second point uh, for technology platforms that may be broader than a single drug such as a class of drugs or modality that does call into question how this relates to the platform technology approval from the omnibus bill as well that's more focused on on biologics and cell and gene but there's, there may need to be some interplay there as well. 
Uh, the third point is, uh, I, I, I agree, clarity of um, uh, incentives uh, for sponsors who ref reference one of these designations. And to what extent that's dependent on um, FDA exercising uh, regulatory flexibility or is it, is, it, is it more automatic than that, as well as um, individual reviewer um, consistency, uh, which um, comes into play here as well. Um, if we look at the way um, intellectual property works in uh, technology and manufacturing process innovation today, sometimes we're co-developing these processes with our customers. Um, as, as we're scaling up a new technology or a new modality or something. And sometimes that IP is owned dually by us and our customers. Could designations work that way too? Um, it adds complexity, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a way the business works today. Um, and the last thing is um, coming on to some of the discussions that we've had already today is how easy can continuous improvements of designated um, uh, AMTs be without requiring additional filings, additional um, things. This actually ties in also to some of the intent of the platform technology provisions. So, so those are my added points here. So, thank you, Cornell. And last but not least, Drew. So, thank you for giving me this opportunity and in hearing what others had to say. I think the only I only have one one thing to from my takeaway from the discussions we that have gone on earlier is that what I've seen in other people's um, how they implemented innovative manufacturing technologies it was all about a lot of communications with the agency and I think that's the same thing that that we at Vertex found when we were implementing continuous manufacturing it's we had early communications we had we had many communications with the agency along the way and the the communications, the initial communications shaped what we were going to discuss at the next meeting. So it was, they kept building upon each other till we got to the point where we were ready to submit this, um, this advanced manufacturing technology. And, and we struggled with some of the things that were discussed earlier today um, before we even started to think about doing this. Is it, are we going to be able to get it through the regulators? Are we, are we going to, we're putting, we were putting this on a new drug, so are we going to, it's going to risk approval of a drug. I think it was easy to get past that fear of not getting it through the regulators with all the um, early and often communications. The, re, the way we got around, is it going to jeopardize our new drug, is we, we, didn't, we didn't only included continuous manufacturing in the submission, we included batch manufacturing, we had a semi-continuous process, so put a lot of work on the, on the scientists developing the process, um, but in the end it de-risked to our management and it was able to um, get the technology moving forward. And then the, the subsequent submissions we had with continuous manufacturing, that's all we submitted was continuous. We didn't submit a batch process or any other process. Um, so that was, and I think some, some other takeaways too is, as we, as we think about this, this new process is, um, some of, the, some of the early issues we found is the alignment we made through our interactions with the, with the reviewers and the ETT didn't necessarily make it to the inspectors. So when our inspections came, they were asking a lot of questions that we had already aligned with with the reviewers. So we need to be thinking about those things moving forward as well. So I will turn it back and look forward to the conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks for all those opening comments. Um, so to start the discussion, um, obviously, the, the primary way that a lot of regulatory uh, processes happen is they focus on a product. And of course, this program is a little bit different in that it focuses on a technology. So could you speak to how that would influence industry stakeholders' decision making? How would that be valued? What are some positives or negatives that could come out of that focus? Well, so to me, I think if you can align on a technology first, um, maybe you have some discussions early on about what technology you're planning to implement and, and what, what it would require to use that in a commercial manufacturing process. So if you can understand some of that information up front before you have to actually apply it to one of your products, it would help de-risk um, de that process. From a CDMO standpoint, 
Um, we also may have a number of companies looking at the similar technology platform adoption for products. So we may be able to bring um, um, a perspective to say, look, there are a number of products that you're going to see, a number of filings, you're going to see within three years or something that might incorporate this technology. And if you focus on, on helping us characterize, understand, and making clear these benefits to customers, you'll get more benefit because of, you'll get more broad, more, more, more broad adoption more quickly, potentially. Right. Do, so. you, do you see customers coming to you and maybe having hesitance about using some new technologies currently? <laughs> Yeah, definitely, the, I would echo what we, you know, the comment that was made earlier is nobody wants to be the first one in, um, especially if it's something that's very, you know, very different, whether it's a dose form, it's a different formulation, you know, approach than has been used previously or a new manufacturing, new manufacturing technique. So, <coughs> even a new plant sometimes with existing manufacturing techniques, so. So would, would approaches that, that organizations would take when seeking this, uh, this designation, what are some ways that it might differ across different types of technologies? We've, we've talked about a lot of different applications of what, what qualifies as advanced in our previous discussions. Like how, would, how might things differ from one product type to the next or from one analytical testing method to the next? Are there, are there, what are some major considerations there? I mean, I just think kind of building off the conversation we were just having a little bit, you know, to some extent, you can sort of see at least two extremes, right? There are going to be cases where some folks are going to want to have sort of a very, you know, targeted use of a technology, maybe as a first time in, in potentially for a new drug, something that's a completely innovative manufacturing process for something that's not even on the market yet, right? I think likewise, there's going to be other folks who may want to apply something that's an innovative technique across their portfolio, right? And that can very much come in a post-marketing stage, right, where you've already got a lot of things on the market and you want to start to understand if you can, what's going to be required to kind of get that across all your programs. And so to, in some ways, I think this kind of paradigm shift, we're starting to look at things more as a technology-based designation and kind of building a, you know, sort of core set of knowledge about, you know, what the regulators are going to want to see to justify that as being, you know, a, a, an advanced technology that will be implemented for these products. It's going gonna, it's gonna to shift it away from this traditional approach, which I think particularly I can say in the post-marketing realm, even if you had things you wanted to apply broadly, you were always kind of in this paradigm of having to sort of do it, litigate it case by case, because the agencies usually, that's just the way things operate, right? So I think this is, in a lot of ways, you know, as much as it's, it's got a very kind of, you know, it's got a potential benefit just from the standpoint of actually encouraging technology, I think it also has a the potential for actually serving to be a great administrative benefit too, where you're actually reducing the amount of work, you know, and, and kind of, you know, strict, you know, pathways that people have to follow to, to sort of do everything product by product, right? You can start to have more holistic discussions and then hone it down to the general core of things and then fine, you can sort of adjudicate things case by case if there's slight differences within products, but you can get a lot further with those general conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the other thing just to kind of point out, because I know this dovetails a little bit into some of the discussions around you know, CAT versus ETT, and I can, I can at least say from my perspective where this also has some potential advantages, there are a lot of technologies out there that we're working on that are not center specific, right? They cross between CBER and CEDAR, right? And from what I understand right now, there's not really a sort of black and white way in which you can actually seek guidance from ETT and CAT simultaneously and get dual feedback. You can get a meeting with both and you can get input from one and in, in responses, but you'll get just basically, I heard you, you're gonna have to come back for the other one, right? So I think long term, if you're starting to think about technologies that cut across center, you could start to see the opportunities where, again, for some of these bigger cross-cutting technologies, we can actually start to have discussions and consensus building across centers where I think that barrier has been somewhat arbitrary in the past. If I could quick say, you know, I. I I appreciate, right, there's always a challenge when you talk about multiple products and when they, they span centers. I think, you know, we, we do communicate quite well with our CBER colleagues and I think vice versa and we meet collectively when we can. I think you can, the challenge of course is, you know, different products are different stages so it, it becomes logistically a little bit harder to provide specific feedback. But I, I do want to highlight that we, we collaborate really well, we share information, we, we talk back and forth and when we can meet collectively we, we certainly seek to do that. 
Yeah, and, and please let me you know emphasize, I actually think the communication has always been great. It's just the sort of formality of the process is you know where, where I think it would be nice to kind of open up something where you're literally you know having that consensus in a single set of responses where centers have kind of said yes together, this is what we believe is necessary going forward, right? So the opportunity to, to leverage in, in the submissions as well, right? If you, you know, it saves time for industry and for the reviewers as well. If you can, you know, build upon what is in the, the initial submission that um, contains the, the technology and uh, then refer back to that and, and what you've already established. So as just a reminder for, for those online or in the room too, please feel free to go to slido.com and, and enter your questions. We have plenty of time to get to, to quite a few audience questions today, so please feel free to do that. Um, next question is, when organizations engage FDA to seek a designation, they're, you know, you know, right now it's a little bit unclear of what type of data should an organization bring to, to seek a designation. On one hand, it could be an idea. On the other hand, it could be you know, a, a full submission. Um, how do we find the right balance and define what what that data set should look like. I'm curious too. <laughs> um, and, and as I think about it, um, I, you know, there are concerns about putting too much information in the dossier, but I wonder if we could provide a lot of this information up front so it's not something that we had to maintain, right, but enough to provide um, confidence in the approach, um, confidence that, you know, if we look at the requirements um, to, to meet the, the designation, the, um, the fact that it's novel, the fact that it can, um, uh, I don't remember the exact terminology, but essentially bring the product to patients more quickly and, and that it um, is a critical medicine, if uh, we could refer to those. Um, and essentially meet those requirements um, up front. Yeah, I mean, just to build on what Celeste is saying, I mean, I would say that in some ways this is kind of a critical decision, right? Because, you know, again, it kind of comes back to this issue of, you know, if you make the data requirements too loose, then you're going to get a million submissions. If you make the data requirements too, too much, then you're not going to be able to make it actually effective. I think, you know, just to kind of put it into context against some of the existing emerging technology program, to me, just at a high level, I think whatever you have to kind of present going forward to get that designation should be, to some extent, a much higher bar than what you do to kind of get that initial engagement with the agency within CAT or ETT, right? So it's, to some extent, maybe a little bit of a product of some of those ongoing discussions, right? So CAT, in particular, is opening up really early on and trying to kind of take very, you know, new technology and kind of give you the right way. ETP, same thing, it's still kind of trying to usher it along. But then at some point in time, you're going to generate some core set of data that you feel is really compelling. And I think to some extent, what we're, we're, we really need to kind of decide on is what is enough data, you know, to the point where I think it actually can convince both us and regulators that it's actually going to work, right? You know, that's to, to me seems like a big bar. And when you think about some of the other existing designations in other areas, like, for example, breakthrough designation in, in clinical area, you, know, you have to present certain clinical data that shows that that product's going to actually offer promise, right? It's not enough to have a sort of hypothetical. You have to have a pretty compelling set of data to get that designation. To me, you know, again, I don't have the answer to exactly what it'll be, but it's got to be something where you've generated a decent amount of data enough to make a pretty compelling argument that this is going to have a lot of value going forward and you're actually, you know, worthy of an actual designation where rather than just kind of saying, you know, I've run two experiments and this looks like a pretty great idea. How about a designation? And I agree with the, the idea of ensuring that it's significant, but I also, you know, I don't want the bar to be set too high because right. then it doesn't encourage, you know, Dozens and stuff. Yeah, you're not going to need process validation, right? <laughs> like that's the thing, right? But that's the truth, right? You're not going to know until you're validated, right? But the, you know, again, this is where what level of development data do you need, right? Is really the, the key question, right? I mean, I think that's you know, there's got to be some some level of you know process development data that you'll you'll be able to provide that will actually, you know, support that it's going to be a productive, you know, important technology, right? Um, I think that that's the devil's in the details and. This is where I think to some extent, once the guidance is issued, 
we're going to have a lot of back and forth conversations to really kind of hone in on the right balance, right? Because yeah. otherwise, and, and you know, kind of one of the reasons just to kind of go back to why I was talking about the process by which the legislation was put out, and I didn't mean to be tongue in cheek about it, but the reality is, is like this is very, very fast, right? And it's it's a very, very big question, and I'd be lying if I say I think we're going to get it right the first time. Like I don't, I don't actually believe this is going to be something that's going to be sorted out perfectly in the initial guidance, right? We're going to have a lot of work to do to actually make this productive, right, at the end of the day. So the data component of it, I think, is one of the biggest questions that we're going to have to really sort of hone in on, and, to my, my opinion. And I think maybe we can do that by looking at the case studies yep. of, of, you know, the technologies that we're already aware of to yep. consider. Yeah, actually, that's what I was going to ask, actually, with Vertex, you know, because in some ways it's, that's a great example, right, where you guys, you know, went through this really incredible process of developing this continuous manufacturing. Like, somewhere along the line, you must have been, like, compelled that this is going to be, you know, a big deal. It's going to work for us, and it's going to, you know, be something where we'll use across all of our, you know, programs. What's that tipping point look like, you know? And to me, that's where it becomes really kind of rock solid as something you could get a designation for. But So, I don't know if Stephen will let me ask a question oh, here. No, feel free. Uh, Please. But I, I hear I hear some consensus that 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 maybe the designation is for a technology that's more mature than something in, in EPP or CAD, at least initially. Do you have a sense how to describe that maturity? Or is it more of a we'll know it when we see it? Yeah, and that's that's exactly I mean again, this is where the problem is is partially technology dependent, right? And mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's where I personally struggle is like if you define it you know, sort of broadly, mm -hmm. you're going to probably encounter, you know, for every one case it makes sense, you're going to probably find another case where it doesn't necessarily, you know, make as much sense. So I don't know if we're going to have to start to, like, look at least some broad categories, you know, for, for mm -hmm. you know, types of technology that we would kind of say, okay, you know, this is probably a, a good enough compelling piece of, of data to, or, or set of data that we would look at. Um, again, to me, it's, mm -hmm. you know, somewhere along the actual, for example, if it's a manufacturing process step, somewhere along that process development where you're, you know, I don't want to see something arbitrary, but like maybe when you're kind of in that end of phase two phase, you know, where you feel like things are getting pretty locked down and mm -hmm. things are starting to kind of be, you know, you're going forward to commercial manufacture or starting to lock in a process for, for commercial, you know, you can actually sit there and say, this is a pretty compelling set of data that we have that supports this designation rather than, you know, We've run a couple of experiments. It looks really interesting, and you know, for every application, you, for every designation you grant, you know, one out of a hundred will actually turn into a commercial product, right? And I don't think that's where you want to be, right? So yeah, it's, it's it's a challenge because if you're too early, then as you said, Ben, right, you you don't know that this is actually going to make it to the market. But I think for some of the big technologies that require a big investment, you need, uh, you know, in order to get the companies to decide to to invest in that technology, you, right. you know, you need to have that designation somewhat early on. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I would add um, um, some of these technologies, again, you, you talk about phase two, I'm concerned about getting the technology developed independent of products. Right. I do think it needs to be practicable, whatever it is. And there's, it's not just theoretical, so there's some practice, some model compounds, some whatever. That's, that gives you data that is usable. Um, but also, um, um, the other thing we need to look at is how scalable the technologies are. Because we see a lot of very early stage technologies that are great in the bench, but are not going to be practicable from a commercial CMC level. You know, or not going to be affordable from a CMC level sometimes. So, um, so I think there are provisions around, you know, um, whether it's practicable, whether you have evidence that's product, real production based, that's trending towards the right scale. You know, some of those things, um, I mean, it's what we look at from, from a technology development standpoint. You know, same stage gates, just platform instead of product. So. It is interesting because if I'm, again, the way I read it, the, the, the legislation kind of anticipates, it doesn't anticipate, but it, it kind of lends itself to different scenarios, right? Like, again, you can envision a situation where the technology is very narrowly, you know, designed, right, to work for one product to do one thing, right, and do it really, really well, right, in which case that would still be eligible for an AMT designation, right? So for like a life-threatening medicine, if it 
speeds time to market or addresses supply chain for a single product for a single manufacturer, you get the, you can get a designation. Vice versa, to your point, like it's more kind of what it would dovetail with that platform technology yeah. designation where it's yeah. like you get some great technology, like I mentioned a green technology that works for everything. So you kind of have to fit both, right? And it's not always, you know, those scenarios are very, very different and they play out very differently, right? So it's a little hard to anticipate exactly where you're going to get the most of the submissions and like what, how you're going to have to craft the guidance to sort of deal with that. Um, plus, it's interesting. Plus novelty is a little bit different if we look at the different modalities too. Right. You know, for newer modalities where we're all still figuring out how to scale up manufacturing and gene therapy and cell therapy and other things. You know, in incremental innovation may be much more impactful than, you know, certain types of innovation in oral small molecules, say. You know, so um, how you, there's not a, an equivalent there either. So, um, so I think that f flexibility is going to have to be important. Building on that, should there be a different data requirement um, to be considered for a designation for different product types or even different submissions? Like what about a new product versus a post-approval change? What differences in, should be considered there if you have a, an established product versus something that's novel? Good question. <laughs> <laughs> something to think about. Uh, so let's go to some audience questions here. Um, uh, first question is, financial costs seem to be the biggest barrier, I, I assume, to uh, adoption of manufacturing technologies. So what financial incentives could be put in place to address them? Expanding on this, does the AMT designation program provide concrete enough incentives to reduce costs for manufacturers? Um, does, it, for example, does streamlining subsequent submissions with a designated technology meaningfully lower costs? Yeah, I, if I read it correctly, there's no real financial incentive, but you know they say time is money, right? So I think you know things that materially impact time to market or time to implementation, which is also really important, is going to be where you'll see a lot of industry interest, right? I mean, it's not necessarily going to be um, something where I think there can be any direct you know encouragement through a financial sort of incentive, but yeah, I mean I think. You know, again, this is coming to back to the sort of point of having some level of you know graded, um, you know graded um, relief because, you know, quite frankly, and, and again, this is just the way I read it, but some of the things that the program grants, I think, are basically you're getting it already through engagement with ETP, right? I mean, you're getting a lot of assistance, you're getting an open dialogue through that existing program. Yeah, okay, I, I do think it, it maybe shifts who can receive that more to some folks who are developing, you know. Yep. those broader things that are not traditional, you know, developers from a single product, but it, the, the actual things that it provides are somewhat akin to what, you know, the FDA is already doing, which they do very well. But again, that part where you actually can start to see, I mean, I think, I think Larry, you know, and, and some others have highlighted in their, you know, in some publications recently from FDA about how for some of the continuous applications that actually approvals have been faster, right, than some of the, the other, you know, technologies for, for you know, standard uh, packages. I think there's also that question is that if that's going to be scalable, you know, long term, but quite frankly, if that type of approach, whatever flexibilities were taken with those programs to expedite that review process can be applied to things with an AMT designation, you know, that translates very much to financial incentives to industry, and they're going to want to be involved in that. So I think it's a big deal. Anyone else want to build on that? Okay, we can go to a, another audience question here. Um, is novelty or advanced defined enough here? Is it identical to the types of technology that would go through ETT or CAT? Should it be more broad, more narrow? I, you know, again, I, I think we have, or when I was reading through uh, Fedora, I, I had the same questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, what is advanced manufacturing? And, you know, there, there are certain boundaries that are set in the legislation. Um, and so, to me, uh, my perspective is that it would be the types of technologies that we bring to ETT or, or to CATT within the bounds that are listed um, in the legislation. So, you know, products that uh, are, are critical products and, and the others. Mm -hmm. 
I would add, though, you know, based on um, input from um, CDMO members of our trade association, it does seem like our um, members have a lower probability of proposal acceptance than in general. So I think, I, I do wonder if there are technology developments that are not in, integrated with product or product family that may not be getting the same degree of attention under the current programs that might benefit from um, a broader definition of what's included. So. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, the point you made before, which I hadn't thought about, which is for, for those types of technologies that are not proceeding through any sort of a product-specific pathway, you know, the type of data you've got to present is going to be very different, right? Yeah. And, you know, to some extent, does that put you slightly, at least in theory, in a somewhat, you know, it, it, it's, it's a harder position to be in because regulators are used to seeing product-specific data, right? They're used to seeing things done on a certain API that's going to be approved. So that actually is is quite interesting when you start to think about like how you would actually have to justify that set of data and how people would find it compelling enough to think, okay, it can be used effectively in a marketed product and manufacturing process. Well, and even, even fundamentally the definition of novel, you know, there's not perfect transparency as to what's, you know, what's being done in standard practice in many areas today. So what might be novel to one company is not to, you know, to others. So, so there are a lot of, you know, ambiguities still in the, in this this drafting that need to be worked out. So, mm -hmm. so we touched on novelty there. So um, one other aspect of the legislation is the technology or technology is required to substantially improve the manufacturing process. So substantial also is you know you could interpret that different ways. Um, it, and, and it should substantially improve the process by reducing development time or increasing or maintaining a supply of certain priority drugs. Do you have a perspective on how that last part, substantially improve, should be interpreted to maximize the impact of this program? I mean, I think, you know, this is interesting because there's sort of two ways to look at it, right? You, the, the legislation has some kind of examples of, you know, areas that they seem to prioritize, right? But it's pretty open in general beyond that. So to me, you know, you can kind of have the approach where FDA is saying what they think is important for, you know, certain things that show a demonstrable improvement in, you know, what the bar is, right? You know, your, your, your yield goes up by X percent or your efficiency goes up by, you know, a certain number. I don't know if that's actually going to be the best way to go. I think in some ways this is going to be something where maybe it's part of the designation, you know, request where you're going to have to come in and make a strong case for why what your technology is doing is actually making a substantial, you know, improvement. And I don't think we're really going to get to a place where we can prescriptively lay out all the ways in which we can do that. It's just going to be kind of somewhat case by case. And I, I think that's actually a good thing, right? Because you need a little bit of flexibility and it needs to be able to evolve over time. I guess to some extent it reminds me a little bit of, again, coming back to some things that go on in clinicals, like when you're doing an orphan designation program, you have to, you have to make the case for why you have a, you know, this is an important orphan indication, right? And you have to lay out that case based on literature and based on other, you know, data. I think that's a case we can do here too, where it's like, because of coming back to kind of my points earlier, there are going to be cases where you can, you can say that there's maybe a, a real strong case made for a non-obvious benefit, right? That maybe most industry folks and maybe even FDA aren't aware of or, or anticipating, but actually still fall within the potential legislation. And if you make a strong enough case for that and you put in enough, you know, support from credible sources and folks, you know, see eye to eye on the, on that, I think that can be, you know, a pretty good place to land without being too prescriptive. So I guess what I'm trying to say is it's our job to do that. <laughs> yeah, I would see substantially improve being something maybe more difficult to show for a new product, but for an existing product, post-approval change, you have something to compare against, if, especially if there's a product in shortage for some reason or another, you, you can point to something as, as causing a quality breakdown or a supply chain breakdown and show maybe it's easier for that type of product to to demonstrate that you're substantially improving the yeah, process. Yeah, I mean, it's easier, I would say, to kind of point to a drug shortage and say, I can manufacture this at much faster and much more efficient, right? I think that's somewhat self-evident, but yeah. in cases, like you said, where the technology is, you know, somewhat unproven, that argument starts to become a little bit more, you know, 
it, it becomes a little bit more general and maybe somewhat less tangible. But yeah, I, again, I think to some extent that's got to be, you know, I don't think that FDA can, you know, I'm not telling you guys short. I just think it's impossible to sort of envision all the possible ways where you can see impact on a, on a, of a given technology. It's, I mean, there's just so many possibilities, right? And the technology, the, the statute doesn't, or the legislation doesn't anticipate that, right? They just say it has to improve manufacturing, you know? Uh, and that's a big, it's a big thing to ask for. Although, you know, even for new products, if you think about improving titers, improving yields, you know, reducing throughput, reducing processing time, improving purity, you know, a lot of those things, there are benchmarks, not that they're perfect, but there are benchmarks. So even for new processes and new products, there are ways to measure improvement. So I think, I think the challenge there, <clears throat> again, keeping in mind <laughs> the things that I'm most accustomed to, um, when, when you haven't implemented it yet, yeah. right? H how do you demonstrate concretely that benefit? Yeah, and that's why I think there needs to be some degree of practice. Uh, you know, uh, the, there needs to be some evidence. Uh, you know, it's not, it, it has, to me, t for it to be practical from a, getting a, a designation, uh, getting a tangible benefit, you have to have some more tangible evidence. Does it have to be associated with a, a post-IND product? Maybe, maybe not. But I, it feels like it needs to be more than modeled, you know, modeled out. It needs to be show this is something that we can deliver and something that we can scale up or we believe we can scale up or something. So, you know, so it's, it's, again, it's going to be hard to generalize based on all the different ways this could be used. Great. Another audience question is, the AMT legislative text draws heavily from the biomarkers validation pathway text. What lessons can or should the agency take from that experience when establishing this pathway? And actually, another program that comes to mind that we've discussed in, in previous conversations is the priority review voucher as well, that program. I wonder if there are learnings from either of those, either the biomarkers validation pathway or the priority review voucher that, that you think should be applied to this program. aware that it was similar to the biomarkers, uh, so I'll have to read some of that. Okay. <laughs> but it's interesting, I, 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 so I can't speak to the, you know, similarities or lessons there. I mean, I guess, you know, I guess drawing it more to the priority review process, I would say that, you know, at least at a high level, that that designation makes a huge difference, right? So the actual outcome of it, you know, I guess, you know, if you're trying to sort of see, you know, actual, you know, success of the law, then ultimately something as substantial as seeing, you know, decreased review time will carry a lot of weight with people. And I think there'll, there'll be a lot of, you know, a lot of interested parties. I, I, I think that, you know, ultimately one of the key things about, you know, the priority review process too is that generally speaking, it, it oftentimes dovetails with some of the flexibilities that are allowed within, you know, the drug review process. So. We haven't talked too much about that because I don't think it's explicitly called out in the, the legislation, but you know, there's sort of a happy medium here between getting the designation and then also having more flexibility when it comes to actually starting to put it into a commercial process or a product, right? You know, can can the agency, you know, be a little bit more flexible about certain kind of pre existing uh, expectations for an application that's actually gonna incorporate it? Um, because I do think with priority, the priority process, those two kind of go hand in hand. You know, you're, you're generally getting, except when it comes from like a voucher, but you're generally seeing a lot of, you know, willingness from the agency to leverage some of the flexibilities that are outlined more explicitly now in the map that just got issued. But um, just I think more across the board, you, you feel a little bit more confident that the, the agency is going to be flexible with your approaches. Mm -hmm. Great. So some of the next few questions here are, are more so shifting gears a little bit to after a designation has been granted. Uh, so, so first question is, would companies who possess or have had an advanced technology designation provided to them share publicly that they have that designation? Um, like I just mentioned, the priority review voucher that frequently is shared by, by companies. Um, why or why not might a company share publicly that they have that designation? 
Certainly from a CDMO standpoint, we would. Uh, it, it, you know, it's clearly in, in, in our interest to do so. Could you expand on that a little bit more? Um, the, it's, you know, we're, we're here to, to help companies, you know, bring products to market and keep them on the market and at the right supply. So, you know, and thinking about financial de-risking, you know, the more, if we're going to make an investment, the more products we can bring into that investment, continuous or otherwise, you know, the, 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 the better the risk profile for that investment. Mm -hmm. So we would want to say there's a, you know, there's a designation, it applies to these kinds of products. You know, there's this kind of um, uh, review value associated with that if you use it, you know, potentially. Um, and um, so, yes, we would, I think CDMOs would definitely support visibility to it. I can't really speculate what industry would do, but I, I think I can see, you know, the advantages of, of sharing that, but I think I could also see um, some downsides. Um, you know, the advantages as Cornell was just sharing, you know, you show that you are committed to, um, to upgrading and to, to uh, moving manufacturing forward, bringing products to patients more efficiently. Um, but one of the downsides, I, I, I think about some of the general public's <coughs> reaction to the vaccines and, and the pandemic. And um, I, I wonder, again, pure speculation, uh, if there would be concern about, you know, if something is manufactured via an advanced pathway, if the general public might think that this is um, new or unproven, and if there might be um, concerns around uptake, if if that was um, publicly disclosed, um, I may be uh, going too far into disaster thinking there. But um, you know, I, again, I, I think that I can see um, people falling on either side of that question. I think it's a really good point, actually. I hadn't, I hadn't considered that angle before, but you're right. I mean, to some extent, it's, you know, I totally understand why from, from a contract standpoint, it makes, you kind of would love to advertise on it, but for a, you know innovator, do you really need to kind of fly the flag, right? <laughs> you kind of, you know, create some, and especially when, you know, we start to talk about things like, you know, drug shortage and supply chain, like, if you start seeing an issue and then all of a sudden they're like, well, they're using advanced technology, but now you're having a drug shortage, it's because of that, you know, AMT, right? You know, it's, it's an interesting thing to anticipate. So at the same time, like we do with our customers, if customers use our IP or even contractually, we can't disclose who, who partners with us. It's legally, I mean, but contractually we don't. So, you know, people referencing a technology held by a CDMO wouldn't necessarily be public anyway so but I, I agree I think on the the distinction I would make is maybe formulation versus just manufacturing process I think if you th if you think about some of the pandemic and vaccine response that was a little bit more formulation related and a little less manufacturing process related mm -hmm. you know so um, but you're right there's there's always risk <laughs> perception risk what, what about sharing, uh, maybe not publicly, but sharing with purchasers or, or payers, especially on, on the generic side of things, for example, uh, there's, a, there's a growing interest in supporting technologies like this from purchasers that, you know, they have an interest in preventing shortages. I wonder if there's a way that these technology designations could um, help show value that different manufacturers are bringing to to their customers through some sort of disclosure. Only if it keeps the products out of shortages. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think yeah. the audience matters. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah. Right. But in that case, I think you'd have to demonstrate to them how it's going to prevent a shortage. Yeah. Not just because I'm using a new technology doesn't mean, because then you get to what you're saying, people will think, well, if there is a shortage, it's because that new technology you're using failed and you didn't quite, you didn't fully understand everything. Right. 
Okay, um, so another question for after designations have been granted. So let, let's say an organization receives a, a designation for a certain technology and then wants to use that technology for future products after they've already maybe used it on one product. Uh, how should organizations consider adapting their future submissions to, to utilize the designation? Are there efficiencies that could be gained um, to, to use the same designation multiple times on multiple products? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think, you know, I, I addressed this earlier briefly around the, the submission aspect, right? If you can, uh, if you've already made the case, right? If you've already demonstrated the benefit, um, uh, perhaps you don't have to do that again. You can leverage sections of a submission that have already been submitted. Uh, that saves you authorship time, saves reviewers review time. Um, and, and again, you, you look at the benefit of, of, you know, getting the product to the market more quickly. You're, you're getting the product to the patients more quickly. Um, you know, and if you can do that for multiple different products using that same technology, um, I, I, I definitely see advantages, yeah. It does walk up to the edge of that platform technology designation, though. <laughs> and now that gives other, confers other benefits as written in the legislation. But, you know, where, how the two coexist is maybe a little bit unclear to me still. <laughs> So, I would also say just to kind of, because I think this is where it gets also a little interesting is, you know, because Celeste was just talking about the, what goes in the dossier, right? And I think we're kind of thinking about it from like a platform de designation that you'd be able to like cross-reference dossiers and rely more on, you know, that data across dossiers. I don't really think, again, that strictly speaking, you necessarily have to get your designation of an AMT strictly means that that has to be some a major component of a marketing application, right? Like there are going to be some technologies which by and large will be somewhat, not invisible, but it'll be a minor component of an actual yeah. dossier, right? And so ultimately, this once you get that designation and you feel like the agencies have been, the agencies, you know, finds it compelling, you can start to implement it pretty pretty broadly and not necessarily see, you know, a major need to like, go through this administrative game of cross-referencing or having to demonstrate again and again a certain smaller data set for each product that you're, you're trying to rely on it for. So in that, again, this comes back to where the technology, where, where the designation actually carries a lot of value. I think in some of those areas where it's maybe a little bit more invisible, but maybe more on the GMP side, it's, a, it's actually a pretty big deal. I was going to say too, you know, I think there's some wisdom in the, in the legislative text. It, it says expedite the development and review. <laughs> You know, and I think I think that's the right emphasis, right? How do we, how do we push that piece? Because that's where we hear so much that the the decisions are made and where the barriers and the gaps kind of prevents adoption. So, to the extent that a, a second or a third product, you know, maybe has fewer barriers, I think you can still have discussion and, and an opportunity to do some of that, you know, development expediting. It's just a different different subset of questions and, and maybe conversations around a, a smaller group of topics. Mm -hmm. And maybe we could expand here on that piece of the legislation that Jolie just referenced about expediting. Um, what's what's your perspective? Uh, not not Joel, if you want to share, you can. But anyone on the panel, uh, what, what's your perspective on how expediting should be defined? Um, this isn't actually coming from an audience question. To, to what degree should things be expedited? Will certain technology types be prioritized? Uh, how can we make expediting? concrete to increase the certainty of manufacturers and what to expect when they receive a designation. I mean, just to say one thing, you know, coming back to some of these other cases in the past with advanced manufacturing where FDA saw, you know, not even longer timelines, but actually shorter timelines for approval, I don't know for sure, but it's not necessarily, in my mind, it's not that, that didn't come from strictly, you know, pre-existing priority designations. The agency, you know, when I used to work there, we would take action sometimes on applications when we were done early, right? Because, great, you know, we feel good about this application and it's ready, you know, ready to be approved. So kind of talking about cases where you can quote unquote expedite, if, you know, this pathway, once you get the designation, has served as a good vehicle to kind of pre address a lot of those issues beforehand and it allows you know the agency to take 
faster action, even if it's not formally under some sort of a designation, I think there's a lot of value to that, right? Because it does accelerate the approval and, and development timelines. So it's just something to think about because I think there's probably some, you know, I, I don't know if there's going to really be a strong appetite to actually have a formal, you know, priority or process, but there's other ways to get at some of that without having it be tied directly to a priority review is really what I'm getting at. I'd still like to ask for that, though. I'm not complaining. <laughs> don't get me wrong. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I, th I think, you know, the, the enhanced communication, that certainly, right. you know, that speeds things up internally. As, as Larry was saying earlier today, you know, uh, the ETT is a member of your <laughs> development team. Um, and, and then by the time you do submit your, your submission, um, you know, they already have a familiarity with, right. with the information so they can review it much more quickly. Or almost kind of like a very drawn out rolling review, right? Where you've kind of provided, you know, certain discrete packages in ahead of time to really get draw some consensus, and then that means that you know once it's in, CMC can do their job a lot faster, right? I was going to say too on on the subject of you know uh, accelerated actions, right? It's it's a little bit too contextual for the type of application. If you're talking about a new submission, you know, it's not just a CMC activity, right? There's a lot of other disciplines and you know, other considerations, labeling, et cetera, that go in. So, right. you know, sometimes just staying out of the way is, is the best that, that CMC can do. And if we do that, I think that's, that's a good outcome too. Yep. Another call for, for audience questions. We have a few more audience questions here lined up, but it, go to slido.com, hashtag DM June 8 to submit a question and we can hopefully have some time to, to get to that. Um, so one other question about expedited review. So. Drugs that are in shortage are already eligible for expedited review. Um, so how would this designation program impact drugs that are already in shortage, or how should it? Um, and how should organizations think about using this designation program for drugs that are in shortage? I can give one thought, which is, um, <laughs> So um, this designation program could be applied to, to implement technologies for products that are not currently in shortage but may have a likelihood of shortage in the future. So you can get review. Maybe you, maybe you get a designation for one product and then can change several products over to use that technology to avoid future shortage. Uh, I don't know if that spurs any, any thoughts or comments from the panel. I mean, I think it's hard, right? Because the, the real value of advanced manufacturing is not in, in correcting a shortage, it's preventing one from happening. So it's, you know, it's a little bit of a, of a, a catch-22, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and then um, any thoughts from the panel on, we, we mentioned the platform designation. So that was section 2503 in the Omnibus Bill, and we're, we're talking about the advanced manufacturing technologies designation, which was section 3213 in the Omnibus. Um, could you expand on any thought, this is an audience question, any thoughts on distinctions between those two designation programs? Is it clear or where is it unclear when an organization would apply for one versus the other? I think the most obvious, as far as I understand, the most obvious difference is that platform, I mean, they're, they're quite different, but platform you have to have a pre-approved application, right? Whereas with the AMT, you don't, right? So that's probably one of the, that for platform, it cuts off a lot of folks who, you know, aren't market application holders. They don't have, you know, some pre-approved application they can point to. So that, that's a pretty big difference. Um, but there are certainly some overlaps for sure. I mean, again, I think that, to me, the one that sort of is gonna be probably somewhat similar is the area or the discussions around data packages, right? I mean, like, yeah. you know, that's one of those things where, you know, you could see how the, the requirements there would be pretty similar, although, again, the, the kind of absolute bar may be a little bit different, but you can see how there would be a lot of overlap there. I think you could end up seeing technology uh, technologies being submitted under both. Yep. You know, one by, by a sponsor who's incorporated it into an application and another that's an you know early stage that's not yet you know reached reached application stage so um, the other the other thing if i recall correctly 
is it does allow kind of cascading updates to uh, the technology platform to be kind of forward incorporated to other um, applications that reference the technology, which would be nice if the AMP would, but <laughs> it doesn't say that. <laughs> so. I think you pointed to before that the platform technology designation is a little bit more, again, it's, you can, drive a truck through it, but it's it yeah. sort of points more at API processes, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. generally speaking. Um, so that's a somewhat of a distinction as well. Yeah, and, and newer modalities. Too. Right. So I guess to to kind of answer a question by asking a question, I'd be interested if there's a if folks saw a value in having both at the same time. Because I know, you know, there's probably a, a, a possible scenario, right, where a technology is both so novel but already approved in a company's individual platform that perhaps it could qualify for both. I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer either, <laughs> TV or not. But I guess I guess I would be interested if, if folks saw value in having both or if just picking one would be preferable. Well, from, from my perspective, or from a CDMO perspective, we're not allowed to file mm -hmm. under the platform technology. So it's mm -hmm. only sponsors, number one. Number two, even if it's RIP, the sponsor controls it from a filing, st from a mm -hmm. designation standpoint. Now we'd have to deal with that contractually somehow, mm -hmm. but that has its own complications um, from a platform technology standpoint. So uh, the AMT platform, in that it's open um, to people outside of sponsors, um, you know, gives us the ability to participate. Okay. So. Um, here's an audience question. Um, rolling review was, was brought up earlier. A great thought, according to this audience person. Could the program allow for new product submissions the start of review earlier than the clinical data review? I mean, that's pretty much what rolling review is a lot of the times. It depends on, you know, who's submitting first. But, yeah, I mean, I think the only, I mean, practically speaking, the only difference might be that instead of doing it under an actual, you know, rolling review you have to do under, well, the process is, is you know, tied directly to the marketing application versus what I guess I was getting at before, which is that you can sort of pre-vet a certain body of data even outside of that initial marketing application process. So in theory, you're kind of doing something similar. It's just maybe not quite as kind of, you know, I think, you know, with a rolling review, you have to actually have full anticipation of receiving the full NDA at some point, right? Or is this other process you can kind of do it over much longer and probably have a, a much longer, you know, discussion about the data packages. So, you know, it's it's a different approach, but it ultimately gets you to a similar place. Great. So going through a few uh, more audience questions. Um, let's see. This uh, going back to our conversation around. Um, reviews of something that doesn't necessarily have a product tied to it. Um, in the absence of product-specific applications, will or should the agency consider drug master files for platforms or novel technologies as an appropriate means to have discussions with innovators of AMT designations? Or can a DMF drug master file be used to include the advanced technology? See why not? I mean, I, I, it's this is comes down a little bit more maybe to filing strategy and kind of how a company wants to maintain its data sets. I, I don't, I don't know that there's a huge advantage for a company because again, it kind of comes back to the fact that you know, for for the designation, they like a CDMO for example, you might definitely want to keep it as something in a DMF so you can leverage it across applications for a company who has developed a technology in house and they're basically just going to use it across applications. I think you you wouldn't necessarily need a DMF, right? So it's probably somewhat case dependent, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that it would, I don't see any reason not to allow a DMF as a possible option in the long run. Nothing right there. Sounds good. Um, uh, from a business perspective, this is another audience question. Uh, when or how will receiving a designation be most advantageous um, or in what in what settings might 
uh, demonstrating that you have this designation be most advantageous uh, from a, a receiver of the designation perspective. So we mentioned purchasers or, or payers earlier. Uh, do you see that this designation could be like a breakthrough designation that's helpful with investors? Um, is tying in, tying this in with our question about disclosure of the of the designation program? Or I think, res I think yeah. if you have that designation, it's helpful with convincing senior management that you should use that technology on a on a new submission you have coming up or or a post approval change on an on an existing drug because then it it gives them some assurance that there's um, the the regulators are are on board with that technology. It's a great point actually I think you're right because I think we heard before about how the internal barriers are oftentimes like the belief in the technology is one of the major limitations. So if you're able to show you know, the folks who aren't necessarily doing the you know work in CMC, like look, this is you know the regulators have said this is a platform technology or this is a advanced technology they want to work with us. It's gonna they all make a difference internally. I think. Right. Sometimes you're uh, you know Cornell, you alluded earlier to needing to this would be something that could give comfort to your customers or or something that would be of value to be able to demonstrate to your customers. Sometimes your customers are internal within your own organization as well. You have to sell them on stuff. It does feel like a lot of the, the communication benefit is de-risking. But it, you know, it doesn't help you de-risk clinical risk for a compound or other things. So it's de-risking within a certain context. So. Sounds good. Um, Still time for some more questions here. We've got, let's see, a couple more. One is, is there a role for academia in driving innovation here with this program? Um, could or should academic researchers potentially receive a designation? We don't, we don't have a panelist, right? <laughs> <laughs> we left. It was a business. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. But I sent you a similar one. OK, you did. <laughs> Well, Thomas hasn't sent me that one yet, so maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you can pull up a chair and answer the question if you want for him. <laughs> At the same time, though, practicability and scalability are not always. Um, uh, some uh, often require transition. Never, so, right. Yeah. Right. I agree with that. Uh, so one one item that was brought up in in previous panel discussions as well was bringing in the generic industry to this uh, as well. Any thoughts? I know we don't have. Well, Cornell, you work with a lot of generic companies, um, but we don't have a. a panelists specifically representing a generic uh, drug manufacturer here, but do you, as, as uh, not necessarily Cornell, though, feel free to, to add in. The others can, uh, can, can <laughs> ju chime in as well. Do um, you have a perspective on how this program could be tailored to have a, as, as much of a positive impact in the generic industry as well as the branded industry? You know, uh, I'm, and this may be a broader statement than just generics, but there are certain technology innovations that, in theory, may make reshoring or nearshoring more easy for certain types of technologies, improving yields of proteins, for instance. So you don't need, you know, very large stainless steel tanks to produce, and you can do in smaller scale things that might make it more affordable to reshore things. It's a simple example. So, uh, so I, you know, given that Congress is also paying a lot of attention to this, you know, supply chain security matters here, you know, is that one of the other elements that might choose, that might bias a prioritization here? And that's, it's not directly addressing your generic point, mm -hmm. but it does feed into that generic point as well. So. Um, you know, I know there's been some debate within the generic community about continuous, and I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> but, um, 
Um, but you know, maybe there are other technologies like continuous API, for, you know, for instance, that might make sense for reshoring. Um, you know, uh, so maybe there are places where it might apply within the generic, you know, production environment too. But I, I'm thinking maybe it's the reshoring part that helps more than necessarily cost or reliability. Do you think there are considerations that should be taken into account in the FDA guidance that could help in that area? I think we need to talk to AAM and the generic yeah, community. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Right, so let's, let's zoom out a little bit and uh, think about how this program fits into some of the earlier panels today. Um, how can FDA's ETT and CAT incorporate this program into their broader initiatives and, and use this along with the other programs that we talked about to alleviate real and perceived regulatory risk and ultimately more effectively support adoption of new manufacturing technologies. So like what, what more broad considerations should we think about and how, how this fits into the bigger picture? Well, I, I think about how it can generate more data um, on uh, how new technology can be approved more quickly. Um, you know, I, I, I think that there is still that perception that if you are moving forward with something new, you're going to get lots of questions, you're going to have um, lots of delays, and, and there's that fear. And, and I think if in addition to, you know, the examples of the continuous manufacturing that, that Larry shows that were, you know, approved more quickly, um, if we could generate more examples of additional uh, advanced manufacturing that was approved quickly, that in and of itself um, provides incentive for, uh, or you know, a, um, a balm to the fear that people have that they will actually be slower to, to market. Mm -hmm. I guess one question I kind of have more long term, which is just sort of thinking about some of the things that were presented around the ETP, you know, and now they've kind of moved to this paradigm where we're graduating some of these technologies. Like, it's kind of wondering, you know, what bearing that has on some of the advanced, manu the existing advanced manufacturing designations, right? Like if at some point in time, a certain technology is considered to be graduated, what happens to all those existing designations for AMT, right? It's kind of, mm -hmm. you would think that there might be some impact there, like, you know, but I don't know that you can revoke them per se. Do they just not become, you know, valuable anymore? It's you know, because the question was kind of around how do they, inter how does this interact with existing, you know, frameworks within FDA? So that's just one thing I was wondering about more at a high level, because it's, um, you know, I think that from what I understand, the, the graduation process is still in its early days too, and it's kind of being developed. So something to think about as we go on. But I think that's an important consideration, right? We, this, so much of this is about picking what we what we designate and devoting resources to it. So if there if there gets to be a, a time in a technology's life that it's not really novel anymore, and it's certainly not you know speeding anything up because everyone's already using it anyway, then you know is there not a place to think about you know undesignating it or or whatever right. the term for that would be? Yeah. Are there any other topics that we should? Hit on Joel or from other uh, other of the panelists. Any any open questions you have that obviously I think we haven't answered every question here today. Obviously, uh, but any any open questions that we haven't touched on yet or areas that you'd like to think that you think we should delve into. I guess the only thing I would just add is I mean, you know, apologies in advance for not having a good answer on some of the you know data questions and things, but. You know, I, I do kind of keep going back to this idea that this is going to move pretty fast. And I think, you know, to be honest, the the process by, you know, issuing, issuing guidance, draft guidance, and kind of doing notice and comment that, you know, there's probably going to have to be a lot more discussion beyond that process. And I just am, I'm wondering, it doesn't have to be discussed here, but I'm wondering kind of how that's going to proceed and, you know, how we can try to, you know, get more involved in that conversation. Because I think to make it the most useful, we're probably going to need to have a lot more back and forth rather than just, you know, Couple of written responses coming from us through, you know, the trades or other other sources. Um, just my two cents. So it'd be interesting to kind of know about that going forward, so we can actually start to get you guys some some good answers. You know, that can really help. Yep, I second that. 
Yeah, no, I, I asked the question about data because I, I know we're thinking about it too, right? It's it's tough to describe and it's it's a balance. So how do we how do we find that balance? And I think to your point, and I think it's I think it's right that it's it's gonna be a challenge to be perfect at the, at the start. So how do we have the conversation about did we designate the right things and and such and especially if there is a a proprietary component, how do we do it in a public way? So I think, you know, industry is gonna have to help us facilitate conversations and you know, there will be, I think, different mechanisms we can think about, but certainly panel discussions like this, I think, will be a critical part. So I, I look forward to some of those future, future discussions. Great, last chance, any, anyone in the room have a question? Last chance. Um, well, thank you so much. Thanks, Joel, thanks to all of our, our panelists. Really great discussion. Obviously, we haven't answered, as like I mentioned, all the questions today, but starting a conversation on this program that has a lot of potential and really looking forward to working with all of you to make it have as, as positive an impact as possible. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to our Assistant Research Director at the Duke Ruggles Center, Dure Kim, uh, to finish us up for today. Thank you again. Thanks, Stephen. What a great discussion to round out the day. Um, my name is Duray Kim. I'm an assistant research director at the Duke Margola Center for Health Policy, and I have the pleasure of wrapping up this public meeting. Um, to briefly just uh, reflect on some of the valuable insights we heard throughout the panel discussions today. Um, let's see here. Uh, it seems the adopting and the advancing innovative manufacturing practices is uh, primed and ready uh, with greater uh, capacity and development uh, at the FDA through CAT and ETT. Uh, we can expect more uh, meaningful communication and promoting adoption. Um, uh, furthermore, the new designation program is a path towards uh, greater acceptance and streamlining technology adoption. So, uh, of course, that rundown was far from comprehensive. Um, we will be publishing a summary with further details on the key takeaways today uh, on our websites in the coming weeks. Um, the slides and recordings of the meeting will also be posted uh, in the, few in the f next few days. Uh, now, before we go, I'd like to express my, uh, uh, express my gratitude uh, to all those who, make, uh, who, made, uh, who helped make this event happen. Uh, first, to all our speakers uh, who joined us today for sharing their expertise and insights. Uh, thanks to all Thanks as well to the FDA planning team leads, uh, Elisa Nickham and Joel Welch, and the entire FDA planning team uh, for all their help, especially those who did double duty planning, uh, work, planning the workshop and speaking today. Um, and thanks to our research team here at Duke Margolis, including Thomas Rhodes, Stephen Koval, uh, Brian Cantor, uh, Garrett Humray, Cameron Joyce, and Remy Chandel. Uh, thanks to our Duke Margolis events and marketing team. Uh, Luke Droker and Hannah Vitello and all the events staff here at the National Press Club uh, who've been keeping things running smoothly. Uh, and, and lastly but not least, uh, thanks to all you in the audience for joining us today. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed the workshop and have a great afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>